In the last legislative session alone, there were over 25 bills filed with 12 representatives and senators looking to change the laws on how APOs operate in order to lessen the impact on their communities. Today, we will hear from those agencies that apply and enforce our existing laws and APOs. They monitor air particulates, water runoff, and transportation raw materials, just to name a few. Hopefully, we can understand in more detail how the state currently regulates APOs and where improvements need to be made. As a reminder, subject to public meeting rules and house rules, we are unable to have interactive responses or questions from members of the interim study committee or the Texas House. If you have questions, you can simply submit them to the committee clerk's email address, which you can see on your screen now. We will do our best to answer them afterwards on the committee webpage. If you would like to offer verbal testimony during today's town hall or provide written testimony directly to the committee, please register using the email on the screen. Now I would like to start with the agency currently most involved in regulating aggregate production, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, or TCEQ for short. TCU, TCEQ handles everything from air quality monitoring to water quality and is responsible for administrating our existing standard permit process. With us today to go over details about what they do and how they do it is Susan Jablonski, Area Director for TCEQ Office of Compliance and Enforcement. And also joining her is Beryl Thatcher, Assistant Director for the Air Permits Division. Ladies, thank you so much for being here today. I believe you have a presentation for us. Yes, sir, good morning. This is Beryl Thatcher, the Assistant Director in the Air Permits Division. I'll be going first. Good morning, like I said, my name is Beryl Thatcher. I'm the Assistant Director of the TCEQ Air Permits Division. Um, with me is Susan Jablonski, the Area Director of the TCEQ Office of Compliance and Enforcement. And we'll be providing an overview and update of the re regulatory requirements for the aggregate production operations in Texas. You can go ahead. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> we'll get this. So the TCEQ defines aggregates as any commonly recognized construction material originating from an aggregate production operation where an operator extracts dimension stone, crushed and broken limestone, crushed and broken granite, crushed and broken stone that's not classified elsewhere, construction sand and gravel, industrial sand, dirt, soil, or caliche. Now an aggregate Aggregate production operation is defined as the site from which the aggregates are being removed or that they have been removed or extracted from the earth. So companies in Texas must register each location where that aggregate is being extracted with the TCEQ. So this slide right here has a picture um, of an APO and as you can see there could be other activities and processes located at an APO that are regulated by the TCEQ. For example, there could be a fuel tank that would be under our petroleum storage tank program. There could be a rock crusher that would have an air permit with the TCEQ, or the APO may be located over the Edwards Aquifer. But those things are not the APO itself. The APO is going to be the actual location where the aggregate is being extracted. Sorry, you could go to the next one. Thank you. So during the 82nd legislative session, House Bill 571 amended the Texas Water Code to add an APO registration and inspection program. The TCEQ adopted these requirements into the Texas Administrative Code in Chapter 342 of our TCEQ rules. And that requires that an APO be registered with the TCEQ and that registration must be renewed every year that there are extraction activities occurring. It also requires that a fee be, pay, be paid to the TCEQ based on the amount of acreage that's being disturbed there at the site. Um, a certificate and a letter is, gonna, is issued once those registrations are complete. The rules 
also require the TCEQ to have an inspection program for these sites, which Susan's going to discuss a little bit later. So as you can see on this slide, as of September 1st of this year, there was, oh, you can go back. Sorry. Um, as of September 1st of this year, there was 1,056 APOs that have active registrations with the TCEQ. Um, the number of APO registrations across the state is broken down here by our 16 TCEQ regional offices. So you can see generally how many are in each area of the state. Now, I would like to know that that's 1,056 APOs that are registered. That's not rock crushers. Um, by definition, the APO is the extraction of the aggregates, not the crushing or the processing of the material. We can go to the next one, sorry. So typically, rock crushers are what is associated when you hear the word APO or an aggregate production operation. Normally, what comes to mind is a rock crusher. So there is some confusion um, when it comes to which rules apply. As I said, House Bill 571 amended the Texas Water Code, which gave the TCEQ statutory authority for the APO registration and, and inspection program. Rock crushers, on the other hand, are regulated under the Texas Health and Safety Code, and they may be located in an APO, but they aren't always necessarily located in an APO. The Texas Health and Safety Code gives the TCQ statutory authority for air permitting of facilities. Now, a facility in the Texas Health and Safety Code is defined as a discrete or identifiable structure, device, item, equipment, or enclosure that constitutes or contains a stationary source. A mine, quarry, well test, or road is not considered to be a facility. So by definition, mines and quarries aren't, aren't defined as a facility and they are not regulated under the Texas Health and Safety Code. You can go to the next one. So as I said, rock crushers aren't the APO, um, but they may be at an APO and they will require an air permit. Most rock crushers in Texas are authorized by the TCQ's air quality standard permit for rock and concrete crushers. This standard permit was developed by the TCQ for the typical operation in Texas, and it includes throughput and operating hour requirements, distance limitations to the property line for equipment, and best management practices. Um, companies can apply to register their rock crusher under the standard permit if they meet all of their requirements. The setback requirements and those operational restrictions that are in the standard permit ensure that rock crushers operating under the standard permit meet emission standards that have determined to be protective of human health and the environment. Uh, this standard permit also requires that the applicant publish notice in the newspaper and provides an opportunity for the public to provide comments on the proposed application. There is also an opportunity for um, the public to request an informal meeting that could be held, which would uh, be an opportunity for the public to ask questions on that proposed application. You can go to the next slide, thank you. So another common activity that could occur in an APO, which may require authorization from the TCEQ, is for stormwater discharge. Stormwater permitting requirements are based on the specific types of activities conducted and the manner which the stormwater is managed at an individual facility or at a site. <clears throat> there are multiple permits and controls that could be required to protect the water quality based on those site-specific conditions. The removal of overburden soil and other grading activities that are typically conducted at a quarry prior to the beginning of the mining operations are considered construction activities and authorized under that a construction general permit. Um, and that must be obtained if stormwater is discharged from the property. Now, if a mining operation is located in the recharge or the contributing zone of the Edwards Aquifer, it's subject to a separate pre-construction and discharge authorization that may include special conditions to protect the Edwards Aquifer. 
Um, there's also the multi-sector general permit and it authorizes discharges of stormwater from certain industrial activities that are identified in the general permit, which includes quarry operations. The multi-sector general permit only authorizes discharge of stormwater and mine dewatering discharge that consists solely of the stormwater and non-contaminated groundwater seepage. Uh, the multi-sector general permit does not authorize the discharge of processed wastewater, however. Um, at this time, I would like to turn it over to Susan, who's gonna cover the remaining portions of our presentation. Thank you, Burl. Um, good morning, um, Colonel Wilson. Um, we're glad to be here and I'm gonna pick up where Burl left off, um, covering um, compliance and enforcement as well as some of the recent updates to the program. So um, as we look at, init initially Burl covered um, how the program was set up through House Bill 571. Since the beginning of that time of the regulatory program that implemented the legislation, we have seen the APO universe grow. And we've also really focused on trying to define the whole universe of APOs across the state. This, we've mainly been using the statewide annual surveys to identify active APOs and to better define the sites that are under our jurisdiction. The program that we have requires 12 FTEs to administer the registration and compliance monitoring with the majority of those staff being investigative staff out in the field throughout the state in the 16 regional offices of TCEQ. One of the other things that has recently happened as we have continued to, to um, get input on the APO program we have deployed five new air particulate monitors here in the Central Texas region. Um, one in Atascosa County, two in Bear County, one in Comal County, and one in Williamson County to assess the potential downwind impacts of quarries. As we have viewed those, some have only been online for a couple of months, but so far we have, we have registered no impacts above standards um, from those air monitors. Now the agency plans to continue to diligently review the data from those air monitors to make sure that we understand any potential downwind impacts. This is in addition to the statewide network that already has some particular particulate monitors already active and live. If folks are interested in looking at the statewide live data, as well as historic data, it is available on the GeoTAM application that can be accessed via the agency's website. As Burl alluded to, in the 86 legislation, there was House Bill 907, which made further modifications to the APO program. It shortened the investigation frequency, it allowed for higher registration fees, and it increased the penalty cap that was allowed under the statute. So what, what occurred is we had to change our investigation frequency, was, which was set by statute previously for every three years to now investigate every two years for the first six years of operation. And then after that first six years, then it would go into a three-year rotation. There are some exceptions to that. If a site has been, um, by, has been issued a notice of violation, they can be investigated more frequently and those can be unannounced investigations by the agency for a year following the citation of that violation. In addition to the changes to the inspection cycle, there are also changes to the penalty amounts. And this allows the agency to incentivize APOs to register timely. It up the maximum amount or cap for penalties associated with not being registered. Those instances where we find an APO that has either never been registered 
or hasn't renewed its registration, it allows the agency to move forward with enforcement action and quickly get those APOs under the registration program. The next slide, please. So in talking about the registrate the enforcement program, the agency has, has a, uh, been conducting these investigations, as I talked about, since approximately 2012, 2013 timeframe. And now that citation has been moved up to a, of, of a rotation of inspection cycle. When an, a TCQ investigator arrives at an APO site, it is going to first check if it's properly registered with the agency, that the information found in the registration that has been entered by the applicant is correct, that the size and location of the APO has been properly noticed with the agency. In addition, the investigator will evaluate regulations for air quality, for water discharges, if it's in the Edwards Aquifer area, it will also review if those plans have been in place and are being followed with any special conditions that might be part of the Edwards plan. They could potentially look at on-site sewage facilities for the workers who are working on the quarry. They could also investigate public drinking water requirements depending on the size of the APO and the amount of workers that are on the site. They could also look at water rights, depending if capture is occurring from state water. They could look at other waste management, including used oil, also petroleum storage tank registration requirements, and how that those petroleum storage tanks are being confined and protected, especially over the Edwards. One of our main duties in looking at, at these APOs is responding to complaints. So beyond the normal rotation of every two years to visit APOs, the TCQ also conducts investigations based on complaints received for APOs. The most common complaints received in our area is dust nuisance. An additional common complaint that we've heard is noise due to blasting. If there are blast traffic concerns that have been communicated to the TCQ, we will work with local law enforcement as well as DPS to make sure that those are investigated under their jurisdiction as the TCQ does not have jurisdiction over those items. When an investigator is out observing the site, they are also reviewing records to ensure that they're following the TCQ requirements and they're looking at any air monitoring results that might be part of the agency's network or other air monitoring that might be available. The investigator will then make a compliance determination, whether it is in compliance that there are violations that will be cited or if those violations rise to the level of possible enforcement. They will develop and document in a final investigation report their findings. That investigation report, once it's final, is a public document and is available upon request. If there are any violations noted, the investigator will refer to the agency's enforcement initiation criteria, known as the EIC, to categorize the violation and determine if the regulated entity will receive a notice of violation or a notice of enforcement. So the three options after visiting an APO facility for an investigation is either a general compliance letter where nothing of violation is noted, a notice of violation, which cites violations that need to be corrected, but don't rise to the level of enforcement, or a notice of enforcement, which will result in an order and a fine to the regulated entity. In all these cases, our goal is compliance. And we will focus on getting to compliance regardless if an NOV or an NOE is issued. Next slide, please. So 
So this slide is providing some data of our recent activities associated with APO surveys, investigation, and enforcement. Keeping in mind that the agency has had the program going on since about 2012, 2013 on the compliance side. So overall, if we look at what the agency has um, done in this world of APOs, we have conducted approximately almost 18,000 surveys, 2,300 investigations. We have cited numerous hundreds of NOVs and NOEs and have captured $1.6 million in fines mm -hmm. and part of administrative penalties that get deposited into the general revenue of Texas. Specifically looking at the two last years on this slide, which would be FY19 and FY20, and keeping, keeping in mind that the fiscal year for state agencies starts September 1st and ends August 31st of each year. So we have just closed out FY20 mm -hmm. um, for the mm -hmm. agency. So you can see on this slide, the number of surveys, investigations, notices of violation, notices of enforcement, and those administrative penalties specifically for the last two years. Again, these are being further modify changes in, in um, legislation that requires more frequent investigation. Additionally, the agency is currently evaluating its penalty policy and it will be also evaluating compliance history um, under a rulemaking setting that may change and provide um, for a larger cap associated with penalties mm -hmm and possible uh, increases to NOVs mm -hmm. based on that policy. We can go to the next slide, please. So the TCQ really looks at um, our regulation as a partnership with the public, as well as regulated entities. And there are various tools that we rely on mm -hmm. and provide to the public mm -hmm as part of mm -hmm. any program, but specifically we'll talk about the mm -hmm. APO program today. So the TCEQ updates its websites and it allows the public to have access to registered information on APOs. It also maintains 24 hour hotlines for both members of the public as well as regulated entities for assistance and as well as complaint hotlines that are available 24 hours. The agency strives for always a prompt response associated to any complaints that we receive in our, in our, in our regional offices. And again, these are regional staff that live and work in your community. As far as complaints are prioritized, there are different ways that the agency looks at response to complaints. There are emergency response complaints, which of course are immediate and have some possible threat to the public health, safety, or the environment that the agency will respond to immediately. These events are classified as emergency response rather than complaint responses. And the agency conducts those seven days a week, 24 hours a day with our regional staff, as well as support out of our Austin main office in the Division of Critical Infrastructure. Their complaints can be categorized as immediate response. And although this is not an emergency response situation, these are reports of possible human mm -hmm. health effects that require immediate response. These complaints are investigated as soon as possible and include a 24 hour time schedule for receipt and response, including the weekends. There's a category of expedited response, which some are based on statutory requirements, 
not specifically for APO, but for some other programs the agency administers. And in these cases, <clears throat> those expedited responses can be anywhere from a few days to less than a week or to less than 12 hours. Then there are the normal responses, which there are no health and safety impacts that have been indicated, but the agency needs to follow up at these sites. And we consider the response to complaints one of our key responsibilities in compliance and enforcement. We should investigate them as soon as possible and schedule an investigator who has the training and the equipment to respond to that site. And our goal is to respond no later than 30 calendar days from receipt by the region of that complaint. There can be some other timeframes associated with responses. Perhaps we are doing, we have planned an APO investigation that has already been scheduled and we can roll in complaint information to emphasize on when we get to that site. Then there's a category that, of course, if it's not under our jurisdiction, we work with our partners at Railroad Commission, at DPS, at Texas uh, Department of Transportation, and any other state agencies or federal agencies to refer complaints that mm -hmm. need response but are outside the agency's jurisdiction. I mentioned before that we allow public to see that live link to air monitoring statewide, which include these particulate monitors that I've talked about. We also have compliance alerts that you can sign up for being on an email account and receive timely notification of changes or emphasis the agency is putting on any different compliance items. So please do participate in, and be part of that process. We have reference publications and updated guidance documents as well. One of the things I did want to mention as part of public participation is the agency encourages that. And we want people to use the complaint line, use the web portal to submit your concerns about APOs. There are rulemaking opportunities that we want the public to get involved in the process. And I mentioned a few that will be coming up. We also have annual public hearings on the Edwards Aquifer Protection Program that I would like to also emphasize. Mm. And we have other guidance documents that I know were mentioned yesterday, including RG500, which is the best management practices for quarry operations. All of those things are available to you on our website, and we encourage you to participate in that process. The next slide, please. So this is the final slide of our presentation. We wanted to highlight that we do have a specific program that the legislature has um, put into place. And it was actually prior to the introduction of the APO program that we currently administer called the John Gray Scenic Riverway Protection Program. And in that program, the agency is required some added protections for sensitive areas in this river as part of the requirements, a reclamation requirement for all quarries in this protected area is required if, if they are in between 200 and 1500 feet of the actual water body. So as part of their registration as an APO, they also must submit a plan for reclamation and evidence of financial assurance for that reclamation, whether that be a um, performance bond, or whatever kind of financial assurance they will be holding. The agency will review those documents as well as protection plans associated with this river body as part of this special program. So we wanted to highlight that we do have some special programs laid out by the legislature that protect specific areas within the state. So with that, um, Burl and I appreciate your assistance and um, we, we can be available um, to answer questions as time um, is allowed. Thank you both for the information on what TCQ is doing. I have a 
couple of follow-up questions, if I can, um, related to regular regulatory authority water and, of course, air quality. Um, of the regulations that you covered, how much is directly enforcing a statute versus agency rulemaking? And where does TCEQ's rulemaking authority end when it comes to APLs? So for air quality and air permitting, our, like I said before, our authority comes from the Texas Health and Safety Code. And that lays out how we can develop and issue air permits and gives us the authority to issue air permits. Um, there's a variety of ways we can do that. And we have rules, state rules, that also explain our authority and how we can issue those, those, those permits. And I will add that um, in addition to that, the, the APO program specifically is, as Burl mentioned, is a registration program. So although the agency has jurisdiction and rules over APOs for many other activities, the main thing under the registration program is, is the site registered or is it not registered timely on an annual basis? Have they paid the fee? Um, have they provided the information to the agency to get them registered? But the other requirements that are technical requirements are what we would find in the other rules and some statutory basis for the other programs that we have. And one example is Edwards Aquifer. Those are actually pre-construction requirements. So anyone that is establishing a quarry should come to the agency before they break ground and get approval for protection of the Edwards, which includes a geological assessment of the site. Thank you. Also, you mentioned that you added some full-time employees to your administration and compliance divisions. What is your capacity for compliance monitoring? So at this point, the program, um, we have the monitors that are set up as part of the statewide network, which include the new five. Um, but the 12 um, investigators that we currently use are, are for the boots on the ground. They're not including monitoring staff that would need to um, administer additional monitors across the state. So if that was something that the legislature decided they wanted us to specifically place these monitors or provide that, there will be both an upfront requirement of cost as well as a maintenance and, and a personnel associated with continuing to monitor uh, and add additional monitors to sites. Hmm. Also, I recall that we passed uh, the appropriations bill, which had uh, some additional uh, sensing equipment uh, that was added to y'all's uh, toolkit. Is that mm. that's correct? And has that been purchased and used? So yes, we, we have, um, as part of um, last year's appropriation, did receive funding for um, mobile monitoring vans that have been purchased and outfitted mm -hmm. with equipment and have been um, put into deployment as part of our response to the recent hurricanes and tropical storms. So the agency has implemented that and has had an opportunity to test out that equipment in those emergency response situations. Thank you. When you administer public hearings for air quality or water runoff permits, what are the most common complaints that you hear? Now, just sum it up. I know you you, you, you mentioned it earlier, just brief uh, sum of what those complaints are, please. So for an air permit, we may have a public meeting uh, in the area where the proposed location is going to be. Usually the complaints we get for rock crushers, again, the air permit's gonna be for the rock crusher for the actual plan itself, not for the APO. And usually the complaints that we get are traffic, property values, and noise. Um, those are the top complaints that we get. However, all of those are out of the jurisdiction of the TCEQ. Um, we do get some uh, health concerns associated with dust. Um, sometimes we'll get questions about the actual water usage because water is gonna have to be used as, a, uh, as control at a rock crusher. Um, so we do get some of those questions, but most of the questions that we get at those public meetings have to do with those issues that are outside of our jurisdiction. Yes. 
that aren't included in the air permit. Right. Thank you. Uh, when uh, what other agencies do you involve in those public hearings? There are no other agencies that are involved because the hearing itself is strictly on the proposed application for that specific permit that is being reviewed at the agency. So it's, it's strictly the TCEQ involvement at those meetings, as well as the, the applicants themselves are at those meetings, but we don't invite any other agencies. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. You know, that's something that uh, TCEQ may consider because every public hearing I've been at, obviously there's a line from the mic to the back of the room going over the issues that you had just previous mentioned. It may uh, bring uh, to light and may answer some questions for our citizens uh, if those other agencies, uh, uh, water departments, uh, local elected officials, so forth, uh, are invited and actually participate. I know the, the meeting specifically about the permitting of that specific piece of equipment, not the operation in its entirety, but at least maybe we can take some heat off TCEQ by having others there to answer some of those questions. What are your thoughts on that? Um, that's something we can definitely take back and, and for discussion. I appreciate it. If y'all need uh, legislation on that, just let me know. Joke. Uh, so when we go to water, um, am I correct in hearing that you focus on water runoff almost exclusively When it comes well, to water. I, would, I would say that the exception to that is um, depending on any other permits that might come into play. I mentioned OSSF, um, public drinking water, depending on the activities that are being conducted on an APO site, there could be other things that fall outside of a stormwater permit, for instance, that are also regulated by the agency that we would look at. And then, of course, under the Edwards program, we're looking at actual groundwater impacts um, and protection of the Edwards. So that has a different emphasis than just looking at runoff. Thank you. Following on the differences you mentioned in your last slide about the, um, um, the John Graves Scenic Riverway, how much more work is involved for an APO permit located in that area compar compared to a standard permit? Well, as I mentioned, there are additional requirements up front that need to be submitted to the agency and require review, which include that reclamation plan, as well as a review of financial assurance by mm -hmm. our experts mm -hmm. um, in, in our financial division. So those things mm -hmm. are additional work, but I will note that there's a small amount of quarries overall in, in the um, in, in the John Graves. So its impact is, is, is not large to the agency because the numbers aren't big. But if you had changed that review to include it across all thousand sites, we would really have to look at the additional workload associated with um, making sure that review is done thoroughly up front and, and that we have staff available. Currently for the registration program, we just have one FTE. The rest of the FTEs that we utilize are all in the field. I see, and, and that uh, FTE, it, considering the number of quarries and so forth for the Grave Scenic Riverway, um, how many additional FTEs would you think that you would need to be able to move that application process over across all 1,000 plus? I think, Colonel, we'd like to take back and look at that question as an agency and be able to give you a more thorough analysis of what that would look like. I, I appreciate that. Uh, so for that one FTE uh, uh, focus on the Grave Scenic Riverway, an application uh, or registration would take how long within the Grave Scenic Riverway? So currently, the, the process for the registration of the APO is pretty straightforward. That's almost an immediate um, review because it doesn't have technical requirements. But the thoroughness of the reclamation plan, 
um, the quality of what they've submitted for financial assurance on the applicant's part is going to make our review easier. So, you know, we can get through that process relatively easy, I would say, in a 60 day time frame if all of that information is complete. So, um, again, the small number allows us to work through that fairly easy um, with John Graves. But as we look to expand that, we really need to put some real requirements on the application so that we would get the proper information to be able to time to review. Thank you. And the last question I, I have is uh, you had mentioned uh, earlier regarding complaints. You mentioned 24 hours for initial response and then 30 days uh, for another type of response. Could you please clarify mm -hmm. what those timelines are and what responses those entail, please? So on, on complaints, as I mentioned, if there is a um, potential health issue that has been raised, um, or safety issue that has been raised, we would put that in the immediate response and we would get out there within 24 hours is our goal. Um, as far as the 30 day response, it would depend exactly what was happening. Mm -hmm. For the nuisance mm -hmm. dust um, complaints, which are many that we receive in Central Texas, we would contact and ask for information from the complainant of when this is occurring. So is this occurring you know, at nighttime? Is it in the early morning? So that we can then schedule an investigation and be out at the facility at the time that the complainant has experienced the issue. So a lot of it has to do with really talking through um, the complaint details and making a strategy plan for when an investigation would be optimal. And we also provide um, logs to uh, complainants so that they can log that information and describe exactly what's happening to not only be used as documentation and evidence in a possible investigation or administrative hearing, but also to make sure that we're optimizing our resources and getting out to the site when it's actually occurring. And so it can be tricky um, to get to a, a quarry when those things are actually happening. And so we really rely on the complainants and the public to provide detailed information so that we're using our, our resources the best we can. Thank you. And um, I, you know, there's rumor that when there's going to be an inspection that actually the industry gets a heads up prior to. Can you confirm or deny? Um, so if it is a regularly scheduled investigation, so if it's on that two year rotation, they will know about the investigation because part of our goal is for them to have all the records, for him, them to have the right personnel on site that can actually address the questions that the agency has and that we have access to the different parts of the quarry. You know, these are dangerous working environments. So we need to make sure our staff are um, protected and they know that there's going to be investigators in the area at that time. So that's what the regularly scheduled investigations. When it's a complaint investigation, that is not announced. We do not let the facility know that we are investigating a complaint. Mm -hmm. and, and the other exception is what's in the statute um, that allows those unannounced regular investigations if a violation has been cited in the last year. So um, we usually make the difference there. So in many cases, they could know that we're coming because it's part of the planning process, but um, in complaint instances, they do not know what kind of. Mr. Jablonski uh, and Ms. Thatcher, uh, thank you again for your time. Uh, you know, um, we, we recognize that TCEQ has the broadest oversight of any agency regarding APLs in the state. They deal with considering multiple responsibilities when looking to permit a new aggregate operation. Okay, we've heard from our state expert. Now let's hear from a coalition of independent subject matter experts. I would like to introduce the Texans for Responsible Aggregate Mining, or TRAM. TRAM is going, uh, or is a group of citizens from across Texas who have brought their unique skills and backgrounds to research the impact of aggregate operations on the state. Joining us today from TRAM is Mr. Mark uh, Frizenhan. He is a retired senior technical advisor with ExxonMobil. Don Everingham, agriculture engineer and agronomist. 
Dr. Keith Randolph, a published biomedical research scientist, Jacques Olive, and Jim Brown, retired geologist and hydrologist, and of course, Dr. William Dupree, University of Houston, Department of Earth. I would like to start by turning to Mark to give us an overview of what TRAM is, why you came together, and what TRAM will be covering today. Mark, it's all yours. Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, Representative Wilson and uh, Jeff Fraser. Y'all have uh, done a heck of a job uh, supporting our work and involving us in meetings such as this. What we're going to do today is cover 10 expert witness testimonies. We have uh, choreographed those testimonies to align with what we call seven key issues related to APOs. And I'm going to start with an overview and then hand it off to uh, five of the other eight technical experts who support TRAM, uh, two of our members who are not able to be here today. Uh, my name is Mark Friesenhan. We appreciate the opportunity to discuss APO concerns and issues with you. My testimony is, is an introduction. I, along with the other members of our team, will provide uh, invited testimony for specific areas of concern that we mention in this introduction. We're here representing TRAM, a statewide coalition of 15 member groups who are addressing APO issues. And I'll mention a little bit more about TRAM in a minute. We will address uh, TRAM concerns from around the state and offer examples that illustrate the problems our member groups are dealing with. And we'll recommend action steps that your committee on interim, uh, the interim committee on agorists take to resolve our issues. And in fact, each of our presentations will enumerate specific recommendations that we feel fairly strongly uh, represent the, uh, the core of that topic and supporting our key issues that we feel need to be resolved. I had previously provided Jeff with a document containing a summary of our individual CVs. Uh, that should be out there. All eight of us are shown and, and basically you've covered mine. Um, since we last spoke with many of you and we have had uh, interaction with uh, representatives and senators from around the state, we've continued to study and develop our understanding of the issues and the actions needed to resolve the issues. The issues we will review with you today are not new. And in fact, you're probably aware of and have probably had some discussion on each of the issues. But our testimonies today, along with supporting information, will give you several things, a greater depth of understanding of each issue, how widespread these issues are across the state, particularly associated with our high growth rates, how Texas compares to other states wrestling with the same issues. There's a, there are a number of uh, parallels, numerous parallels why and how we need your support and assistance to achieve equitable resolutions of the issues for all stakeholders. And I guess, am I at a point here where I can share the screen? Uh, yes, here we go. Yeah, yes, sir, please go ahead. Uh, there it is. Okay, uh, I believe, is that, is that screen up for everyone? It is, go ahead, sir. Okay, got it. Okay, I'm not going to cover the points on here. I'm going to go through my testimony. This was a document we put together last week to, in a uh, nutshell, summarize where we're heading. And the topic is uh, the issues associated with APOs in Texas. We feel strongly that time has come for the APO industry to move past broad statements such as uh, more regulations will cause unintended consequences. We are already heavily regulated and more regulations will slow the permitting process and construction of new APO operations and thereby cause product shortages to support the high growth rates in Texas. We feel that uh, all of those issues are manageable and our rapid growth in Texas is, are causing major APO issues that need to be resolved nevertheless. I didn't plan to cover this, but I think it's important. We're not anti-industry. In fact, most of our technical team spent our lifetimes in uh, large corporations. I personally spent 42 years with ExxonMobil on the other side of the, on the industry side of the fence. And I find myself as a landowner staring down uh, massive APO growth on the uh, balconies of Scarpment. They have surrounded my farm. And I recently got to uh, 
enjoy a massive fine tailing spill on a six month old dike with a new operation. So I, uh, I, I am in this uh, deep and on both sides. APO issues are large, impact many residents and landowners across the states, and in our view are not going away with studies and discussion only. The upper left of that chart, you can glance at it. I think uh, TCEQ enumerated a uh, definition of EPOs that's very close to that. That's our definition that we're carrying within TRAM. Realistic action steps and your assistance are needed. We do not believe that realistic actions will cause any significant harm to the APO industry or cost the APO industry a lot. Going on here, I'm a fifth generation Texan, born and raised in a rural farming community in Southwest Kamal County. We call it Kamal Settlement these days with the historical documentation, et cetera. This area was largely rural until 20, 15, 20 years ago when our area's growth rates started skyrocketing. We heard uh, APO uh, industry reps talk about the old days when the uh, quarries were distances away from the farms. My brother and I grew up uh, noting the sirens, feeling the blast from one of the quarries that was several miles away. And then we went on about our business, whatever dad had us doing that day or off to school or whatever. It was not a big deal when there was distance separation and low growth rates. We've got a totally different picture going on now. I retired in 2015. I had a pretty simple plan. Work on my pecan farm and enjoy the beauty of the Texas Hill Country. Pretty simple, really. The reality of the massive growth in the Hill Country soon became apparent, particularly growth of the APOs. My response along with colleague and neighbor Don Everingham, who will also testify, uh, this morning was to assess and quantify what we realized was a massive and rapidly growing industry with little regulation. APOs were literally popping up everywhere, many with standard permits issued within weeks of the permit application by the TCEQ without public input. And I'll add more, more recently, concrete batch plants popping up right next to residential areas due to the way the permitting structure and the internal rules are written. We then formed a technical team I mentioned we have eight members on this team, all seasoned mining engineering, mining operations, hydrogeologists, et cetera, and they will introduce them, uh, themselves when they give their talk. And we've completed comprehensive assessments of the APOs. We have data to support what we're telling you. The APO industry is a big, uh, big industry. I show $2.4 million on the chart there in the upper right and is growing uh, and it's growing rapidly, and it's also much larger than the next state. And you can see the chart there, California is next. Largely unregulated and re existing regulations are deficient in several critical areas. And I'll just add a personal comment. It seems very illogical to me that we define the emissions from the crusher so definitively and totally ignore the blasting, the ore carrying, the mining operation in, in itself. That looks uh, inconsistent with the way we want to protect the public. International, nationwide, and local APOs are exploiting rapid growth in Texas to provide aggregate minerals mined from nearby high-quality high resources. And some examples, Balcones Fault Zones, sand mines on the San Jacinto Rail Watershed. They're building massive moonscapes in, our area, in, in numerous areas with no responsibility for cleaning up after they're done. Reclamation is left to chance and serendipity. That's one of my favorite words. The geologists use it when they hit a good oil well that they didn't know was there. In a few instances, we've been lucky. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'm on, a, I'm on a call here, Luffy. Thank you, sir. My hired hand, we're pecan harvesting. Sorry, folks. Got to go on. Like I said, I grew up. No, that's, that, that's well, right, Mike. Uh, Mark, uh, you're, you're doing fine. Uh, uh, I think we just got about a minute left here. On this. Okay, well, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm carrying on. In a few instances, we've been lucky. We're housing and commercial growth have consumed and reclaimed abandoned APO mines as part of their building plans. It's just the industry is too large to depend on luck. APOs are uh, not required to adopt established best mining, uh, best management practices. In other states, these are used to underpin regulations uh, covering the industry. 
in most states, and this is interesting, these uh, comprehensive APO mining regulations were put in place to address major conflicts between rapidly growing population centers and expanding APOs in their vicinity. We have this a situation occurring in Texas now with uh, in numerous areas, and we see realistic legislation as a solution. In fact, if you look at the bottom part of the chart, most of the nation is covered with some form of comprehensive mining regulations, which includes environmental impact, mine planning, and uh, reclamation. And you can see the large uh, APOs are uh, across the nation in Texas, and they operate in Texas with minimal regs. That's what the chart shows. We developed seven key issues. We know from experience that once these seven, these key issues are clearly delineated, resolution requires the attention of all involved stakeholders, including management, local and state leadership to achieve equitable resolution. We established dialogue with numerous reps and senators who, and were influential in promoting uh, legislative activity in the 2019 session. Uh, we believe we got the attention of everyone that actions need to be taken, but we have a whole lot more work to do. Been beginning in late 19, 2019, we formed TRAM, Texans for Responsible Aggregate Mining. I've included a logo in the material that you have written. The coalition is now comprised of 15 member groups, 32 states, and about 42% of the Texas population. And when we got together and when we uh, started communicating effective, we learned that there's a large commonality of issues across the state being addressed by individual member groups. And therefore, TRAM has put its uh, mission uh, statement in place to work with lawmakers, state agency, and good faith operators to address the APO key issues that if resolved, we feel would result in equity for all stakeholders. Our job's not to shut the industry down. We're here to find middle ground. Our seven key issues, and I'll just list them, air particulate emissions, water use and availability, the rapid development of APOs without regulatory, uh, adequate regulatory oversight, truck traffic, nuisance issues, economic impacts. We see resolution be achieved in stages and we break it down. Our first priorities are particulate emissions, stormwater runoffs, tailing releases off APO properties and sedimentation issues. Ultimately, we see the benefits of adopting comprehensive mining regulations and standards, including reclamation to the APOs in Texas. In fact, our Texas APOs proclaim their success with BMPs, best management practice and reclamations in other states. We wanna see the same success stories here. That's our plan, detailed BMPs, underpinning prioritized comprehensive legislation that can equitably resolve the key APO key issues for all, all uh, stakeholders. Look, we're realists here. We know the legislator is gonna be preoccupied with budgeting related to the virus and redistrict, redistricting. We however feel we got a massive problem here. Uh, let's work on the BMPs, seek um, compliance uh, of BMPs by the APOs for major work in the state such as TxDOT. But we're, our feeling is we need to get into legislative committees next uh, spring and move the ball somewhat down the, uh, down the road. We need to move the mark in the sand. Uh, we know it takes several sessions. The sessions are two years apart, but we're going to be making a bunch of uh, specific recommendations today to uh, hopefully uh, the committee will consider for inclusion in their list of recommendations. Okay. Any questions? Uh, our next uh, speaker will be Keith Randolph, but uh, first I'll stop for questions. Uh, Representative Wilson. Oh, Mark, thank you very much. I think what we'll do is we'll go through the entire presentation and then do the questions all at once. We'll have uh, the entire TRAM community uh, unmuted at that time, if that's all right, Mark. Yes, sir. And uh, what I'm going to do is remove the uh, screen share now. Uh, Dr. Randolph, I think you'll proceed just with your narrative, correct? Oh, very good. Here we go. It's all yours, sir, sir. Okay. Everybody hear me okay? Yes? Yes, sir. Loud okay. and clear. Thank I, I'm you. Looking, I'm looking for head nods there. All right. Just want to make sure. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Keith Randolph, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, share some of my uh, perspective as a biomedical scientist uh, in this forum. Um, here, firstly, because I'm a native Texan and I 
love and care about this state. I was born in Fort Worth. I was raised down on the Gulf Coast, not far from Victoria. Uh, I went to my undergraduate school at Wayland College in the Panhandle. Um, I have three sons that live in the state. I have two brothers that live in the state. My mother survives. She's here. I have two grandsons. Um, this is home, and uh, I care about this state. Um, I'm a retired biomedical scientist. Um, I have uh, more than 40 years of experience in academia and in industry. My expertise is in pathology and I earned my doctorate from Wake Forest University School of Medicine. Uh, I spent my entire professional career researching and educating on environment and lifestyle factors that influence health and disease. And I'm here today not only because I'm a native Texan and I care about this state, uh, but I have become aware of and I am professionally and personally concerned about the exposure of residents in this state. Comal County is where I live and this county in particular, because this, this is where I breathe my air uh, to particulate matter, PM 2.5. And I am preaching to the choir here. You all know uh, uh, and have heard about PM 2.5 particulate matter that is 2.5 microns in size. Uh, which is a which is produced by all of the various aspects of aggregate uh, processing, mining, quarrying, gravel, sand, cement, concrete, asphalt, and so on. Um, a lot of good research in Texas and around the world has studied extensively the effects of PM 2.5 exposure on human health, both short term as in a day uh, and longer term. Um, and there is very good evidence to uh, demonstrate a whole range of harmful effects of PM 2.5 exposure, both in the short and um, just to name a few. And I, I'm a that many of you already know this, uh, PM 2.5 increases inflammation broadly within the body. Uh, this is a, a, a damaging reactive uh, response to PM 2.5. Uh, cardiovascular system, the respiratory system, um, notably in the time that we are now with COVID, it weakens the immune system. This is all documented by thousands of published research papers in uh, the medical literature. Um, not a month ago, uh, showed that uh, uh, a significant increase in mortality from COVID uh, from both short and long-term PM 2.5 exposure. For example, there are many, many, many. This is a serious health hazard um, uh, here in Texas, here in Comal County, where I live, as well as elsewhere. Uh, particularly susceptible are children and elderly individuals uh, that might be suffering from other health conditions. Since 2009, research by the University of Texas has shown that the air, and I'm just going to use Comal County as an example because that's where I live. This is the air that I breathe, but I can also uh, show examples elsewhere uh, in the state. Uh, the air in Comal County and, and elsewhere it frequently exhibits hazardous levels of PM 2.5, either in an annual, uh, measured annually or measured within a 24 hour uh, period of time. Um, I've offer, authored two fully referenced white papers documenting all of what I'm talking about here. And if they, you don't have them, I, I could be happy to make them available to you for the evidence. I'm not making this up. As an expert in the factors that influence health and disease risks, many are within the control of the individual. I, I can decide what to eat, for example. Uh, a healthy or an unhealthy diet, uh, I can decide to be sedentary or active in my lifestyle. Um, what I can't do, however, is change the air that I breathe. I breathe the air that's in the atmosphere over my head in my home here. Over the past three years since I've retired here in Comal County, 
Um, I've learned about the aggregate industry related air pollution in this area. Uh, and as I mentioned, the frequent uh, uh, exceeding of the PM 2.5 exposure levels. Uh, today it's 58. PM 2.5 today is 58. And if I go and look at TCEQ, uh, you see red all across Comal County, San Antonio area, uh, as well as frequently in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, very, very hazardous levels of PM 2.5. Um, it is challenging to me uh, to think about Comal County's future in this regard if aggregate processing operations continue to expand without more careful control and monitoring of the air. Um, there are many things that can be done and my colleagues that follow will speak to some of the more impactful measures. Um, I don't see any evidence and I am not aware of any evidence for enforcement or actions taken when PM 2.5 levels are at hazardous levels as they frequently are in this and in other parts of the state. Um, this is not good uh, for the people of Texas. And so I just, I leave you with those heartfelt uh, but substantiated uh, observations from, from the literature uh, and I, uh, that we that awareness and urgency about uh, better monitoring and action uh, on dangerous threshold levels of PM 2.5 exposure can happen uh, within our state. It needs to happen. And I'll close my comments there. Okay. Uh, Don, you want to pick up? Thank you, Dr. Randolph. Don, you're muted. You're muted, Don. Hit your unmute button. There you go. Now we're cooking. There you go. Sorry about that. I had Jack's mic up. <laughs> My name is Don Everingham, and thank you, uh, Representative Wilson, Mr. Frazier, and the distinguished panel for allowing me to make these comments today. My testimony will primarily be on particular emissions, and I'll summarize by starting with APOs, or rapid growing uh, industry across Texas, to meet the demand of their products. APOs include limestone, gravel, aggregate, open pit mines, sand mines, wet and dry, cement batch plants, cement manufacturing, hot mix asphalt, and bulk material handling facilities. APOs by their very nature of process emit significant amount of small particles. These particles for capture and control are required for crushers, cement batch plants, and hot mix asphalt plants, but they are not required for mining, transportation, or bulk material facility handling. Therefore, much of the APO data on particulate emissions are not regulated. Existing air particulate monitoring processes are inadequate for the model of actual air quality near the APOs. Models are required only for the new source mine crusher facilities and any cement batch plant and hot mix asphalt that is des designated as new source for permit application. No one knows exactly what the air quality is around APOs. Current TCEQ monitors are too few, incorrectly or poorly located to actually uh, measure the air quality accurately. APOs are not required to install or operate monitors. We have data suggesting that airborne particulate PM 2.5 levels are above the national ambient air quality standard and contain things like respirable crystal and silica with levels high enough to pose significant health problems. Simply stated, more monitors are needed to be installed near the APOs in the predominant wind pattern for selected areas to measure the actual air quality. This deficiency needs to be fixed. The air monitoring for quality, quantity, and pollutants 
and accumulated impacts is critical to resolving the APO issue. The key issue I'm addressing is air particulate emission, and you have a full pack of documented slides that are self-explanatory that you can look at at your pleasure that match with the references in this presentation. NASA has developed over the years technology that will pinpoint toxic contamination and unusual events from a satellite. A case in point, the high split, high quality air model that they use has been used quite often to trace back pollutants to their source point. Computational fluid dynamics can also be simulated in air tunnel studies and on site using real time data to determine critical factors necessary to provide true, precise, and uh, particulate matter background for concentration as well as total mass to meet EPA requirements for the National Ambient Air Quality Standard. TCQ uses the Air Quality Modeling Guideline, APDG 6230, which allows the Air Permit Division to forego site monitoring or any kind of real-time testing to establish the correct and accurate data for modeling new source review permits pertaining to the APO site selection and review. These should be site specific. I've done a great deal of study with airflow using fluid dynamic data to back up not only field observations for modeling particulate matter and the impact of wind erosion on semi-arid lands, for example, variables such as elevation, misalignment, based on Winrose data and channeling effects. It is critical to understand these factors and how they can affect wind direction and velocity in order to properly place airfield monitors for the primary reason of gathering background concentration or total particle mass data. You have to use air modeling that are used in air modeling calculations applied to new air permits. Air quality basically refers to the condition of the air that surrounds us. Good air quality pertains to the degree of clean, clear, and free uh, air of pollutants such as smoke, dust, smog, among other gaseous uh, air materials. Air quality is determined by assessing the pollution indicators. Pollutants are basically particulate matter. This is the PM 2.5 and even less. Photochemical oxidants, including ozone, carbon monoxide, sulfur oxide, nitrogen oxide, lead. These pollutants are found all over the United States. This is not just in Texas. They can harm the health, the environment, and even cause property damage. In 1996, the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee was established to provide independent advice to the EPA administrator for technical based information for EPA's National Ambient Air Quality Standard, particulate matter, and other pollutant reviews. The 47 member panel or committee was fired in May of 2018, billed as an EPA overhaul. The committee was replaced by a seven person panel by then Administrator Andrew Wheeler. After a short period of time, this new panel admitted that they did not have the expertise to do the kind of work analysis that was required to meet the required five-year review of the National Ambient Air Quality Standard, one of which was just completed. Several of these members, scientists, that previously comprised the science and academia team at EPA have now regrouped and undertaken on their own the same roles that they held before, even though it is unofficial, and they now have the help of the Union of Concerned Scientists, which uh, are worldwide, essentially. What the original group of scientists were reviewing was the National Ambient Air Quality Standard for Particulate Matter. Under consideration was the reduction in the requirement for the PM 2.5 ambient air standard, which is today 35 micrograms per cubic meter for a 24 hour test. The number under consideration was 21.5 micrograms 
per cubic meter for a 24 hour test. This is a substantial reduction. And when we see these types of reductions, change or investigation, you have to ask yourself why. This would serve to only ask for more data, research, including the background observation and real-time documentation of source and non-source point uh, generation of materials. Texas at this point is at a air monitoring crossroads. Locations in the maps and the slides that you have show past and present locations and explain where the data is incorrect, they collected or not collected at all. It is going to require a great deal of input and hard work by all the stakeholders to solve issues and find equitable solutions for everyone that everyone can live with and afford. Air monitoring is done under the EPA state approved Texas plan, imp implemented plan, the SIP program. However, this does not mean that it is correct or meets all the requirements written or otherwise. Citizens, companies, and governments all have a responsibility here to do the right thing. Those that lead or are in charge, in my opinion, have a fiduciary responsibility to assure, protect the values, the health, and the property rights of all without exception. By leading with a complete comprehensive plan, we can achieve equitable solutions while protecting our resources and supporting growth and development. In order to address the APO issues, plans similar to the Surface Mining Control Reclamation Act of 1977 are required, which by the way, the Texas Railroad Commission administers for the lignite mining. Air monitoring is required part of our, part of our own open pit surface mining plan for the industrial complex that can operate for decades or in many cases up to and exceed 100 years. Monitor concerns managing partners with TCEQ, for example, municipalities with governments and mobility branches have explicitly stated to us they are not interested in collecting PM material or data. Ozone is their focus. And again, if you look at the reference in the slides, you'll see that for yourself. This is because the monitors reporting particulate data are not located in the proper alignment for collecting or measuring upwind downwind emissions sources or a simultaneous continuous real time data collection situation. Monitors are not positioned correctly to measure APO sites based on Winrose data for total background. Chemical analysis is certainly lacking for some high risk minerals at industrial sites such as APO, and it isn't just limited to respable silica. Modeling concerns emissions with regulate emissions are regulated by TCEQ for air emissions that meet legal definitions of TCEQ as facilities. As such, important emission sources of fugitive dust and other areas at mining operations are unregulated in Texas. This omission produces a significant gap in protecting the health, the welfare of persons living and working in Texas. Texas TCEQ limits the accumulative assessment of air impact in the new permit, thus distorting the actual and true concentration levels impacting the community near a new and modified industrial source, such as a new aggregate or sand mining operation, batch plants, bulk material handling, concrete facilities as, or uh, concrete manufacturers. TCQ also allows background concentrations to be determined by use of monitors outside the impacted area of new source permits. This ignores the added emission levels that may be present in other local facilities. TCUQ also allows monitoring data from as far away as Fort Worth, Texas to be used in new air permits and source point for source point data facility examinations located in the Texas Hill Country. These assessments should be site specific and include factors such as topography, windrows, residential, 
in industrial sites by not carefully considering these important site-specific factors, TCEQ can further distort the background concentrations and introduce error in, errors in the modeling calculations. Other concerns recent, in recent area permits, insignificant data was presented that would allow a clear understanding of the impact of added emissions of track out dust, for example. This is just one of many, but is a potential area where large amounts of emissions can be generated. The standard concrete batch plant is regulated somewhat at this time, but under the standard permit, not regulated at all. Emissions generated by bulk material handling facilities are not regulated and are actually a newcomer or new player in this scenario. Best practices requirements for fugitive dust emissions listed in the permits issued by TCEQ lack enforceability. Best practices using water suppression for fugitive dust control are not legally required under all applicable operating conditions. Enforcement by TCEQ has been deficient by allowing the operator to ignore consistent application of emission controls. The lack of enforcement has in practice yielded higher emission levels not accounted for in the air permits. Real-time monitoring is, is part of the key. And I won't say too much about this other than that open pit surface mines and sand mines, batch plants, asphalt plants, cement manufacturing are emitting far more particulate matter than is being accounted for. Ambient air monitoring, uh, EPA state approved monitors can be deployed around these mine properties for uh, measuring dust uh, for quality impact in real time. And that's what should be done real time. If a, great, if a greater need is necessary, there are research air monitors available through Dust Sentry or TSI and even companies like AirQual that operate nation or worldwide can do uh, on-site monitoring with upwind, downwind, 24 hour, seven day a week type monitoring. Citizens are also buying low cost hey, hey, Don. monitors. Hey Don, why don't you, uh, uh, just wrap we cut up, up. Move and skip to the recommendations there. You've covered that really thoroughly. Yeah, I'm, they're right here. Just give me a second. Okay. Uh, the purple airs are 724, 365 days a year and require very little intervention. Our recommendations based on our research and professionalism, the TCEQ should compile a complete list of existing state regulations by industry and the TCEQ rules for air monitoring and demonstrate that they are complying with the EPA requirements and meet all of the standards. This assessment will be shared with the public. Reactivate existing TCEQ monitors around the state on a 24-7, 365 day real-time basis. And again, this information will be shared with the public. Three is to add the air monitors to the predominant wind direction to measure particulates in the air near APOs, upwind, downwind must be in real time. TCEQ should present to the public the APO data wind and atmospheric data or any other data that they use to cite particular monitors. Monitoring currently falls short, um, including the lack of collection of harmful PM materials required collection that require collection for chemical analysis, such as respiral silica and other elements. The last item is required require that the permit application include particulate emission modeling to include all point sources and non-point sources. These are uh, for the mining operation, ore hauling, uh, product transport, the accumulative effect of existing APOs for their emissions, and APO particulate dispersion modeling should be calibrated by history matched to include actual air particulate data from the new upwind downwind monitoring before running the APO applicant particulate dispersion model predictions. 
thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Yeah, very yeah. good. Uh, the next one is uh, testimony on uh, APO water use, and I'll cover that. Representative Wilson, we have a mix here of some talks going a little long, some a little shorter. I hope to give a few minutes back on this one. Uh, no, please go ahead and proceed. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Yeah, this testimony addresses our APO key issue number two, water use and availability. And I might add, the analysis that we made is a combination of two things. The Texas Water Development Board's data, the last official version is 2017 water plan. However, there are some draft components of the 21 water plan out there that we have looked at as well. And when we look at that pretty critically, and by the way, I also reported this to the Senate the Natural Resource and Joint Rural Affairs Committee meeting in February before our activities were shut down in Austin. Uh, when we look at this, we see that all 16 water uh, regions in the state are short to meet future water demand. Even more concerning, the shortages are growing with each five-year update. The graph, and I have a graph in the package. Uh, we're not going to show it. I'm just going to describe it. I have a graph that basically shows supply, shortfall, demand, and shortfall as a percent of demand. And right now, we're about 17% short. That's going to grow to 37% in uh, 2070, the 50 year time frame of the plan. And that's with groundwater supplies dropping throughout the period, dropping like 25%, 24%. I've added nothing new here that you can't read in the water development plan. I'm just restating some of the key conclusions as it relates to industry water use. We feel strongly this looming water shortage is troubling and needs more attention. We think APO water use is one area. These APO quarry mines use a lot of water. We see it at about 50 gallons per ton of aggregate produced. And we're seeing evidence by the uh, demands and the additional permit uh, leases being uh, uh, implemented by several of the quarries to back those numbers up. I'll use the Hill Country for example. Water use is doubling with the new quarries uh, along what we call quarry row here on the escarpment, requiring something like 5,000 acre foot a year. And when you look at that critically, that's equivalent to 12,000 to 15,000 homes. For comparison, housing growth is about 2,000 homes per year in Kamal County, according to our demographers working with the school district, et cetera. They consider this very high, almost double what was called high rates of growth in Dallas and Houston areas over recent years. Something like 1,000 homes in a county is a big deal. This is 2,000. And it shows homes are selling so fast, subdivisions going up quickly. It's causing Kamau County to be the second fastest growing area in the, uh, in the US. This growth is stretching existing water supply. It's small compared to APO water use demands. You gotta ask, where's this water coming from? If I go back to the water development plan and quote a few things, mining water demand, now I'm focusing on industry or water use. Mining water demand consists of water use used in exploration development and extraction of oil, gas, and coal, aggregates, and other materials. Mining demand, according to the plan, is projected to decline slightly from 2020 to 2070, while remaining between one and 2% of total water use in all decades. So in other words, it's small for the overall water use in Texas, but it's flat to going down per the plan. Uh, when you look at it more closely, the mining water demand drops 15% from 2020 to 2070. A lot of numbers, I'm not intending to cover numbers, but you gotta look at with our population growing rapidly, needing more supplies, how can the demand uh, industry drop? It doesn't, it doesn't add up. So what we did is we projected APO water use uh, using the USGS data for production and the population growth for the Texas water development plans. And by the way, their 2021 plan is gonna at the draft level, at least, is continuing a uh, growth rate of 73% for the 50 year period. What we do when we forecast the increased APO demand aligned with the population growth, we think mining forecast water demand will remain, uh, remain essentially flat, not go down a lot, 400,000 acre foot a year. I have another graph in the package that shows that. Uh, it, it, the growth of water use by the APOs is up, not down. If you look at it realistically on how much they use and how much demand for the product is expected to occur. We feel like we need to take a hard look at this large amount of water used by heavily industry, especially the APOs. 
you look at this thing and where do they get the water from it and here in central texas it's essentially three sources the edwards aquifer trinity or delivery by a pipeline such as the vista ridge when you dig deeper the edwards aquifer is uh, capped at a limit so that any new apo without existing permits in the edwards aquifer has to go elsewhere that means trinity or water pipelined in these uh APOs are further drilling these wells through the Edwards Aquifer to reach the Trinity. And looking at that critically as if we were designing a, uh, an oil well, we see deficiencies there from sealing the, uh, the, the protected Edwards from the Trinity. If you go up on top of the escarpment, the, uh, the new quarries such as the ones being built on the White Ranch are going to draw down the Trinity to a point where the neighboring pre-existing homeowners are gonna have water levels dropping significantly. Uh, that occurs already, it's going to be accelerated. Uh, moving on, the TCEQ permitting process doesn't require detailed review of mine water requirements and planned water sources. Even more concerning is that the local groundwater conservation districts do not have, most, in most cases, explicit authority to manage volume withdrawals for all new water well permits. Our groundwater regulatory framework needs improvement. Uh, I used to say I was offended that my rights of capture in the Edwards were taken away because I had to submit a permit application. I look back now and I see the Edwards being somewhat protected, uh, largely protected because of the cap on volumes. And it's turned out what I didn't like, I kind of like now as I implement my uh, agricultural water uh, use each, each day. In summary here, we have, uh, Okay, one, one more point. Uh, for most of the other aquifers, there's a thing in the water plan called a DFC, Desired Future Conditions. It's basically defining so much drop per year, which is a depletion strategy, uh, eventually. We think that's unacceptable. So we have several recommendations. Study, the first one is to study the requirements of relevant BMPs addressed by the administrative code that basically recur, requires housing developers to account for and plan for their water. We think it'd be prudent to apply these same requirements to uh, APOs. Study future water supply, especially rapidly growing areas in a state like the Hill Country and in the uh, Houston area where Lake Houston water supply is being threatened by sedimentation. You'll hear more about that later. Dictate that the regulatory framework include uh, design requirements for large industrial wells to, to ensure integrity uh, figure out a way to uh, implement withdrawal limits on our heavily used sources. Inclusion of remaining life for depleting aquifers in forecasts and water plans. I find it very interesting. The Algala is another reservoir that's being threatened by ag and other use. And the state of Kansas has put a map together that's in my package that shows estimated usable life for the Kansas High Plains aquifer. And it's an example, I think, that we need to include in our Texas water development plans to focus on that. They show some areas that are gonna be depleted in 10 to 20 years as red on a map. There's a lot of red. Empower local groundwater conservation districts to review and set limits on withdrawals. Okay, so that's all I have on that one. Uh, we'll move on to uh, number five. Uh, that would be you, Jack. Okay. I've are you with us? Yes, can you hear me? Okay, and you want me to put your PowerPoints on the screen, correct? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, give me one second, 5A slides. Okay, there you go, sir. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Representative Wilson and Mr. Frazier for giving me this opportunity to speak today, and thanks to everyone that's listening. Jack, thank My you for being here. Ah, thank you. My name is Jack Olivier, and I live in Kamal County also. I'm a karst geologist with experience working with karst formations that are characterized by the presence of many caves and other solution features like we have in central Texas. All of my geologic training was done here. I hold a master's degree from the University of Texas at Austin and a bachelor's degree from Trinity University in San Antonio. My testimony is focused on the increased potential for contamination of the Edwards aquifer by the growing number of APOs over the Edwards Aquifer Recharge Zone, which I will simply refer to as the Recharge Zone. 
So here's my first slide. Uh, the recharge zone is a state recognized environmentally sensitive area as demonstrated by the green text dot signs posted around it. The area is sensitive because water flowing across the surface or falling onto it as rain rapidly enters the Edwards aquifer through fractures and large pore spaces present in the Edwards limestone that is exposed at the surface. This happens with very little benefit of natural water filtration. This is very different than sandstone aquifers found elsewhere where groundwater flow is much slower and the sandstone does a much better job of water filtration and purification than limestone. Limestone aggregate quarries located in the recharge zone pose a special environmental risk because over 2 million people rely on the Edwards aquifer for their drinking water. The TCEQ is the regulatory authority in the state for all service development over the recharge zone. The Edwards Aquifer Authority, or the EAA, is primarily responsible for regulating the amount of Edwards groundwater that is taken out of the aquifer. Recent scientific studies conducted by the EAA have shown that the recharge zone is even more sensitive to groundwater pollution than originally believed. Unfortunately, the, rapid, the recent rapid pace of urbanization and commercialization, including APOs over the recharge zone, are threatening to cause permanent damage. So here we are on the Edwards Aquifer region slide. Region slide. The Edwards Aquifer region covers all or parts of 15 counties in Texas, as shown on this slide. Limestone is exposed at the surface in the drainage area, shown in green. The recharge zone is shown in blue. The artesian zone shown in orange is where the Edwards limestone is underground. So there's plenty of limestone in Texas. Uh, no problem with that. Although the recharge zone is almost 200 miles long, extending from Brackettville in the west to Kyle in the east, the zone is only five to 10 miles wide in the area extending from San Antonio to San Marcos where many quarries are located. Next slide, Mark. This slide shows a schematic cross-section from the drainage area, here labeled contributing zone in the north and the artesian zone in the south. This region forms one of the best natural rain collection systems in the world. Water wells drilled into the artesian zone provide the critical water supply for San Antonio and other cities in the region. The Edwards limestone shown in yellow and the underlying Glen Rose limestone shown in gray is faulted down to the south by the Fal Balcones fault zone, connecting it to the confined underground artesian zone. The blue areas shown within the Edwards limestone represent cave systems and smaller voids that are interconnected by fractures. Note that within the Balcones fault zone in the middle, the Edwards aquifer and the Trinity aquifers are juxtaposed. The EAA is currently working with the newly formed Comal Trinity Groundwater Conservation District to determine how the aquifers are interacting in this area. So basically we have a natural rain collection system acting much like you, one you might have at your home. You have the roof and the contributing zone on the left. You have the plumbing system or the guttering system in the Balcones fault zone. And then you have the water tank uh, where San Antonio and other cities are drawing their water from the artesian zone. Next slide. APOs consider the Edwards limestone to be an extensive, high quality and easily accessible resource. International and domestic APOs are purchasing large, large tracts of land in the region to secure resources for their long-term aggregate mining operations. The number of open pits in Texas is growing rapidly production capacity is expected to double. In the recharge zone, most of the oldest and largest mines are located along the Balcones Escarpment where the Edwards Limestone juts up along Interstate 35 and Loop 1604 in San Antonio, the area often locally referred to as Quarry Road. This location on the edge of the recharge zone has the advantage of having the aggregate material close to the major roads and rail lines needed to transport the crushed rock to market. Many of these existing mines are currently expanding to the north and west, reaching farther into the recharge zone. Sorry, Mark, can you go back to the uh, map, please? 
sorry. So APOs already control a large amount of undeveloped land over the recharge zone. At the present time, there's a proposed 1500 acre quarry in central Carmel County that has a projected life of over 80 years. In addition to the threat of damaging the Edwards Aquifer system from mining, quarries placed in the middle of the recharge zone will have to rely totally on trucking to move material over the mostly two lane roads here, where new rail lines will be needed, putting even more of the recharge zone at risk. Therefore, now is the right time for a complete review of the current regulations and enforcement provisions being applied to the TCEQ. So before leaving the slide, I just wanted to draw your attention again to the recharge zone in the middle where a spring is, or it says a flowing spring is uh, shown at the escarpment where most of the present quarries are located. The proposed quarry that I'm talking about is located on the other re uh, end of the recharge zone. So basically we're attacking the recharge zone from both sides and it's only five to 10 miles wide to begin with. Next slide, please. The TCEQ defines a sensitive feature as a permeable geologic or man-made feature located on the recharge zone or transition zone where the potential for hydraulic interconnectedness between the surface and the Edwards aquifer exists and rapid infiltration to the subsurface may occur. The TCEQ applies a geologic assessment table shown here for rating sensitive features as put forth by the Edwards aquifer for protection program, which is TCEQ report 585, which was last revised in 2004. On the lower left side of the table are listed the types of features assessed. So you see caves at the top, C, make up the bulk of the most sensitive natural karst features requiring protection. And they are given the highest rating for this feature type, which is 30 on this uh, table. Also very sensitive are man-made features and bedrock called MBs, lower in the table there, that include water wells drilled into the underlying aquifers. Quarries are very large man-made features, of course. Uh, however, they are permitted in the recharge zone despite the fact that the open pits can act as funnels for pollutants to enter the aquifer system with no natural filtration. Those pollutant Pollutants can include diesel fuel and ammonium nitrate being used as the explosive agent in the mining process. For urban runoff containing fertilizers, pesticides, oil products, and septic effluent that can be washed into the open pit during major flood events. The TCEQ requires the protection of the most sensitive features only when their water infiltration rate is judged to be moderate to high. However, a dye trace study conducted by the EAA in Northern Bear County in 2010 found that pollutants can be introduced without any obvious sensitive features being recognized at the surface. So in this slide, the important finding is supported by a 2000 gallon diesel spill that occurred over the recharge zone in Comal County in January of 2010 that occurred within a contained loading area having no identified sensitive features. And yet it took only a few days for the diesel to be detected at two important springs near New Braunfels, the Comal Springs and the Waco Springs, albeit in very low concentrations. The spill shows how easy it is for pollution to enter the aquifer and how quickly the groundwater flow can be. So the spill site is uh, the area, the blue dot, on the bottom called the Dino, Dino Nobel site. It was mixing diesel fuel with ammonium nitrate to form the explosive for the nearby quarry. And it took four and a half days, uh, four and a half miles, it, five days and four and a half miles to get to the Comal Springs in New Braunfels, the gray area in the center. And it took three days for six, uh, to travel six and a half miles to the Waco Springs. So. These are amazingly fast rates for an aquifer. So we're, we're talking about over a mile per day. And it doesn't travel a straight line. It's going every which way, crossing faults to get to those points. Next slide, please. 
The TCEQ applies regulatory guidelines, RG500, published in 2012, entitled Best Management Practices for Quarry Operations, complying with the Edwards Aquifer Rules. So rather than showing you a picture of the BMP report, here's a photo of a large private cave located just one mile from a, post, from a proposed quarry in central Comala County, just to give you an idea of what's going on underground. The BNPs allow for the destruction of caves. On the other hand, they do not call for any reclamation work to be performed upon quarry abandonment, nor do they make any provision for the continued maintenance of any protective berms that might have been installed to prevent the flow of surface waters from entering the quarry pit. Next slide. It is recommended that state legislator, legislators consider the following proposed actions. One, require the TCEQ to update all environmental regulations to reflect, or the state to update all environmental regulations to reflect the new scientific research showing that the entire re recharge zone is much more sensitive than originally thought, even where no distinct sensitive features had been identified. Ditrace studies are needed to accurately determine the groundwater flow paths prior to new large quarries being permitted, especially in areas close to major natural springs and water wells. Secondly, require reclamation of all open pits at the time of quarry abandonment, as is already being done successfully and economically in most states, and as we heard yesterday in some cases in Texas. Consider placing a limit on the number and size of limestone quarries and other major commercial projects sited in the middle of the recharge zone. And lastly, adequately fund the TCEQ to ensure that all environmental regulations are properly enforced. Its scientific responsibilities also need to be enhanced because at the present time, the TCEQ is serving primarily as a permitting agency. So in conclusion, APOs located in the Edwards Aquifer Recharge Zone are an important subset that requires special attention in order to protect a critical water resource. The last thing I would like to mention is that my oral testimony today is based on a detailed report I completed in April of this year. The report has been submitted as my written testimony to the House Interim Study Committee. That concludes my presentation. I, don't, I would be happy to answer any questions at the end of these presentations. Thank and Jack, we're going to go to the end of the presentations and then take questions. So yes. we'll, we'll hold that. Uh, next is our uh, presentation number six, uh, surface and groundwater contamination. Jim, uh, are you ready? Uh, yes, Mark, I am. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Jim Brown. I currently reside in Salado, Texas, and I'm here to discuss a specific issue related to groundwater impacts caused by aggregate production operations in Texas. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to discuss this issue with you today. And similar to others who've already spoken, I'm here voluntarily to speak on behalf of TRAM. My background includes a bachelor's degree in geology from Fresno State, a master's in hydrology from the University of Arizona, and an MBA from Rice. Although I worked in a variety of jobs um, for ExxonMobil for over 35 years in several countries, the experience I gained as a hydrologist early in my career is really directly applicable to current events regarding APOs here in Texas. I was hired as a, <clears throat> as a hydrologist to work for Exxon's mining affiliate in Gillette, Wyoming, shortly after Congress passed the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act in 1977. This act included several provisions requiring coal mine operators to evaluate surface and groundwater resources at prospective operations and to estimate the potential impacts of the proposed mining on those hydrologic systems. It was a fairly tall order at the time, and I'm sure it's one of the reasons that the mining company decided to hire a staff hydrologist. We had just begun operations at one mine we're in the permitting process for a second mine and we're evaluating a third potential mine. Um, with help of some good consultants and working with our mining engineers, our team developed the required hydrologic assessments and the impact projections that we needed for our permit applications. However, there was one requirement included in the Mining Act that we were really not sure how to address. 
SMACRA required a prospective mining operator to assess the cumulative regional impacts of the proposed operation and other uh, activities in the area on regional hydrologic systems. Now, at the time that we were working on these applications, there were approximately 20 other mining operations that were either in operation or in the permitting process. And at my company, we weren't even sure how to discuss hydrology with other operators without somehow running afoul of perhaps anti-competition rules or maybe setting ourselves up for technical disputes between our respective engineering and scientific consultants. And, you know, perhaps our bosses wouldn't have been too happy either. But the more we thought about it, we realized that this part of the law was really important. It would be one thing if our single mine consumed water and lower groundwater levels in the region by some amount, let's just say 50 feet. But what if the cumulative impacts between several different operators drop those water levels by 100 feet or more? Had that happened, these operators would have dried up a lot of stock wells in the area and there had been a lot of very unhappy Wyoming ranchers, that's for sure. And it was also frustrating that our best hydrologic models at the time, they were kind of speculative because the coal seam aquifers were actually based on fractures uh, in the coal itself. And they didn't behave like the classic sandstone or beach sand in a bathtub kind of hydrologic models that were kind of more in use at the time. It's sort of similar to the unique karst uh, hydrogeology that Jack Olivier just described. So in 1980, and this really did happen quite a while ago, uh, to address this complex issue of cumulative regional impacts, I came up with an idea to form a trade association with the sole mission of monitoring regional shallow groundwater systems in Wyoming's Eastern Powder River Basin. With a lot of help from our legal and regulatory team, we approached every mining company in the area and eventually they all agreed to form a thing we called the Gillette Area Groundwater Monitoring Organization, a horrible acronym called GAGMO. Um, importantly, rather than just including industry, we extended advisory roles to the U.S. Geological Survey and the Wyoming Geological Survey. GAGMO's role was to collect groundwater level data from each participating mining company and combine it to produce water level contour maps covering the entire mining region. The first report in 1983 included data from 685 or 665 wells collected from 20 mining companies covering nearly 700 square miles. As it turns out, GAGMO existed for 25 years and documented the local and regional groundwater trends in both the pre-mining and post-mining aquifers. Uh, to the satisfaction of the Wyoming Department of Environmental Quality, which regulates coal mining in the state. Unfortunately, the advent of coal bed methane production in the region during the late 90s and early 2000s uh, really depleted the coal bed aquifers and the impacts of the gas production absolutely swamped any impacts from the mining and the GAGMO well data became unusable, so the organization disbanded. For more details on Gagno's history, uh, I encourage you to read um, the, an account of the organization. It was written in 2002, and I've got a link in, in my presentation that uh, you can click on to, to read. It's pretty good history. So how does this relate to Texas and APOs? Well, first, some similarities. In the Edwards Plateau region, there are multi-aquifer systems, as Jack was just showing, the Edwards, Trinity, that are subject to mining impacts uh, either through water use or interruption by mining operations. There are also numerous existing and proposed aggregate product, uh, production operations, particularly in the Quarry Row area, as we've already been describing. There are numerous existing neighbor wells, you know, real estate development wells that are also subject to water level and water quality impacts. And at this time, to my knowledge, there are no legal or regulatory requirements for APOs to consider cumulative regional hydrologic impacts. Now, there are also several complicating factors if you think about trying to impose this sort of a, a regulatory requirement here in Texas. There is, first of all, a wide variety of APO operations, including crust stone, um, dimensional stone, and all of the sand mining that um, we're gonna be talking about in a little while. There are several distinct regions activity, um, the Edwards Plateau, 
but also up um, the Balcones Fault Zone area of um, Williamson Bell counties and several river systems all around the state. The, text, the draft Texas Water Development Board 2021 plans indicate there's insufficient water resources to support mining and you know, their approach is that, well, miners are going to be expected to utilize groundwater resources for their future operations. Existing large quarries may contribute significant ongoing impacts and they need to be included, but should small operators, say these cutstone guys up in Williamson and Bell County, should they be exempt? How, you know, we're going to have to think about thresholds for who would be involved in a cumulative regional assessment. Um, and also existing real estate development competes for groundwater supplies with the APOs. And any cumulative impact assessment needs to include the domestic use as well as the APO use. So there's a reasonably high potential for water related conflict between real estate developments and APOs, particularly down in the quarry row area. Now in many areas, groundwater conservation districts are already monitoring a significant number of wells and the, these districts should be involved in any cumulative regional hydrologic assessment. Also, Edwards Aquifer Authority is a key player in its region, needs to be involved. But what about counties such as Williamson, which has numerous APOs, but they don't even have a groundwater conservation district? From my perspective, there seems to be a regulatory gap regarding APOs, especially if the legislature is considering increasing the scope of regulation of the industry. And I wonder if TCEQ is ready and willing to take on the role as lead agency over an expanded regulatory regime that would include all these sort of cumulative regional impacts. I think that several of us are comfortable that the Texas uh, Railroad Commission has authority for lignite mines under the uh, Texas Coal Mining and Reclamation Act, and perhaps the Railroad Commission should be involved in this. Um, in a, uh, an upcoming presentation that Mark's going to read from Dale Farman, he will offer a series of recommendations which would improve the regulation of APOs in Texas. And I concur with his suggestions, but I also want to go on the record with a strong recommendation that any prospective legislation of the APO industry include estimation and assessment of cumulative regional impacts on surface and groundwater hydrologic systems in Texas. Based on my own experience, I see nothing wrong with the new law that includes a broad requirement to address cumulative regional impacts. This would motivate the appropriate regulatory agencies and the APOs seeking permission to develop Texas resources to find a way to get this job done, just as we did in Wyoming all those years ago. Also, given the numerous variables involved in geology, hydrology, and mining, I think any well-executed analysis in a permit application will show a range of possible impacts on regional resources. It's not necessarily going to define it perfectly. Thus, the key activity after permit approval will be a robust, well-coordinated hydrologic monitoring regime to assess the impacts as they occur and also to detect any unexpected impacts if and when they occur. To close, I would like to suggest the following. In the event the legislature chooses to implement an APO regulatory regime based on APO industry compliance with best management practices, I think those practices need to include two key requirements. First, APO should be required to provide the same level of hydrologic data for their proposed water supplies as required of land developers by Chapter 230 of the Texas Administrative Code. Second, those rules need to recognize the assessment and monitoring of cumulative regional impacts as a well-established best practice in the coal and lignite mining industry, which should also be required of APO operations. Thank you for your attention and consideration of my testimony. I would be happy to answer any questions when we get to that point. That's it, Mark. Okay. All right, thank you, Jim. Uh, our next uh, talk is Flooding and Sedimentation by uh, Dr. William Dupree. He's uh, retired like a bunch of us, but he carries the title of Professor Emeritus from the University of Houston. And uh, I'll turn it over to, to you, uh, Bill, and uh, uh, take off, if you will. I do have the one slide if you want me to put it up. Uh, not necessary. No, Go ahead, fine. sir. Thank you. Okay, well, I appreciate the uh, 
opportunity to, to talk at this group. Um, I'm Bill Dupre. I'm presently Professor Emeritus at the University of Houston. Uh, and I've been working on geologic hazards and risk assessment really for the bulk of my professional career. I got a master's and bachelor's from the University of Houston in geology, I'm sorry, University of Texas, um, then followed by a master's in hydrology and a PhD in geology from Stanford University. And for the last 45 years, I've been working mainly at the University of Houston, uh, doing research and, and supervising research on geologic risk assessment. That's in addition to a variety of uh, consulting uh, jobs for a variety of federal and state uh, agencies as well as other companies. My, my interest, my theme, if you like, is that uh, my focus is on how people are affected by geologic processes and how geologic processes are affected by people. So we're gonna shift gears a little bit. We're gonna to go to uh, the coastal area of uh, San, uh, Jose, San uh, Jacinto River Basin and look at the effects of flooding, erosion and sedimentation relative to sand and gravel mines in the Houston area. Um, according to the EPA, sediment is the most important pollutant in US waterways. Well, almost 70% of that sediment being the result of human activity. The most common sources of human caused sediment pollution are dams, uh, agriculture, urbanization, and minings. And it's the mining effects that I'm gonna talk about today. Most sand and gravel mines in Texas are associated with river deposits. Uh, there is a diagram um, in my presentation that illustrates the types. I'm gonna focus on two types of sand mines, uh, those in floodplains and those in streams, in the channel itself. Uh, now, in order to understand dealing with mining in and adjacent to rivers, uh, we need to understand a concept called the sediment budget. And that's basically the idea that we look at the rate of sediment coming into and exiting a system. If more comes in than comes out, there's a positive budget. If less comes in than goes out, there's a negative. And a, a way of understanding this is to imagine what happens when we dam a river. Sediment is trapped in the ensuing lakes. Sediment is deposited. There's an ensuing growth of a delta, such as in Kingwood today, uh, and accelerated flooding due to that uh, deposition of sediment. The sediment also fills the reservoir, in some cases, at accelerated rates. Conversely, as we look downstream from the lake, um, whereas as the upstream had a positive sediment budget, the downstream area has a negative sediment budget in that the sediment has been depleted and the river in an attempt to reestablish its sediment transport system begins to erode. So that we have deposition upstream and erosion downstream all because of a change in budget. Uh, and this idea is fundamental to understanding the impacts and problems of, of areas like uh, sand mines along rivers. If we look at floodplain mining first and look at the exploration and construction phase, site activities mainly result in the loss of riparian and floodplain habitats. But in addition, it typically has accelerated erosion and associated sediment pollution due to devegetation. If we begin with the ex active mining phase, the main environmental issues there are pit, pit lectures due to uh, uh, protective levees and dikes being, being breached. Uh, the dike failures uh, can result in the flushing of water and pollutants onto adjacent land, water bodies, and wetlands. And additionally, uh, pollutants can occur from ruptured pipelines due to the erosion uh, and even problems of leakage uh, from the pits due to groundwater. The most extreme result of breaching of these pits is a phenomenon called pit capture. And those result in the reworking, uh, rerouting of a river uh, into the pits and uh, throughout the pits. Uh, this typically results when the buffer width between the the pit and the river are too narrow, uh, where the levees are poorly designed or, and or maintained, and or the depth of the pit is below the channel uh, uh, base. 
Uh, and these all have major environmental consequences. Now, it's not uncommon for breaches of sand pits in the West Fork of the San Jacinto River to be repeatedly breached uh, by floods of varying magnitude. And these breaches are often left open, uh, unfixed for months or even years, in some cases up to 10 years. And it's also unfortunate that some of these breaches and man-made drains into adjacent land and waterways uh, may be the result of improper and perhaps illegal activities by the mine open openers and owners themselves. Now, when a lever levee breach occurs, coarse grain sediment is trapped in the breach, whereas fine grain suspended sediment and contaminants from the pit are flushed downstream, causing downstream pollution. These breaches, breaches if left open, uh, can then allow sediment and contaminants to continue to leak into the river after the flood. When increased coarse grain sediment is deposited downstream, deposition of sandbars and increased local flooding can occur. Post mining, without major restoration effects, these abandoned pits are especially prone to continued breaching pollution and pit capture as described earlier. And that's because once abandoned river erosion and flooding continues to occur, yet maintenance of the levees is neglected. Uh, it should be added, however, that the abandoned as well as active pits can locally and temporarily serve as bedload sediment traps and detention ponds, although the net of impact of these structures is, is uncertain. Now, there are specific issues related to in-channel mining or in-stream mining as well. Since the passage of the Clean Water Amendments of 1977, some states have heavily restricted or even banned in-stream mining. It's also been banned in many countries throughout the world because of the extreme environmental damage that can occur. Major disruption of benthic and riparian habitats due to dredging and increased sediment is put into suspension. Uh, changes in turbidity, total dissolved solids, temperatures, et cetera, further degrade water quality. Okay. In-stream dredging can result in major channel modification, in, including upstream incision or head cutting and downstream erosion and deposition. And this can occur kilometers upstream and downstream and have caused in the past extreme damage, including pipeline and bridge failures and some fatalities. What can we do? What are some possible remediations? Well, I've got some recommendations that apply to all APOs. Uh, this would include, among other things, requiring best management practices for APOs like those that we've talked about and are present in most other states and many countries. Uh, require APOs to develop and make available to regulators and the public a comprehensive mine plan before the permits are issued. The mine plan should be based on the BMPs and include a comprehensive evaluation of the site's pre-existing conditions, as well as an environmental assessment report. All the APOs should be required to acquire a reclamation permit and file performance bonds before production permits are granted, as well as attaching adequate civil and criminal penalties for non-payment. The post mining reclamation should require the site to be returned to a sustainable, natural or economically usable state in consultation with landowners. Now, in addition to these more general requirements, more specific requirements should be considered when we talk about floodplain and in-stream mining. For floodplain mining, the pre-development studies should also include specific studies of existing conditions and environmental impacts, both upstream and downstream of the site. There should be a, a minimizing or even restricting new mining from deleted floodplains, floodways, and channel migration zones where erosion is most likely to occur. It should require erosion control measures during the construction, active mining, and post mining phases to minimize the damage to stream banks and riparian vegetation. There should be maintained a natural vegetated riparian buffer along the margins of streams, both to resist erosion and shade and cool the river. There should be a minimum buffer zone before, between pits and perennial and ephemeral streams adjacent landowner properties and public water supply and domestic water wells. There should be minimum widths and slopes for protective levees to avoid breaching that allow water to enter and exit the pits. If located on a 100 year 1% floodplain, levees should be designed to withstand flooding and erosion from those 1% floods. 
Also, mining should not be allowed to go below the depth of the adjacent channel bottom. Appropriate state agencies should regulate or should regularly conduct water quality sampling both during the active and um, post mine uh, abandonment phases. And post mine reclamation should include, among other things, uh, levy design and maintenance to adequately avoid pit capture during future floods. For in stream mining, uh, if it's going to occur, it, it needs to be restricted to those portions of the river where long term net stream deposition has been well documented. Uh, pre development surveys should include specific studies of riparian and in stream flora and fauna, as well as pre and post development river bottom morphology. There needs to be determined baseline sediment characteristics, including up and downstream, including grain size and potential contaminants. There needs to be delineated potential upstream and downstream problem sites should increased erosion and sedimentation occur, sites like wetlands and reservoirs. There needs to minimize overflow during dredging, restrict both the depth and location of excavation, including buffers between the excavation and river and high walls, and like floodplain mining have, uh, mining have regular water quality and uh, sampling. Uh, although bar scalping of the active uh, channel bar is preferable over channel mining in the river itself, it still remains more environmentally damaging to either floodplain or terrace mining. So let me summarize by simply saying that aggregate mining has clearly provided valuable material and employment for the state and the nation. But nonetheless, Texas is one of the few states where APOs are largely unregulated. And issues related to flooding, erosion, and sedimentation are but a few of the many unintended and undesirable environmental and economic impacts associated with APOs. Based on these tram testimonies, extensive reports in the literature, I believe there's a clear need for the passage of appropriate legislation to better protect the public. Uh, my details of my presentation and reference material are available. Um, in addition, I'll be available to answer questions at the end of the discussion. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Representative Wilson has asked to, uh, to wrap up by 1130. So Bill, I appreciate your comments. That uh, has been, for me, over the last few months, unbelievably insightful to understand the sedimentation issues. Okay. We have three talks left. We're not going to cover those in details mine planning and management, truck traffic and nuisance issues. We've covered a lot of that in the past. I just wanna make a comment uh, referencing uh, talk number eight, mine planning and management. Dale Foreman was unable to be with us today. He carries a pedigree of extensive mining engineering background. He worked with uh, Jim Brown in Wyoming, saw firsthand the application of comprehensive rules to mining. And he makes a number of recommendations in his report that basically says, Moving toward comprehensive regulations, like most of the states, will not only resolve most of the uh, stakeholder key issues, but we feel add a moderate or minimal cost to the cost of reclamation that is passed on in the unit product cost to the, uh, the end users in a way that's hardly even noticeable. Uh, number nine is truck traffic. And as we've discussed before, that topic has been uh, uh, well covered. And I believe TxDOT will be covering more on that. I would just like to mention that one uh, summary observation is on Quarry Row and in these areas where we've had highly high concentrations of concrete batch plants, the truck traffic on substandard roads ramps up measurably. And that needs to be studied ahead of time by the applicable or the relevant participants. TxDOT, local county commissioners, the uh, applying APO operator, et cetera. Nuisance issues, we've talked about those, and I want to just make two points. I want to share a screen with a picture, and I want to make two points. Uh, why worry about nuisance? Because it's truly traumatic, and it's 24-7 to all the uh, landowners around. Uh, backup beepers, we've talked about those. Uh, Jill Shackelford talked about the white noise or so-called duck quacks yesterday. I had the uh, the pleasure of observing a large Amazon truck back up to a location. I was uh, participating in a farmer's market last Saturday. It's the first time I heard the white noise duck quack. Totally different game plan, uh, game plan than the backup beepers. We need to push those. The second issue is the overwhelming noise uh, the pollution. 
this picture is of Corey Rowe uh, several months ago. And, you know, where is our sunset and our nighttime skies where we could be using uh, dark sky technology uh, to uh, manage this in a more prudent way that would affect everybody? Okay, I'm going to stop there. Uh, Representative Wilson, uh, we've covered all 10 of our topics. We have a lot of supporting information in the files that we shared with the committee. And uh, we'll take any questions at any time. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, gentlemen, for all, all your testimony and information that you have provided today. I, have, uh, I do have a couple of questions uh, about your presentations. And, and yes, I, I know that this being a town hall is exactly that, a town hall. Uh, I, I will say that the, uh, the interim committee uh, will be excited to receive your testimony to be able to inform our report. So with that, let's get to the questions. Dr. Randolph, uh, sir, when was the last time the rules changed regarding air particulates and what are safe amounts and do you know why? <clears throat> to my knowledge, the, uh, the most recent uh, peer review published uh, documentation for uh, safe and uh, risk thresholds for PM2 exposure uh, was in 2009. Uh, and there's a paper that is largely but, not, but broader than uh, World Health Organization science. And, uh, uh, a, 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 an average daily exposure of uh, 25 micrograms per cubic meter uh, was considered the risk threshold. Levels higher than that uh, are considered uh, very risky. Again, today, I'm breathing PM 2.5 at almost 60 micrograms per cubic meter. Uh, so more than twice that, and that's not infrequent. Uh, the uh, annual mean uh, level for uh, risk uh, is uh, 10 uh, miles per cubic meter. So it's lower, but it, it, your exposure is over a longer period of time. So uh, I'm, uh, those are, that's the most recent peer-reviewed published uh, information that I have. Uh, and most of the more current or more recent publications that are exploring PM2 exposure levels uh, and health risks uh, are consistent with that 25 micrograms per cubic meter uh, range as being, you know, uh, the, the risk area, depending if you're short term or long term. Thank you, sir. Uh, follow on question. Does the type of air particulates change based on the type of aggregate being processed and uh, which sites tend to pose the oh, highest, highest potential danger? So I, I, I will answer this in a very qualitative way, but this is outside of my expertise. Uh, Don may be able to speak to this or Mark uh, a little bit more uh, uh, with more uh, expertise, but uh, the particulate matter that's produced varies widely depending on the processing that is going on. Number two, uh, the composition particulate matter that's being produced will is a reflection largely of the composition of the material being processed. And uh, so PM 2.5 is not a homogeneous, you know, set of particles in the in, in the air. It's 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 uh, has mixed composition and uh, can, uh, um, uh, you know, can vary widely in, you know, the, you know, the chemical substances that are uh, suspended in the air in those particles. Don, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Don, I can take it if you like, huh? You're, you're muted, Don. Let me go ahead while he's muted. Uh, Representative Wilson, uh, we we worry about the uh, okay. Uh, we worry about the magnitude or the amount of the particulates in the air and what it is consist, composed of. So that's where Don's recommendation for uh, measuring the, the particulates in the wind streams uh, adjacent to the quarries comes in, gathering samples to, to determine what it is. We know there's uh, risk both crystal and silica in the APO products. We have uh, samples that show it's much higher than is generally believed. 
And now we see this uh, large ramp up of concrete batch plants who use fly ash in their composition. And given a properly operating bag house, the, those uh, metal, heavy metals from that fly ash will be contained. But on an ongoing operating basis, we all know that equipment has uh, deteriorating conditions and has to be maintained. So there's also potential for heavy metals. RCS and heavy metals need to be measured. Don, you're, you're muted. You want to try to get, there you go. Go ahead. Hey, Don. I finally got off. Yeah, you're right. Um, I really don't have anything to add to it other than there are other elements out there that are in the parent materials that are being mined that does change the uh, quantity of PM materials. But the thing that really is important is not only the PM 2.5, there's the PM 10 all the way down to nanoparticles. And we're finding there's just tens of thousands of research papers worldwide on nanoparticles right now of crystalline silica, things like um, chromium-6, uh, even tires that are ground up and used in cement kilns are now appearing as nanoparticles and health risks throughout the world. So um, there's a lot to look at here and it's not being collected or addressed. Thank you, Don. So a lot of our viewers uh, today uh, we're hearing from uh, basically, they're just concerned from the day-to-day. -day. Obviously, you, you guys are, 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 uh, have a lot of knowledge in this particular area, and as well as TCEQ, who, who joined us as well. But for the day-to-day, -day, there are folks who literally dust one day, and the very next day have to dust again. And uh, we're, we're talking about new residences, not uh, old residences. What would we say to those folks um, in, in terms of if they're really concerned about it because they may be asthmatic or whatever it may be, uh, where, where can they go to be able to get an understanding of what sort of dust uh, they have within their homes? Any one of y'all can answer. Sorry, unmute. I got it. Uh, this is Mark. Sorry, uh, I was muted. I think the problem is with the current array of monitors out there with the uh, sporadic operation, uh, generally uh, not all of them are 24 seven, not all of them cover particulates, not hardly any of them cover composition. We don't know what the air quality is. Qualitatively, uh, it's, it's getting dustier as the quarries uh, ramp up activity. I've lived right here for 70 years, it's dustier on the equipment at my barns now than it ever has been. What is that dust? I don't know. That's why we want to monitor more closely around the, the APOs. So I will, I'm going to go ahead and add in another thing here. So the dust that people, that's the nuisance on your car, on your table, uh, this is, this is, these are particles that are larger. Uh, I, I call it fugitive dust. Uh, it's visible to the eyes. What gives a hazy, you know, a colored, it makes a pretty sunset, uh, but uh, it's uh, because of the way it diffuses light. But it, the dust that's visible, although it has its own set of health risks associated with it, uh, is different than on, in the continuum and the kinds of particles that I and Don have spoken about. Uh, these are microscopic particles, the particulate matters, uh, and they are invisible to the eye. And so this day is crystal clear. Uh, I can see, uh, you know, probably 50 mile horizon from where, where I live here out of my, uh, out of my room uh, upstairs. But uh, Nonetheless, we, I've got particulate matter levels now that are more than twice the, rec, the, the hazardous level on an, on an acute basis. They're invisible to the eye. So individuals do not, are not aware. Uh, you can't see them, you can't smell them in most instances, the, the particles that are most hazardous. And the, the way that individuals can find out about this is for there to be appropriate monitoring. And so we've got, uh, you know, we, we have guesses uh, about what uh, what the levels are around here, but that's about all we have. Uh, it just we we really don't have a good handle on what the risks really are, especially in these areas where there's a lot of aggregate processing. 
Thank you, Dr. Randolph. Uh, Mr. Brown, yesterday, one of our industry representatives talked about alternatives that APLs can use to reduce their water usage. Um, it was either by using a, a European dry technique or recycling the water itself. Do you have any numbers on how much water those alternate techniques use? No, I do not. It's uh, certainly, uh, the concept is correct. I think that the more reuse that can be, uh, you know, put in place, it, it obviously makes a lot of sense. I, I'm really, I don't have those numbers though. I, I might be able to comment. It, uh, Representative Wilson, basically the industry is dealing with a physical phenomenon that you can just relate to say putting water taking a cup of water and putting it in a big sponge, then trying to remove that cup of water by squeezing it out. In other words, physical processes are gonna lose some of the water to uh, wetting the materials containing the fine tailings. And, and to the extent that the uh, industry is treating the recycle of fine tailings, they can recover a good bit of it, but the answer will never be 100%. Sure, and I guess the other point I would make on that is that the uh, whatever kind of permitting process um, we have for these folks, that sort of stuff should be very easily knowable. They need to include those numbers in their applications, and it, it's something that should just be very transparent. And I, I, we've had some trouble so far really getting a good handle on, on what the water use is. Okay, great. Thank you. I, you know, I, I went, uh, I, before this whole COVID piece hit, uh, I, I went to Houston to visit Dr. Allen and, and uh, her constituents. And, uh, you know, I was also, we, we haven't spoke a lot about asphalt batch plants, uh, but, you know, what I found is they're moving into neighborhoods. <laughs> Literally, if there is a pasture uh, that happens to be open uh, between blocks, they are moving into them. And I was just absolutely amazed uh, there at the asphalt batch plant and the concrete plants that, that there is a significant amount of dust in the surrounding neighborhood. So really what y'all were talking about is uh, considering what the mix is, so forth, a lot of this is nuisance uh, more than, than um, uh, danger elements within the particulates. Dr. Randolph, you wanna respond? Yes, I would. I would say fugitive dust is an indication that you have a particulate matter problem. Uh, you, I, you know, I wouldn't want to live where there was nuisance dust, uh, but the kind of risks that we're talking about, again, as I say, are, it's coming from these invisible particles. You can't smell them, you can't see them, and, but your exposure to them and the, the risks that you are incurring um, are without the individual's knowledge in most cases. I, most people here, I think, would, would say, you know, when T, T, e, C, TCEQ says that our air is good, uh, air quality is good in Comal County, uh, that everything is fine. You know, well, day, I don't smell anything, you know, they're not burning. I think it's all right. But PM2 levels, 60, 75, 80, okay, and that is serious, serious. No, and, very and good, I, Dr. Randolph. Yeah. That's ex that's exactly uh, the point that I felt as if needed to be made here is is that sure there are uh, microscopic uh, particles out there that we can't see, but if you're seeing large composites, large composites of, debris, of debris, then therefore uh, most likely those uh, particulates uh, that are of danger could potentially be there. And uh, that's something that we need to look into significantly, especially when you consider uh, those batch plants uh, being placed within the neighborhoods, in particular in the Houston area. Very good. Uh, Dr. Dupree, uh, in regard to flooding and sediment, um, we had a recent example with Hurricane Harvey that created a lot of issues within our tributaries. and, and 
in last session there was specific focus talk about the flooding and how bad it was regarding uh, cementation. Uh, could you just highlight that uh, uh, that hazard and uh, bring to focus? Uh, is it better that we focus on prevention, or are there ways to correct a waterway that has been built up? Well, that that's a pretty big question, as it turns out. Um, with Hurricane Harvey, we we were first of all dealing with a, an exceptionally large uh, flood. And the net result is we had a lot of sediment being transported um, to the, through the system. Uh, that sediment uh, and accelerated or exacerbated the uh, local flooding. Um, a big question has come up and continues to what extent the sand mines were responsible for the flooding. Um, the reality is uh, we don't know for sure because what we don't understand is the sediment budget for the San Jacinto River. Uh, the short term answer has been to try to dredge out areas to uh, improve drainage. Uh, that is a short term answer. Uh, I'm not sure the dredging is always in the right place, uh, but it's at least something you can physically do and physically show that you're doing. A larger problem is how land use, and I would include urbanization as well as sand mines and others, uh, is contributing to accelerated sediment. And that is clearly the case. Um, and that is that ranges from um, simply um, the nature of sand mining and is getting worse, I suspect, if we start going into in-channel mining. And we see in particular, there's a lot of breaches that are allowing sand mines to leak. So it's not just during the big floods. We, we, we began to realize that although most of the sediment is transported during the floods, uh, many of the breaches continued to leak polluted material and sediment uh, during non-flood or minor flood situations. So we really need to address it on both ends, the uh, making the floodways more, if you like, navigable for the floodwaters, but also reducing the amount of accelerated sediment that's coming into the system. And that requires the types of studies that, frankly, we haven't done. Thank you, sir. And I want to thank all of you and let you know that I appreciate the fact that you would take so much time out of your busy schedules to lend us your years of experience on the potential risk of APLs and, um, and bring, those, uh, bring those issues to us. Next, we will hear from local government representatives and get the perspective on how the increase in aggregate production operations has affected their communities. These are representatives from both Burnett and Williamson County, both of which, when you look at active APO permits by county across the state, are in the top 10. Join us now on our panel is Burnett County Judge James Oakley, Williamson County Commissioner Precinct 2 Cynthia Long, Marble Falls City Manager Mike Hodge, and our Mayor of Double Horn, Kathy Serrano. Hello and welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Great. Glad y'all could be here. We would like to start by going around and discussing what your experiences have been regarding APOs. Let's start with uh, our city manager of Marble Falls, Mike Hodge. You know, Mike, the first time I was brought in to discuss the potential issues between aggregate and local communities was in Marble Falls when the city was concerned about the creation of a quarry right next to a brand new hospital. Can you tell our viewers about that issue as well as other issues that y'all have been dealing with? Oh, thank you, council member, or excuse me, uh, representative. Uh, Wilson, I'm glad you gave giving us all this opportunity. Um, just to kind of set the stage, so everyone kind of understands uh, who Marble Fall Marble Falls is. Over 100 years ago, um, we um, basically uh, were established out of a quarry that basically provided granite for the state capital. Um, so the industry, the APO industry, has been around for a long time here, and we realize. Uh, they're a big part of our economy. 
uh, and that uh, we uh, like for them to be good neighbors. And for the most part, we have several that are, but there are some bad actors out there. And the uh, situation that you're referring to is, is, one, of, is one of those. Um, a little bit about Marble Falls. We started planning for uh, the growth in our community over 20 years ago. Uh, and that growth was planned to go uh, to the south because of how many quarries that we have that are located to our north. Uh, we have seven active uh, aggregate companies that are working in uh, over uh, five or 6,000 uh, acres of uh, property that are located between us and the city of Burnett. Uh, as part of that process, about 10 years ago, we extended uh, $10 million worth of utility lines up to what would eventually become our hospital site off on, uh, at the intersection of 281 and Highway 70. Um, as we kind of worked through that process, what we figured uh, out was that um, that what all of that all of that investment that the city made was kind of could kind of not be for not simply because Americans could come in Aggregate company could come in and purchase property uh, and the only thing they had to do in, in order to notify uh, the the um, uh, anyone in the in the community was to go through the TC permitting air quality permitting process. Uh, for their rock crusher, and which is how we actually found out about it. And part of that process, uh, they're actually supposed to notify the city of Marble Falls, which they did not. Uh, actually, if you reviewed their uh, permit application, uh, there was no notice made that they were uh, any work that we were even within uh, within our ETJ, which they were. Uh, so as we worked with them and got to know what was going to happen through the through the public hearing process for that permit, uh, realized they had over 500 acres, uh, which the city in its land use plan had designated as future uh, residential development. Uh, and it was located within uh, less than a mile of uh, a brand new Baylor Scott and White uh, hospital, uh, which had uh, opened just two years prior to that. Um, we talked to the company about not coming in and operating, doing something different. Uh, all indications that they were going to be uh, moving ahead. They got their permit from TCQ after a, a short period of time, and uh, there was a lot of opposition. We had public hearings here in Marble Falls at our Lakeside Pavilion. Over 400 people were there present in order to speak in opposition, and most of the comments were, were negative and against the project. However, the per permit is pro was was issued um, and so what the city council decided to do uh, was basically uh, to bring a lawsuit against the uh, the company in order to stop them moving forward uh, and then in addition to that we started the process uh, of annexing uh, the site and uh, as part of that process normally through annexation process the process that I've been through before uh, we get a lot of public opposition to cities doing that. In this particular instance, we were encouraged uh, and there were some intervening property owners that actually uh, supported our actions. So that's, that kind of speaks to the kind of uh, issues that we have here with some of the, uh, some of the companies. Um, we brought the, the lawsuit. That was about three years ago. Uh, we currently have it in, uh, in abatement, uh, and then we also have since annexed all of the property into the city, uh, and what's happened is that basically they've, they've stopped their activity, uh, which uh, doesn't mean that they, can't, they couldn't pick it up and start tomorrow simply because they do have that active TCUQ permit. However, I think we've, what's happened is we've gotten their attention uh, the work that you've done, Representative Wilson, uh, in order to bring all of this to light has also helped. Uh, but we do what we what we know is that we need there needs to be some change uh, in that uh, right now cities can make plans. They can make major investments uh, and all that can be for naught simply because uh, these companies can come in. They purchase land and through a simple permitting process, they can start. Uh, and the air quality, uh, on, on, we have some pretty bad air quality here around town, especially on the windy days. Uh, and so um, that's something that we would like to see changed. Uh, and we think that, uh, as, as, as was mentioned here earlier, um, there is a cumulative uh, regional effect uh, with all of the sites that we have uh, around us. 
Uh, if you just look at one permit, that's that's not enough. It does not do justice to uh, the impact that this industry is having on on the uh, on the state and then also on the region. So that's kind of the Marble Falls story. Um, I'll stop there and kind of leave it to any questions you would want to answer. You'd want to ask, and then also leave it open for the rest of the uh, uh, local government representatives. No. Uh, uh... Uh, thank you, sir. I, I will tell you, you're absolutely right. When I'm sitting here doing the math, you're surrounded. Uh, the, the, you're surrounded by the equivalent in acreage of of uh, quarries by the size of your acreage of your town. It's equivalent. It's almost. Uh, That's correct. As if, wow, that that is absolutely incredible. And of course, you know, Marble Falls has always been a aggregate or a mining town. I mean, that's how they got their start. Matter of fact, the capital, as it was pointed out yesterday, um, that uh, that uh, that's where the stone for the capital came from. And so we're, we're an aggregate and, and a community and so forth, and mining community, but uh, this has gotten to a point where you can't even, Mike, you know, I even remember sitting in Boy Scouts with you uh, and the First Baptist Church just rattled from one end to the other because of uh, the explosion. Now, the good news is that's a very considerate miner uh, there uh, because they let us know that it's going to happen uh, at that time uh, that day. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, very significant and very impactful to the community, especially considering when you look at the collective number of mines in and around uh, a community, much less when you're looking at the economic development uh, investments that y'all have made to bring a Scott and White hospital with a surgical center um, uh, at the intersections of 281 and 71, which was already a planned developed uh, development area for housing and shopping and so forth because of the large uh, uh, retirement base and the number of folks moving there. But uh, I know you guys have had your hands full. Um, uh, with this issue, but you've, you've also had some successes uh, dealing uh, um, uh, dealing with the issues associated with the hospital. Uh, t tell us about really what moved the needle, if you will, for that aggregate company to uh, essentially say, you're right, we're going to move on somewhere else. Representative Wilson, I think the biggest issue was that uh, they, find, they saw all of the public opposition uh, and realized that we had made, they were, when they started their project, they were not aware of the public investment we had made. Uh, and so kind of bringing that to light, uh, you know, they could have done it right on the front, on the front end, come to us and had a discussion, which is what you see with a lot of, of developers, is they say, hey, we want to be a part of the community. How can we help? Uh, that's not always the what you what you get with the APOs. Uh, you, you a lot of times they're kind of an after the fact. I think though and that education there was a dialogue that was established. We sat down at the table several times, gave them an idea of kind of what we were looking at, and then we also got an understanding that you know there's only so many of the of these uh, large acreage tracks that they can take down and and do the kind of work they're trying to do. Uh, in order to produce the aggregate that we we all all need here in in state uh, and then also across the nation, so it's it, I think big part of it was dialogue, uh, just getting them to the table and talking to us, and they've continued to do that. Um, but uh, they're still they they still own hold the property, they still hold the permit, uh, and as I said earlier, there's still the uh, potential that they could move forward, and it could happen any day at this point in time. Thank you, Mike, and, and and we're going to leave your mic open just in case you want to interject uh, for the remainder of this period. Uh, Mayor Serrano, uh, welcome. You you have a rather unique situation there with Doublehorn and the nearby quarries. Can you tell us about uh, about your situation and and provide us an update, please? Well, sure, and, and thank you. I appreciate this opportunity because we don't get a lot of opportunities to tell our story and, and frankly set the, uh, the record straight. Uh, so I, if you don't mind, I'm going to tell the tale of Double Horn, and I think I can do it in one slide and probably about six, seven minutes. Uh, so there should be a slide in the deck. It's just a map. 
And a map oftentimes answers a lot of questions. I'm not sure everyone even knows where Double Horn is. Uh, we are in Burnett County in the beautiful hill country. We're about 45 miles west of Austin and about uh, 10 miles east of Marble Falls. And if that map, I don't think it's up yet. Uh, no, uh, Mayor, I apologize. We're, we're searching for that map uh, on our <laughs> okay. end. But we have released the share side for you. So if you have it accessible, you can pull it up as we continue to look. All right. Uh, well, I'll keep talking and let you try to find that. Um, I'm not sure how quickly I can pull that oh, up. Oh, that's okay. Just tell me, uh, did you send it uh, to somebody directly and we'll go through our emails right quick. Jeff. Jeff, Jeff uh, got it. Okay. It. From from yourself, right, Mayor? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Please call, keep talking. We'll pull it up as soon as we find it. All right. Well, just to back up, uh, Double Horn is a type B general law city. Uh, therefore, our square mileage is less than two miles and our ETJ extends a half mile beyond that. And given the perspective of that space, and unfortunately, if you had the map, you could see this, that you would see right within our ETJ, we have already three operators. We have Vulcan Materials, Lauren Concrete, and Martin Marietta Ready Mix. And then just outside of our ETJ, we have uh, east of us Asphalt Inc. So that's all what's there today. Uh, within our city limits, uh, which we are predominantly residential, uh, we have a portion of a historic ranch, we have commercial properties, but more recently we have an industrial property which is highlighted on the map, which would show you that this is the new Spicewood crushed stone. This is owned by Dalrymple Mining of New York. Uh, they are literally wedged between two residential communities, Doublehorn Creek on the west and Spicewood Trails on the east. And they are scheduled to open in 2021. Uh, that immediate proximity uh, brings additional challenges for all the property owners, uh, whether it's residential, agricultural, and even the industrial. Uh, we all have property rights, property rights for health, safety, quality of life, and the ability to prosper. But today, if you visit us here, you'll see dust covering our trees all along Highway 71 and, and also the businesses right there on 71. You know, windows and our nerves rattle every time there's a blast from Vulcan. Uh, traffic speed and volume are exasperated by heavy truck traffic. And finally, we have a lot of concerns about water, you know, the continuous availability of water. And then what will be the combined impact of another quarry oper operating right next to us? You know, what are the short-term and long-term implications of that? And what will the condition of the land be and what will it be used for after the mining is complete? I mean, it's going to be a very large hole. What will go into it? What will be the impact on our water? So these, these are all just challenges that we're faced with here as a very small community. But in my opinion, and I think the opinion of our community, they track back to one main issue, and that's the lack of reasonable regulations that balance protection for all property owners and therefore effective aggregate business development. Uh, so I think that's gonna have a, an impact on the entire state. And there's a lot that's been written about Double Horn and a lot that has been said about why we incorporated. Uh, and unfortunately, much of that is fake news. Uh, if I can use that phrase. Uh, the reality is we incorporated for the same reasons other cities incorporate, to protect our citizens, our safety, our health, and our property rights. And to put it bluntly, uh, with nowhere else to go, the citizens of Double Horn stepped up to fill a void made by the state. It's created by the state with that lack of regulation. Uh, Double Horn exists not to fight any one industry. It's just really here to give our citizens a voice and some small level of control as our area continues to develop. So, you know, in, le in less than two years, I'm very proud to say we've stood up a new city government. We've passed zoning, 
blasting and noise amendments and ordinances all to protect our citizens. And we managed to do that at the same time of going through two incorporation votes. Uh, so the city just recently finished uh, negotiating with Spicewood Crushed Stone on a blasting permit. Uh, this is our first permit that we're issuing and we wanted to make sure that we gave them the full opportunity for mining, but also took into consideration the adjacent properties. And so through those negotiations, we uh, agreed to terms that provide enhanced vegetated berms along the residential and ranch properties. And it also requires third-party monitoring services for noise, dust, and seismic and all of that is fully funded by Spicewood Crushed Stone. And I, and I really wanna also address the safety issue as we talk about uh, heavy trucks and Highway 71. Spicewood Crushed Stone is our industrial citizen. So to be fair to them, I want to mention that they have stepped up and they are undertaking an improvement to Highway 71 that will include a right and left turn lane as well as a central turn lane. If you've ever had the opportunity to visit us here out in Doublehorn and needed to take a left-hand turn, also known as a Hail Mary left, uh, you would understand why those are very imp important improvements. Uh, additionally, as part of those negotiations, we have agreed, or I should say Spicewood Crush Stone has agreed to test new backup alarms, as somebody just mentioned earlier. Uh, to uh, retrofit to their heavy equipment and trucks. And, and that goes a long way to improving quality of life for our, our citizens. And I guess the last couple of points I wanna make is Doublehorn did all this on, on a shoestring budget, uh, a budget that's severely strained by defending ourselves through the court system. Uh, we're in the middle of a David versus Goliath battle. It's the city of Doublehorn versus the state of Texas. Um, but we did this again with a volunteer city council. We just, we have demonstrated a willingness to sit down and listen to all our stakeholders, including Spicewood Crush Stone, and basically work to solutions that work for everyone in an, a very difficult situation. So we have a long way to go. I mean, we still have a lot of challenges, but I, I guess the message I wanted to share in this town hall, at least our perspective coming from Doublehorn and what we've done is it's not complicated. Uh, you know, protecting your assets, whether it's land, water, the beauty of the hill country and growing your business, commercial, industrial, that's basic business precepts. And there's nothing mutually exclusive about those two points. So we've achieved a lot and we have the opportunity to achieve more, but I think the real answer here is not what we're doing locally because what we're doing is at best patchwork. What is really needed is a comprehensive, consistent approach across the state. And I know that the state of Texas has a lot of power and a lot more than the little city of Doublehorn. So I cannot imagine that they could not follow our path and negotiate terms that work both for the aggregate industry as well as all the property owners. So the state may not have the heart of Doublehorn, but it can get it done. And I think that's really the message of Doublehorn. And I guess we never got a map. No, Mayor, uh, we did find the email, but because we're very challenged here at the Capitol in terms of our internet, the bandwidth's not big enough, but that's okay. We're going to work on rural bandwidth because they are the ones who need it the most. I will well, tell you, <laughs> I will true. tell you though, that I have something that I carry around with me that may help you though. And it's this, yeah. I take it to heart every day. I literally, every day I walk in my office, it sits there for me to look at firsthand because regardless of the issues that the state really doesn't have things to help communities in this regard, this is a bad actor. Anybody that's out there looking, I want you to look at this. This is what the mayor was talking about. You have Highway 71 and you have two areas for which housing 
and pardon me because I'm trying to center this thing. And then you have this space of green right in between where a company from New York came in on small acreage that is allowed by the state of Texas to come into our communities and place an aggregate plant. When all these other plants are also collectively all around the Double Horn area. Highway 71, an already dangerous place to begin with. As a matter of fact, that highway is so dangerous, I believe that uh, sadly one of the individuals of the company uh, that's moving there actually uh, lost their lives tragically on that highway. It's so dangerous. There's nothing that divides the lanes. But still and yet, we have aggregate plants without acceleration, deceleration lanes in close proximity with the bulk of the truck. And I know our county commissioner and our judge will, will talk about the same, but, you know, I'm going to tell you that's a tragedy. And a question for you, Mayor. Um, did TACA's specification group reach out to any of you to negotiate specifics for these APLs? No. Yeah. Well, I know that Grant Dean, as he provided testimony or shared with us yesterday, and I know you know Grant Dean, he's mm -hmm. been working very closely with TACA, and, and uh, it seems as if there is a level of effort to make sure that there's a reach out to the communities. But the fact of the matter is, is you are fighting Goliath and there's not much help from the state. And I'm sure the TCEQ folks who are watching right now are just as frustrated uh, considering the fact that really what they permit is covered in their open public forums. But unfortunately, it's just about permitting that piece of equipment that's going to go on that land. It's not the total operation, which is absolutely significant on the community. Let me ask you, how, and, and, and Mike, uh, please uh, uh, blow into this if you'd like, but tell me, how relevant was those public hearings for you and your citizens? Mayor, Mike? Uh, I don't think they're relevant in the, in the sense that they created a result. Uh, frankly, uh, pe people were tremendously frustrated. So I, I, I think they felt uh, they, it was a check the box activity for us. Exactly. Well put, Mayor. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I know then I felt so sorry for those folks from TCEQ uh, having to go and, and required uh, to go and have that public hearing. But, you know, and being restricted to discuss the permit only uh, because that's what the public hearing was for. But uh, we'll work hard to to try to make sure uh, in the future that these public hearings has uh, numerous folks uh, across the agencies and, and water districts and so forth that can come and help answer questions and take concerns as well. All right, well, thank you, mayors. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna leave y'all's mic on to interject uh, while uh, we introduce uh, Judge and Commissioner Long. Um, uh, Commissioner, Judge, in addition to what the cities have told us, um, I know that there are other circumstances involving our counties and APLs. Uh, Commissioner Long, let's, let's just start with uh, Williamson County. Can you tell us uh, about y'all's experiences, please? Um, yes, thank you, uh, Chairman Wilson and committee members for the opportunity to talk today. Can you guys hear me okay? Loud and clear, ma'am. Okay, great, thanks. Um, and I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, I see my city colleagues that um, spoke before me uh, shared some of the, the things that I, I touched on, so I'll skip past those. Although I will say that one of my first major awarenesses relating to quarry operations happened when I was running years ago for re-election to Cedar Park City Council, and there was a quarry um, in a neighboring or just adjacent to Cedar Park that had been operating for over a hundred years. Um, and uh, there were a lot of complaints related to the blasting and 
they didn't have to, but they chose to be a good neighbor. They started limiting their blastings to specific times of the day so that the neighbors could be aware of that. Um, they now have gotten to where it's only once a day and, and that the quarry will actually be shutting down uh, probably 2023. But that's just a, you know my first taste of all of this. But fast forward now to my role as uh, Williamson County Commissioner since 2007, uh, much of what I've focused on as a commissioner has been related to transportation. And um, I represent on our area MPO along with Judge Oakley, um, who you'll hear from in just a minute. Um, but uh, transportation has kind of become my thing as commissioners. Um, and, and Williamson County has been very aggressive in constructing roadways. Our voters have approved close to a billion dollars, that's with a B, not an M, um, of voter approved bonds to uh, build and construct new roadways. And so I fully appreciate uh, that probably after TxDOT, Williamson County might be one of the biggest customers of our local quarries in the region. And so I recognize that, that what we are doing um, is creating the demand. We've built 228 lane miles of roadway and have another 67 um, under design right now. We've gone from a population of 250,000 to over 600,000 today. Um, but the challenge that we face, and, and I think if, if I understand correctly, we're one of the um, counties that has probably most quarries of any place in Central Texas and if not the state, and uh, lots of, you know, we have over 1,500 miles of county roadway that, that we're maintaining um, on a, a shoestring budget. Now, I will say we are very blessed with a um, road crew who can get out very quickly and repair the potholes and the torn up pavement that occurs in and around the quarries. Um, but those, those crews are called out two to three times more frequently to do those repairs um, because of the, the 80,000 plus pound trucks that are, you know, hundreds of trips a day sometimes in and out of those. And, um, you know, with uh, Google Maps and everything else, what we're finding is, and ways is those haulers are taking roads that they never did before. And so what it might be a 16 foot county road that might have been experiencing 50 trips a day um, is now getting torn up in a matter of months sometimes if that happens to be the shortest point between the quarry and their next customer. Uh, and we, we've often, as I know, Burnett County and others have experienced um, where some of these uh, haulers are sort of taking their half down the middle. And tragically, some of those encounters have, have uh, resulted in fatal accidents. Um, you know, we have to do better. Um, we work as, as much as we can, but to some of the points made earlier, we often don't know um, that an that a operation may be starting until after the fact. And counties have, as you all know, I'm preaching to the choir, but have far less regulatory authority with regard to land use than cities even do. So we are really operating with very few tools to deal with the challenges. Um, but I will say some of the quarries have worked um, with the state and the county to do improvement around their roadways. I think probably one of the best examples in Williamson County is um, uh, Texas Crushed Stone that their main entrance is off of Highway 1431. Um, they initially started out by paying, working with TxDOT and paying for and building an acceleration lane so they could safely pull out of the quarry. Um, they've since added a deceleration lane and paid for a traffic light um, that um, has tremendously helped and, and reduced accidents there. Um, one of my coworkers 
driving down 1431 a few years ago, lost a wheel on her car because a hauler dumped aggregate right in front of her and she had no place to dodge it. Um, so it's, it's a real challenge for us uh, in dealing with that just because we have so few tools. Um, I think finding an equitable way, because we also recognize that, that we are part of the challenge. Um, we have created that demand uh, with our very pro-business and, and um, pro-development uh, mindset, but uh, we uh, would offer to, to work with you and um, I know you're gonna hear from folks from TechStot and TTI with other options, um, but we have got to figure out a way to have the folks that really are over, over loving our roadways help pay for that and help us um, not put that burden on the existing taxpayers and the residents that, that were there um, prior to. Now we, we have some operations. I wanna, I'll, I'll show off my little show and tell here. This piece of granite um, fell off a rail car back in the 19, or the 1880s rather, when it was heading from Marble Falls to the Capitol. It was crossing a creek in Williamson County and one of the rail cars jostled and dumped a load. Um, and it happened to be where we were building a trail. Um, so we have a long history in Williamson County with quarries and we want to work with those operators, but we want to do it in a way. And, and I won't even touch on the air quality issues because people way smarter than me have already addressed that earlier. Um, but that's a big concern for us because Williamson County, um, we're lumped in with the rest of the region and we have been teetering on non-attainment for many years. And um, you know that can have to do with ozone as well as particulate matter but um, increased quarry operation could have an impact on attainment. And the, the conservative estimates as, relate, as it relates to transportation is that adds at least a 10% cost on dealing with conformity analysis and for, that, for the regions that have, have gone out of attainment. And um, so it, it adds to cost just to do any kind of, um, in road construction, um, but we are not in a region that has a whole lot of industry to do trade-offs with. So if we go um, uh, out of attainment, especially as it relates to particulate matter, um, the, the only trade-offs in industry, uh, well, I, I don't want to say the only, but the biggest um, trade-offs would be quarry operations that could have a huge impact um, to them because that, that uh, you know, in other areas like Houston, you know, they can put scrubbers on refineries and things like that to get those trade-offs that they need. We just don't have that kind of industry here. Um, and that's a great concern. Uh, again, the, the earlier folks from TRAM really addressed that far better, but the air quality issue as well as the water issues that have been addressed are of huge concern to Williamson County and, and I know our surrounding counties. So I'll conclude with that. And um, I know Judge Oakley has um, some, some things that he's gonna share. And um, I, I apologize in advance, I have to pop off at 12.30. So um, if you have any questions for me before then, I'm happy to answer them. But thank you for the opportunity today. Yes, Commissioner, thank you. And thank you for uh, hanging out with us for half a day. Uh, but <laughs> thank you. Uh, you know, I know that uh, Commissioner Covey couldn't be here with us today, but when you look at uh, her precinct, uh, obviously with no uh, water district in place, there's been some significant issues uh, on uh, Florence, Texas. Uh, and so you raised the point about water, and those are certainly some of the things that we'll have to consider. Yesterday we discussed the sheer volume of water that, uh, that the aggregates need to be able to meet the material demands, frankly, by a standard that's set by the state and industry, uh, construction industry, to, to, to do it. So they're, they're taking it because they need it. But unfortunately, we do have some issues in Williamson County 
where they're not the good neighbors of Texas Crush Stone. By the way, we talked about yesterday as well because there are certainly some excellent companies out there as well as Hanson and on and on. Matter of fact, I would probably say that 90% of them are excellent companies, but you happen to, within Williamson County, happen to have some of the primo of bad actors. Those who definitely will not put acceleration deceleration slang, that will definitely not work with neighborhoods or communities prior to their blast. But the bottom line is the issue is, is water and uh, not doing research on their water in an area that's already significantly deprived uh, of water, especially during a drought period. I, um, I Thanks for bringing up the, the good neighbor piece. And, and, and by the way, you know, you're absolutely right. We're creating that demand, and, and we're going to hear from the demographer uh, later, but that really shows you the sheer numbers and volume uh, of what's moving into Texas, and the per-person concrete demand is rather interesting. And uh, so I guess on those overweight trucks and so forth, uh, you mentioned that your maintenance crews are tasked uh, two or three times over on road maintenance than what it used to be. I'm sure you get additional funds to help pay for that maintenance, correct? Um, by the time the additional funds that are, you know, because TxDOT manages the multi-county permits, um, it might buy a quart of oil for the uh, road grader that we have to use. <laughs> such a pittance that finally makes it back to the county, hmm. it, it really is irrelevant. No, I appreciate it. And, and uh, you know, uh, your information, and, you know, I, I, I was absolutely amazed during session that folks would walk through the door that were county commissioners and judges and say, you know what, never in the world have we ever thought we would desire a planning and zoning tool within a county. But to, for them to start bringing that up is rather interesting. And what's interesting is that it's not within our major urban areas that's talking. It was uh, some of our rural counties in which, frankly, the sheer burden and cost of those trucks on their roads um, is significant uh, on them. And, of course, we're looking at uh, that more in which we'll hear from uh, TTI uh, later today. Thank you again. Judge Oakley. Uh, if you could tell our audience more about our Burnett County uh, encounterings I'd, and, and your successes, I'd greatly appreciate it. Is my video working? There we are. Okay. Um, your question is about our successes. Um, I would say that what happened um, in Marble Falls with deterring the, uh, can you hear me okay, Terry? Oh, absolutely, Judge. And please, uh, you can expand far more than successes. The time's yours, sir. Please. Okay. Go okay. Well, um, so one of the successes, of course, is, is what happened down in Marble Falls on um, that situation. What that situation exemplifies is the fact that the counties in Texas have zero authority on land use. Um, if a rock quarry wants to put in a septic system for their offices, we have the authority to make sure that the septic system uh, meets state requirements, but that's, that's really it. Um, so, you know, it's a big debate about counties having uh, land use authority and complete zoning and all that. And that's a, that's a mixed bag there, but that's where I think that the cities ought to have some expanded ETJ authority when it re in regards to this, because if, if cities are growing, they need to be able to control some of the outer layers of that onion um, so that whenever that does become more of the heart of the city that, you know, they have some controls over what they have, you know, to me, this is all about peaceful coexistence. Um, you know, we need rock quarries, you know, we need landfills, you know, this is just one of the things that we need that it's, and, and so you have to have them, but the question is, is where do they go and where do they, how do they operate? Um, Let's see here. Move your camera. Okay, I don't know. We're, hopefully, we're getting this going. Um, so, how do they operate? Um, there's lots of different ways I could go to this. I, I've got to say one thing about um, the air particulate matter. Uh, Terry, or Colonel, I should say, or State Representative, um, you and I both know, and I'm not going to name any bad actors' names, but you and I both know um, it's a lot about optics. 
And so there's, you know, one particular plant that creates a cloud every day. The, the, the oak trees are white. Um, the houses near to it have powder in their rain gutters. So when it rains, they get a little powder residue comes down. Um, and you can trace it back to a conveyor belt that we've all seen it when it's dumping rock off the end of it. It's just a plume of dust coming off of it day and night. And to me, that's a form of trespassing. When it, when it affects a neighboring property, that is a form of trespassing. What I am told is, is that from an air quality monitoring standpoint, is that particular uh, particular matter is too large. It's not what TCEQ monitors. Well, I think we need to go back to the drawing board on that. Uh, there might be another uh, acronym for some groups around here for TCEQ. It might be Texans Continuing Environmental Questions um, because we've, we've got to solve some of the things that uh, concern the public. I don't have any letters behind my name other than PE. Um, that is not for uh, uh, professional engineer. That's for publicly elected. So I hear what the public wants to convey. And whenever they're telling me the unsightliness of that and that's, that that's got to cause uh, health issues, well, the real issue is the scientists say it that the smaller particulates down to the nano uh, particles is what causes the problem. But the optics of the larger one is what causes, you know, the conversation, I guess you'll, you'll, you'll call it. Um, you know, the transportation component is something that TxDOT seems to be enforcing more lately on requiring the um, uh, infrastructure requirements. There are some actors out there that do not have that. You mentioned Highway 71. There's a large player there that has not put in a center turn lane. Um, you have to do that Hail Mary maneuver that Mayor Doublehorn was mentioning. Uh, you see a lot of skid marks around that entrance. Um, and, you know, that tells me there's some hard breaking going on. Um, I have come up upon a wreck there and held a, the hand of a dying man due to an accident that was caused by that entrance. Um, you mentioned the other uh, individual that passed away. That was actually on Highway 281, not 71, but it still goes to the infrastructure needs on, um, on the roads. Um, we have you know, a good actor, Knife Rivers, coming in and there between Burnett and Marble Falls. And they're actually did about twice what I understand about twice, maybe 50 percent more of what uh, was required of them from TxDOT. So, hey, that's a good thing. Uh, Hanson, you don't even see them from the road, as I understand you talk about, talked about them yesterday. So I don't want any fingers pointed at any, um, and I hate to use the word bad actors, but there are those that operate at a different level than some of the others, and it certainly makes them, you know, stand out. Um, you know, the, 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 the aquifer is an issue. I think we need to be very careful. All of them need to be very careful if they're going down that they don't get into the aquifer and jeopardize uh, that precious resource uh, for others. Um, I, I, you know, I just really hope that that's uh, the case. County doesn't have the authority to monitor that, um, but we would need to make uh, sure that that's covered. Um, you know, the blasting continues to be a problem for some. I don't hear that much about that, but that doesn't mean that there's not. I mean, I know that there are some folks that uh, have have issues with that. Um I, at my house, I don't hear it in town. Uh, Hanson sets off a charge around one o'clock every day and you, you, you feel it, but it's not huge. And I think they manage it and do smaller blasts uh, instead of trying to do real large ones. Um, so Terry, I, I mean, the, the main thing I want to focus on is um, I feel for the citizens, uh, like when Doublehorn got, uh, the residents were very upset and I understand why, but the county, there's nothing we could do. And insofar as the TCEQ required public hearings and those meetings, well, that's, that's a great uh, one-way street exercise. Um, they just sit there and take it. And there's nothing to do. There's no decision points. There's no, it's just a, a, an opportunity to vent. Um, but I don't think that that satisfies most of the folks and gives them confidence in the process. Um, that's me rattling on for a couple minutes. Uh, what, what are you thinking? 
Oh, Judge, I, I appreciate your comments well taken, and 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 you're absolutely right. Uh, I was with you that day. Um, uh, matter of fact, you had just returned from when that uh, truck, uh, which was a city or county employee, uh, hit an aggregate truck coming out on busy 281, and 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 um, anyway, it, it it was very sad. It didn't have to happen. It was just a matter of frustration frustration of, of uh, probably a truck driver who's just waiting forever well, because he didn't yeah, have an acceleration yeah, that, That's actually not even the wreck that I was referring mm. to. The one I was referring to is way earlier, uh, back mm. when I was a county commissioner uh, down oh, 71. Okay. But the one you're referring to, yes, that's a situation where what happens is the truckers, and again, I'm not trying to point a finger at all truckers and whatnot, but when you have, mm. and I have witnessed it, where they just go, well, I can't find a break in the traffic to pull out. And they just pull out anyway. Yeah, I've seen it. It happens. And the wreck you're referring to, yes, a county employee, and refer to Road and Bridge crew. Uh, it was in March two, three years ago. Um, a a uh, semi pulled out right in front of him, and he t-boned the um, the trailer, and his head went through the windshield and impacted the trailer. I'll never forget. It was a horrific scene and he died instantly. There was no holding his hand, but uh, I was there right after it happened and, and, you know, worked the inquest with the JP that was there. So, um, it, yeah, it's, no. it, it, it's, it's, uh, you know, peaceful coexistence is what we need. And that means respecting all the players. No, you're, you're, you're right, judge. And, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's interesting cause, uh, there are some great companies. Uh, yesterday we had Hanson on um, great, uh, the Clinton family and so forth, uh, uh, part of the community. They're like Texas Crush Dome, been around the community for 70 years. Um, but, um, you know, one of the things that we discussed was the best practices. Um, and, and these companies uh, decided uh, to be part of the community or remain part of the community like, like you, you were talking about the conveyor belts, they, they have covered conveyor belts or they have uh, other techniques which uh, takes away the dust. But uh, the company that you're talking about on down the road uh, isn't even from uh, a company from the state of Texas. Uh, yeah. Possibly well, I think the one that you're talking about isn't from the U.S. But, uh, but uh, when I... Uh, when I, I hear about the situation of that very small group that is causing uh, the vast majority of the aggravation, it, it's something, you know. I, I also recall when uh, locally elected folks, uh, you had your commissioners and so forth, and this has happened in Williamson County as well, uh, but uh, meeting with uh, four aggregate companies that happens to be, uh, or maybe it was three in, within the same locations there at the vicinity of Double Horn, just trying to get them to agree uh, that they're all using a shared drive. Well, two of the three uh, using a shared drive, but there's no acceleration lane, and, and we couldn't even get them to the table. To... Yeah, no left turn lane and no acceleration. Yeah, lane. it's just yeah. it's just and... ridiculous. And when you look at the 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 values or the profits that the the comptroller is saying that these companies are, are, are making, it's just, uh, it's, it's just absolutely amazing that you can't get uh, some cooperation in those regards. But I, I hear that talk yeah. is working to, to help us negotiate those things. But you also yeah. mentioned Knife River, and, and uh, that, that was a totally different attitude. I remember being in your office uh, that day, which, by the way, the one of the gentlemen that was in your office from now forever is now the president of TACA. So I'm looking forward to, obviously, if it if those were the right things to do uh, for now forever to be part of the community, I'm sure he'll bring uh, that to TACA as, as well as the new president. Yeah. Well, one of the things, Terry, earlier in the presentation today, I believe I heard TCEQ state that um, within the last past couple of years, um, the total feet fines that were issued to anybody in this industry was just over $200,000 per year. Mm -hmm. uh, and if that's statewide amongst all uh, operations, um, that's a pretty small fine amount. And that's, that's just kind of a cost of doing business and probably cheaper to pay the fine than to take care of what's causing the problems. And again, I don't want to focus on any one particular 
industry of a particular operator. But again, when you see trees covered in white and the plumes of dust, when you got a prevailing southeast wind, and you're looking around going, it's almost like looking for a fire. You know, where's the smoke, where's the smoke coming from? And then you, 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 you look around and you pinpoint it and it's all coming from a conveyor that's dumping rock on a pile and it's just blowing this dust off of it. I'm really concerned that the definition of dust does not include that, that the particulate's too big. That I really think that needs to be looked at. If I'm wrong on what I've been told there, Somebody please let me know. We all want to make sure that we're making our discussion points based on facts. Mm -hmm. um, but surely there's something could be done to mitigate, you know, you see exactly where the source is coming from. Sure, you're going to have some ancillary dust coming from other operations and driving around on dirt roads. I get that. But when you can see what seems to be the vast majority of the source, God almighty, do something about it. Wow. Well. Thank you, Judge. Thank you for the comments. And, and before we close with, um, with our community leaders here, uh, would any of y'all like to have any additional closing remarks before we move on? All right, great. Well, uh, Mayor. They probably got off. I, I probably bored them. So anyway. <laughs> no, that's all great points by all. Uh, Mayor, uh, Commissioner Long, uh, Mr. Hodge and Hodge. Judge, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, you're real troopers. I know that you are very, very busy, uh, but uh, I, I did take note that you all have been here the entire time. And look, uh, if you missed, for, and this is to our viewers too, if you, if you missed yesterday, day, day one of our town hall series, three-day series, uh, you can just go to the Facebook page and, and, and pull it up and be able to to, to watch it. it was a lot of great discussion especially industry did a great job of telling us of, of what they're doing in the new technologies to make sure that they're good stewards within our community and with that next up is the texas railroad commission while the railroad commission doesn't oversee aggregate production operations uh, uh, for the last 45 years the texas legislature has entrusted them uh, in in um, uh, regulating surface mining, such as coal and uranium. Companies uh, mining coal in Texas must have a commission permit and post a bond for each site they operate in the state. Today we are focusing on where we can draw on their experience managing the extraction of another of the state's natural resources. Join us is Dr. Brent Elliott. Dr. Elliott is the director of the Surface Mining Division at the RRC and has more than 25 years of experience in mining and exploration related research. Dr. Elliott, thank you so much for joining us today. It's all yours. Yeah, good afternoon, Representative Wilson. Uh, I uh, provided you guys with a slide deck with a, just a few slides. Is that available? Yes, sir. It's coming up now. Okay. So uh, I was asked to kind of provide some insight into what surface mining and reclamation division at the Railroad Commission uh, does. And uh, I think part of that, uh, that request uh, was to, to kind of look at our regulatory process. And I hope that some of those slides will, uh, will help make that clear. Uh, so I can have the next slide. So our, our mission at the Railroad Commission is to serve Texas by providing excellent stewardship of natural resources uh, and the environment. You know, our concerns for public health and safety, and uh, we still want to support and enhance the development and economic vitality of the state and its citizens. Uh, you move on to the next slide. So we are the uh, oldest regulatory agency in the state, uh, established in 1891, and we're led by three elected officials. Uh, Chairman Christy Craddock and Commissioners Ryan Sitton and Wayne Christian. So our jurisdiction uh, covers the oil and gas industry, uh, both uh, exploration and production. Uh, we do uh, pipeline safety, and that includes the kind of dissemination of all those pipeline products. Uh, we do condensed uh, natural gas products like liquefied petroleum gas, compressed natural gas, and liquefied natural gas. <laughs> Uh, as well as gas utilities. And of course, in the division where I'm director is the 
along that same kind of energy theme is coal and uranium surface mining operations uh, that, uh, you know, that we uh, move through. Uh, so, oh yeah, go ahead. So the surface mining reclamation uh, division, uh, we have 38 employees, uh, myself and the assistant director oversee three uh, different groups. Uh, we have the inspection and enforcement group, um, which is one manager and seven inspectors. About half of those uh, inspectors are stationed here in Austin. The other half is uh, over in Tyler and College Station uh, really to facilitate the, the inspection of those mine sites that are in the Northeast part of the state. We have our applications and permit group with a manager and 17 reviewers. Most of those reviewers are, are experts in their field that have degrees in, in engineering, um, geologists, hydrogeologists, uh, environmental scientists, biologists, uh, soil scientists, uh, all of these kind of help accomplish those review processes for permits. And then of course we have our abandoned mine lands program that's 100% federally funded. I can go back a second. Uh, uh, with a manager and three program specialists. Uh, and all of this division is supported by three administrative staff and three record staff that kind of facilitate the open records requests and public information inquiries uh, and the like. So most of our, our funding, it's 50% uh, federal funding uh, that we get for most of the groups, uh, except for that 100% for the AML uh, group. And 50% uh, comes from fees that we get off of the coal and uranium industry as part of that permit process. So we have established goals uh, every year for each of our groups. Uh, the abandoned mine lands, uh, they really kind of look at the, uh, the abandoned mine lands prior to 1977, the uh, Surface Mining Reclamation uh, Control Act. Uh, they look at all those projects and we, we kind of we ask the, the public to be, basically provide us information about areas that may have been affected by you know, sinkholes and mine collapses and things like this that they can go out and uh, use federal funds to reclaim and, and improve those conditions. Our inspection enforcement group, we had a goal this last year, about 415 inspection sites uh, to look at 29 different uh, coal mines across uh, the state, you know, literally all the way from the Northeast border of the state to the Southwest border of the state. And uh, they exceeded that this last year, we're doing about 418 inspections, uh, you know, exceeding that goal. We had a goal for the um, applications and permits group uh, of 500 projects, right? This, uh, these projects range in, in size and scope. Uh, we accomplished about 487 of those projects. Uh, and typically on a, these, these projects come in on a weekly basis. Uh, last week was 147 pending projects. You know, this week is 165. You know, and that varies all depending on whether or not those projects are in-house and under our uh, review, or maybe they're in hearings and they're under the, the review in the, in the Railroad Commission, or they're, maybe they're back in industry's hands, you know, uh, under their review where they're going through comments that we've provided to them. You know, so that fluctuates quite a bit uh, within that group. So you see the map of Texas barely within those lines. You can see all the counties as it's distributed and the, uh, the kind of the geologic formations that have uh, coal uh, resources associated with them. Uh, those areas that are in red are kind of active mine sites or, or mines that are actively mining. And, and those are also actively reclaiming for the most part, what as they mine and extract and they move on to a new area, then they go behind those areas and reclaim them. Uh, the areas in blue are the ones that have kind of moved over to reclamation only. Uh, and you can see all the way from the Northeast corner of the state, essentially down to the Southwest corner uh, of the state. It's, uh, we have a, quite a, an area to cover for our inspectors as they go out and, and visit these sites uh, on a monthly basis. Uh, we also look at uh, uranium mine locations. Most of these are just permitted locations. We don't have any active mining that are ongoing right now. All of the kind of surface mining of coal uh, uh, has pretty much ceased and we're looking at in situ extraction uh, in the subsurface for the most part, uh, and until it becomes economically viable, then those permits kind of stay in, in action uh, and are active uh, until they decide to close them down or not re-permit or renew. So I, I thought that maybe we'd go over a little bit of the regulatory process uh, and kind of what we do and how we review those permits. And I'm kind of skipping a step because I wanted to go over the, the revision process first uh, is it's a little, uh, you know, more of a cursory inspection of, of these permits that come in. 
Uh, all of these are based on a permit that's already been uh, approved and uh, they have a, a change that comes in on that permit and we have to make an evaluation or assessment uh, whether or not the, those changes are significant, if there's a significant departure from the approved permit that, uh, that was submitted initially. And if it's uh, not a significant departure, you know, and everything, you're just moving upon, you know, 100 feet in one direction as part of their reclamation process, something they didn't foresee, you know, that may be something that's non-significant. It doesn't really affect anything else. There's no tertiary or secondary effects uh, from it. And so that uh, process uh, may be administratively approved. If it turns out that it's a, a significant revision, then it goes through a, a, a more rigorous uh, and detailed analysis by technical staff uh, here at the Railroad Commission. And we have a, a, a whole nother process for that. So there are a lot of things that uh, these projects that come in like uh, application revisions that are immensely approved or design plans and certifications, you know, monitoring reports, you know, blaster certifications, bond area adjustments, exploration registrations, things like this that are, that are relatively um, short uh, as far as the, the process and the, the evaluation. And then we have definitely uh, uh, more involved and in, in larger projects that come in as uh, new permits or renewals or uh, bond releases as the case may be. So you can move on to the next slide. So this, uh, this process, whenever something comes in, and this is a, a new application or renewal, uh, a revision that we've, we've determined that it's a, a significant change from the approved plan or a, a bond release application and kind of at the end of the mine's life or at the end of the reclamation process where that, uh, that financial security is released, right? We look at that uh, in, a, in a much more rigorous way. And so uh, we'll consult with industry, we'll consult with uh, other agencies like Fish, uh, Fish and Wildlife or Texas Parks and Wildlife uh, well, we have our federal oversight group, the Office of Surface Mining and Reclamation Enforcement as part of DOI. Um, we will look at all of this and consult with all these groups in order to, to make sure that everything meets our standards. And then it gets moved on to the hearing examiner. And there's a, a technical examiner that will review the staff's findings and, uh, and make a determination of whether they approve. And they may have questions that comes back to staff or industry that we have to answer in that process. And then once they make a determination, it moves on to a, a public hearing or is presented to the commissioners and the commissioners will approve or de deny as part of that, that action. So it's, uh, it's a lot of times there, there'll be lots of comments that go back and forth and revisions that have to come in in order to, to satisfy everybody in this, uh, uh, in this flow diagram. So as Part of uh, our regulations, we have specific statutes and rules that relate to blasting at coal and uranium mines. Uh, we do blaster certifications, uh, we review blasting plans, we enforce the rules for explosive use, and we monitor bla blasting events in, in the in a need, be, need basis. Uh, the last blasting permit for coal and uranium mine was in 2001. The last certification that we issued was in 2012 and it expired in 2015. So it's been a while since we've, we've conducted any of the blaster certifications or uh, monitoring any blasting events. It's just not happening anymore at, at coal mines and uranium mines across the state. So as part of our uh, regulatory process, uh, and whenever a mine permit comes in uh, initially, there is a, a detailed reclamation plan that has to be submitted along with that mine plan. And uh, so we look at that and we approve that mine plan uh, and based on a, uh, a financial instrument or a security bond that's uh, issued per bonded acre. Uh, and it has to go through phase release uh, in time after the mine site has closed down and after reclamation has ensued. And so we have to make sure that those post mine conditions are equal to or better than they were in pre mine conditions. You know, that's kind of the standard. All right, and so we have a lot of extended responsibility periods afterwards that may be five years or 10 years or you know, 15 years or 20 years. It really depends on, on the monitoring conditions, uh, uh, basically the environmental state. And we look at public safety and health as well as the environmental uh, conditions. All right, and the staff has to make those kind of recommendations to the hearing examiner eventually uh, before it's approved by commissioners. So the, let me go back a second. 
And so there's a, a lot of uh, factors that go into uh, that review uh, of all the data, all the reports through the whole life of the mine uh, before anything can be released, right? We have to consult with all these different agencies and we have to make sure that the soil and water quality, hydrologic balance, you know, uh, fish and wildlife habitat, you know, vegetative success, all of these are criteria that, uh, that really have to be met along with kind of original surface contour, or approximate original surface contour. Uh, and we, we monitor the surface water and groundwater uh, just to make sure that everything's within, within our, our limits and criteria. And then each site is visited by one of our inspectors once a month. And uh, that's to say that uh, some of these mine sites, you know, it could be as small as 1500 acres and some of them are, are more than 46,000 acres. And so we, we actually break those up into inspectable units if it's a, uh, a mine that's large in size. And so uh, you know, our inspectors may give a visit you know, four or five times a month in the case where you have very large mine sites that have more or multiple uh, inspectable units. Uh, so we're out there every month uh, you know, monitoring and checking on kind of the reclamation process, the reclamation activity and the, uh, the impact of mining uh, if, if they're still in the mining process. And really that's, uh, that's all I have unless you have some questions. Uh, and here's our contact information. Perfect. I'm sure folks out there are jotting that down. Dr. Elliott, uh, excellent presentation. You know, I could probably spend just a half a day talking to y'all simply because of y'all's expertise in surface mining on the uranium and coal side. You know, last session we put forth House Bill 509 simply because when I looked at what y'all did for those mining industries, looking to the quality of the water would be sustained, of course, all the issues of the, and, and, and health and air quality, all those sorts of things. It was just an excellent overlap, especially when it came to blasting, because blasting seems to be where we get a significant number of our calls now and so forth. And and um, and and so anyway, uh, unfortunately, we didn't get 509 uh, through the door, uh, but we do appreciate the fact that uh, y'all do have the expertise that uh, we can rely on uh, to understand what what and where uh, should be looked at as the issues arise to us uh, in y'all's full portfolio of responsibilities. Um, I do want to ask a couple of questions um, in regard to surface mine. The, the requirements for those mines, how do they compare to other states? Or are most of the requirements passed down from the federal level? And most of them are passed down from the federal level. We try to uh, almost mirror those regulations you know, directly. All right, that way that we're compliant, we, we have to have a standard that's better than the federal uh, level, you know, or at least equal or better than theirs. Uh, that's our standard. So uh, you know, we try to use their regulations that are already in place as much as possible. Is that the same for reclamation? Yes. Okay, I got it. What is the most expensive bond for reclamation that, that you know of? And how uh, have any mines not fulfilled the requirement of their bonds? Uh, no, none of them have uh, not fulfilled their requirement for bonds. Uh, as far as I know, um, it really depends on that that bond estimate. Uh, we do have, you have cal calculations basically that uh, that kind of address the the amount of equipment that you're going to use, how much fuel you're going to use, how much dirt that has to be moved, uh, you know the the vegetation that's going to be planted afterwards. Uh, I mean, all the work involved is a is a pretty lengthy process in figuring out what that bond estimate is going to be. You know, and it's, it's a case by case basis. Uh, and most of those are in the many tens of millions of dollars. Most bonds are. Uh, we have a, a collective bond from one operator that is over a billion dollars, you know, between you know, multiple mine sites. So they're, they're significant uh, financial instruments. As far as our, our uh, fees that are associated with, uh, with those bonds, you know, that kind of support our division. Uh, we have a kind of a bonded acreage fee of like $12.85, and that's just for supporting the division and the work we do. All right. Uh, on blasting, I know you said there are not any active co-blasting permits. Are, are, are the requirements, though, uh, passed through the federal level, or are they specific to state statutes? Uh, the ones we have now are specific to state statutes, but they, they pretty much mirror the, uh, the federal guidelines. I see. 
and, and if there is a complaint about co-blasting, would the complaint go to the railroad commission? I believe it would. Usually we would uh, we would have uh, our inspection staff uh, on site to monitor the blasting event and do pre-mine and post-mine surveys. Uh, and they would address complaints. You know, we, we get complaints on various topics, uh, usually if it's, you know, you know, maybe a discharge or something that's happening off site, off mine site, or, uh, you know, maybe part of the reclamation process, there may be some, uh, you know, some sinkholes or some depressions that need to be filled that, uh, you know, that maybe a, a landowner may be concerned about. And so our inspections will do a special, a, a special uh, inspection uh, and they'll go out and kind of address those specifically along with their, their typical normal monthly inspections. But if there's a, a blasting event and there's a complaint, then uh, our, our people will be available uh, both before, after, and during the, the blasting event. Dr. Elliott, thank you so much for joining us today. And I, I too noticed that you were with us all day. So uh, I hope, you're, uh, hope you've learned a lot on, uh, on aggregate. <laughs> and its impacts in Texas. Hang around. You might as well stay throughout. Uh, but again, thank you so much for being here. Right, so folks, no oh, ab absolutely. Thank you so much. So folks, uh, that covers how we currently regulate the process of getting resources out of the ground. But once it's out, how do we handle it from there? To answer that, we will have to take a look at what happens after the rocks leave the production sites. Commercial traffic is a dangerous business, and our top priority is keeping Texans safe. The Department of Public Safety, or DPS, has been tasked with overseeing the safety of our roads, and joining us to discuss that today is Major Chris Nordlow. Major Nordlow, Nordlow is the Commercial Vehicle Enforcement Coordinator for DPS. He has 21 years of experience, spent the majority of that time in commercial vehicle enforcement. Thank you for joining us there, Major. And if you would, sir, please go ahead and expand on the DPS mission. Sure, you bet. If you could uh, advance the slide one. I just prepared an overview for you to talk about how we inspect commercial vehicles in the state of Texas. Our basic mission is to make sure uh, you, can, you can read what's there, but the basic thing is that we're there to make sure the roadways are safer. And we do that by weighing and inspecting uh, trucks and enforcing federal regulations and state law. Uh, that's, that's all state laws. So our CVE troopers uh, are responsible not only for inspecting trucks, but they also uh, respond to protests. They uh, respond to the border. Uh, they arrest DWIs, uh, all the other things that troopers do. But they're specialized in these provisions because they're specially trained. You advance one, please. So in the state of Texas, because of the number of roadway miles that we have, because we're the second largest state by population in the United States, uh, we, by nature, are going to have uh, a lot of crashes that involve commercial vehicles. Last year, we had almost 60,000. And as you can see here, 655 of those were fatal. A uh, majority of crashes involving commercial vehicles are the fault of the passenger vehicles and how they drive around them. So while it's uh, it's... Uh, 80,000 pounds if it's fully loaded is a lot of energy to stop and it creates a lot of damage if it does get into a crash. It's important for everybody to understand that the vast majority of all commercial crashes are caused by, by passenger vehicles. Uh, a lot of this has to do with the fact that we have, we have seen, in fact, in the last 20 years, I think there was one year that we actually had a reduction in crashes and that was when we had our uh, recession back in 2007 when uh, the oil field slowed down and we had fewer trucks on the road, fewer cars on the road. Uh, so like right now during COVID, it's a, it's a difficult year. It's not going to be a normal year uh, because the we don't have as many people driving. But, but uh, what causes uh, crashes overall is a robust economy that drives a lot of vehicles out there. Generally speaking, we don't have that many roadway miles additional compared to the number of people who are moving here. Can you advance one, please? So at full staffing, uh, we have 484 CVE troopers, 144 civilian inspectors, and 78 civilian investigators. The inspectors help the troopers, but they work at the inspection facilities, both on the border and at the interior inspection facilities, such as in Seguin, uh, New Waverly, 
and uh, of course the border positions as well. The 78 civilian investigators perform safety audits and and uh, comprehensive investigations on carriers. They're they're the the uh, the back office work of how we keep motor carriers safe. So at at the front end, when the when a we stop a, a truck, we conduct an inspection. That inspection is uploaded into the federal database, and a safety pattern is is determined. If certain events happen, uh, a fatality crash or a really bad safety rating or a carrier complaint that we get. Uh, we can go in and do an investigation at the at the motor carrier, and so their investigators will go and look for uh, pre-trip inspections, look at their maintenance files, make sure that they're doing their drug and alcohol testing for the drivers, etc. So that's what they do. You can advance, please. So we we in. in Chapter 644 of the Transportation Code, the legislature outlines what agencies can conduct inspections on commercial vehicles. And there are basically two types of inspections. There's a weight law in, in Chapter Transportation Code 621. And in, in 621, it talks about who is a weight enforcement officer. And basically, it is a high patrol trooper, a, a sheriff deputy, and certain and, and certain size police departments, uh, and then we have these civilian inspectors. And anybody who's trained in 644 to inspect a commercial vehicle is also a weight enforcement officer. So jumping forward to 644, it defines what agencies, what what are allowed to inspect commercial vehicles, because not all police officers are. And it's important to remember. I heard the judge uh, earlier talking about how a, a truck pulled out in front of a car and a car hit. The truck that uh, when we talk about these things that's a that's a transportation code violation of uh, failing to yield the right of way so that would be illegal whether it was in a car or a truck it just happened to make it more dangerous because the truck is slower to move and uh and uh creates more damage if you hit it not to not to minimize it i just want to make clear that that any peace officer can enforce that law it doesn't you don't have to be able to inspect or weigh a truck to do that kind of type of enforcement so currently we have 71 agencies that are certified. The county and municipal agencies, they're, they're certified to conduct inspections. So a total of almost uh, 250 uh, certified officers. And what they do is they those uh, agencies enter into an MOU with the department. And basically we say, here's, here's how we conduct, we're gonna, we're gonna train you and you have to perform these inspections according to our standard and our standard is also based off of the commercial vehicle safety lines, which harmonizes how trucks are inspected in, across North America. That's to say that if if you have a truck and you're inspected in San Antonio, it's it's basically the same it's basically the same uh, process as if you get stopped in Tulsa, Oklahoma, or in Alberta, Canada. You can advance, please. Sorry. They're mowing today. <laughs> that is, that's quite all right. <laughs> I mean, I've been here all morning, so, you know. <laughs> You're going to get points for that. <laughs> there you go. <clears throat> uh, what we uh, look for when we're, when we're, when we're training is that we, we, we train uh, officers on uh, driver documentation and qualifications, the different types of equipment standards that are out there. We have separate classes for hazardous materials and cargo tanks. And we also uh, have a special class on how to, how to inspect buses because buses have some unique components that have to be inspected. And then the other stuff there is the audit training. We do have a certification requirement uh, for, for in-service training every year to keep everybody up to date on the new regulations and laws. You can advance please. So if we're looking at our overall state appropriation is about $45 million. Uh, most of that is used for enforcement uh, personnel. And we have uh, funding for approximately 269 commission and non-commissioned CV personnel. That's, that is on uh, uh, the, the majority of our funding comes from the state legislature, a, a minority, but a significant amount also comes from a $31 million grant from the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration that we 
administer to assist us with uh, with our commercial vehicle enforcement efforts. So we have a total budget of just about $76 million. You can advance. <clears throat> uh, we were asked about uh, what the cost to train a CV inspector. Well, we have we have training uh, budgeted in our MixApp grant, our Motor Care Safety Administration grant that we use to assist, but the, what the training costs is basically uh, what it costs us to provide the um, the, the documents, the books that we give the, the students, and then what we pay our instructors, the, the cost that it takes to do that. Uh, for a, uh, an officer to come get trained, they don't pay anything. It's just up to their agency to provide their per diem to put them up in a hotel and, and feed them. But uh, the training itself to agencies is, is free. And can you advance one? Uh, Major, I, I believe that was the last chart we have. That'd be good. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you all may have. Oh, Major, thank you. Um, just a just a couple of questions. Uh, what assistance did the state provide last session to assist the uh, commercial motor vehicle team? What assistance did the state provide? Yes, sir. Like the legislature? That is correct. Uh, we uh, commercial vehicle enforcement wasn't specifically addressed other than to uh, add in some local agencies uh, that happens uh, basically every session so we uh, writes it in I believe last session with Williamson County One no ab absolutely absolutely I, I thought we did a little bit more appropriations for y'all too I had to go back and look into that but uh, um, we know that uh, right now it's a significant issue I, I mean uh, at the end of the day, how strained are the CMV resources to cover taxes that you control over? We we have a lot. There are a lot of things that challenge us when we do you know, commercial vehicle enforcement. Uh, one thing is that we don't have enough troopers to patrol the streets of Houston, San Antonio, Austin. We don't have enough troops to do that and conduct commercial vehicle enforcement, which is why it's beneficial for those 250 officers of 71 agencies out there like Houston PD, Dallas PD, San Antonio, Bear County. It's, a, it's, a, it's important for them to have their own commercial vehicle enforcement units so they can control that locally and they can address things that they see day to day, week to week. Um, conversely, we also have some very rural areas and, and, and changes over time. So it was uh, the Eagle for Chale was fairly unheard of in, until 2008 or so. And that's when it came onto our radar. But it's also uh, south of Tilden and it's in a very rural area. Uh, it's very difficult to have troopers who move there. So we have to work it in task force. So we have to budget for uh, overtime projects and travel to take troopers and enforcement officers to those areas to conduct them enforcement. There's just some areas that are so rural that uh, we have to actually give a trooper a stipend because there's not adequate housing uh, or the schools aren't adequate or there's no uh, employment for a trooper's wife or husband in those areas. So that, that becomes challenging. That's, uh, that's also part of the reason why it's, it's good to, uh, uh, if they meet the trained standard, allow other departments like sheriff's departments or, or constables or so forth to be able to support uh, y'all's mission set. Would you agree? Well, again, I have to go back and say what I said about that vehicle that pulled out. You know, failed use right away is a transportation code that can be forced by any officer. Uh, that didn't have anything to do with a, a brake measurement or a load securement issue, for instance. So it's important for us to, 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 to make sure that the, the carriers have a level playing field. It's often what I say is that we're, we're, we're there to make sure that the level of the playing field. So if the legislature says, for instance, that you can haul this product down this road if you buy this permit, and people are bidding on a, a construction job, for instance, we're call, talking about aggregate here. And uh, one carrier says yes, and they bid, their, their bid includes buying permits for all of their vehicles. And so their bid comes in higher than somebody who says, I'm not gonna buy the permit. I'm gonna chance it and maybe pay my weight ticket if I get caught. Uh, that's what we that's one of the things that we do to help to help industry to help the community is to level that playing field uh the 
it, it is important, like I said, for, for some of those, for those uh, local agencies to have that control. But a lot of our problem is actually moving violations. That's the majority of it. Uh, our, our, it's a driver behavior that drives uh, most of our crashes. And fewer than 2% of our crashes are actually caused by equipment violations. You know, about 98% are driver violations, uh, distracted driving, aggressive driving, uh, impaired driving, fatigued driving. Those are all things that cause crashes, the majority of crashes, whether it's a commercial vehicle or a passenger vehicle. And uh, fully about 76% of all crashes involving commercial vehicles are the fault of the passenger vehicle. And then there's about a 12%, uh, 12, 12 to 20% in the, there where both the commercial driver and the passenger vehicle are at fault. And then there's a smaller piece at the end where the commercial driver is at fault. The uh, commercial drivers, yeah, there, there are some bad actors out there, sure, but uh, most carriers, uh, it's, it's too expensive for them to not have on their insurance rates uh, to, to not have a good safety rating. So it's in their interest to make sure that their drivers are safe. And that's why they, for the most part, not all, have, uh, they meet the regulations. They, they do drug and alcohol testing prior to hiring a driver. They have a driver qualification period. They have training standards that they have to meet. The drivers have to have a medical card. The driver license is a higher grade than, than the average driver. And so for the most part, your truck driver is a professional driver and industry has changed quite a bit over the years. I mean, it was different in the 70s than it was in the 80s, and certainly different than it is in 2020. And uh, you know, I think probably everybody has a really good appreciation for uh, commercial drivers uh, going through COVID and seeing those empty shelves, knowing that everything that you wanted, or whether it's cleaners or toilet paper or milk, came there on a truck. So those very, very important for us to, to, to make sure that industry is safe. And uh, I work hand in hand with the Texas Trucking Association and TACA, you mentioned TACA, uh, the propane haulers, I mean, all of them, all the associations that I work with, and those associations uh, across the board want safe trucks. Yeah, I appreciate it. And uh, I'll tell you what, I, it was very interesting to see all the pictures of some of the violations that these trucks have, um, inner tires missing. Uh, you mentioned the over exceeding the weight and so forth like that, but we also understand that uh, because uh, so few officers on uh, commercial motor vehicle from the DPS, there would be uh, times where we would hold a driver a couple hours uh, waiting for an officer. So, you know, in particular areas, especially when you have interstates or high uh, commercial vehicle traffic, uh, y'all gaining that additional support. And obviously uh, some legislation was passed for Williamson County, uh, which is the number one county for surface mining in the state of Texas, Burns uh, close second. But uh, it's very amazing to see some of those photos. You know, one interesting uh, point here just for our viewers is, uh, you know, I know there's a lot of aggravation in terms of the trucks and the spillage on the roads or just things that debris that falls, so forth and so forth. I, I, I want to note that, you know, uh, these aggregate uh, companies and uh, mining, it, they don't, the vast majority do not own trucks. Uh, those are actual independent commercial drivers and so forth uh, that uh, own those trucks. And um, of course, we, we do have the numbers that, that you know, for a, a a small facility that does rut crushing that could be up to 200 trucks entering a day that means they also exit but um, with that weight mass weight on those roads uh, what's been your observations um, uh, in those areas where heavy trucks uh, go because that's where the mines may be or whatever that a deterioration of the road is the cause of uh, the accident and so forth We've, we've had some incidents like that. We had uh, uh, one in particular, just anecdotal. We had three or four oil field trucks going down the road at, uh, down uh, near Three Rivers on a two lane foreign market road. And people, again, again, driver behavior is what causes most of these crashes. So we get three or four uh, 18 wheelers in the oil field and people get stacked up behind them. They start to get impatient. and we had a guy uh, pass in a no passing zone and uh, gets up to about 100 miles an hour passing the trucks and hits a pothole that's there because 
so many heavy trucks are going down the road, loses control, and he, he flips it and crashed and killed himself. But again, driver behavior, but yes, the, the pothole was there. Damage to the roadways, you know, I heard it earlier today, I think it was uh, the, the commissioner from Williamson County maybe mentioned it. Uh, absolute truth that we've seen in the oil field sector, which we're talking about here with quarries and aggregate haulers, is just the, a sheer number of roads. You might have a, a, a foreign market road that was you know, built in the 1950s with a, with a four inch base. It was never meant to handle an 18 wheeler, much less you know, 2000 of them a day. And so they start to tear up uh, the, uh, the the shoulders of the road, and and then we then we see you know we see it out in two fifty six out there outside of Pecos there uh, the oil field is um, really taken over that whole area. And Texas done a good job of trying to uh, and, and and the legislature too in uh, trying to give Texas funding to armor those roads, and and then to to build them uh, in a design where they may have a, a space in the middle instead of having a, a you know, a, a one foot or whatever it is, a center lane, you might have a, a divider that's four feet wide just to keep those cars and trucks from going to passing each other too closely. And that's a good design. The other thing I, I would add is that when we when we have these issues where we, we're gonna see and we expect uh, continuously uh, long-term large truck operations, when we design those roads, we should be designing with the idea that to having a pull-off area every once in a while on both sides of the road so that enforcement has the ability to stop and inspect the commercial vehicle or even just to write a speeding ticket if they have to. There are a lot of places out there on 256 where there's no room even for the officer to uh, to stop, even if he wants to stop in a, in a, in a truck or car for that matter. That is a great point. Uh, you probably saw me uh, writing down your points there. I, Major Norlow, th thank you so much uh, for, for joining us today. And, and just from a personal note, I, I just greatly appreciate uh, you and the Department of Public Safety and all of our law enforcement officers out there. I know it's been uh, been rough uh, last couple of months, but your prof your professionalism uh, uh, stands out. And, and so thank you again for your service uh, to our citizens, our state, and our nation. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next, we will hear from the Texas Department of Transportation, or TxDOT. TxDOT is responsible for the planning, maintenance, and construction of our state roadways. They are here today to look at the impact of commercial vehicles on roadway traffic patterns, the potential damage to roads, and what goes into planning and mitigating hazards from industrial traffic. Representing the district or tech, uh, tech stop today is our is our chief engineer Michael Lee. Thank you for joining us, sir. If you would tell us more about Tech Stott's mission and process, Colonel Wilson, can you hear me? Loud and clear, sir. Thank you, sir. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, uh, present uh, Tech Stott's role and in in, uh, in 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 the aggregate production uh, or organizations. Uh, you, I have a few slides, and uh, I think uh, uh, we've got the title slide there. I think it's what you're seeing. So if we can go to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about TxDOT's mission. And, and TxDOT's mission is connecting you with, with Texas. And uh, one of the biggest challenges we have is uh, fatalities on our, on our roadway. Uh, hashtag in the street TX is a, a, a sign that's a, a, a social media uh hashtag that we've, we've been trying to promote for several years. And the streak, uh, if you don't know about the streak, the streak started uh, the last time we had a day in Texas where we didn't have a, a fatal crash uh, was in uh, to November 7th of 2000. And to put perspective into that, the, the trivia around that date is that is the uh, election day uh, when uh, then Governor George Bush uh, became president. So it's been a long time, and uh, as you'll see uh, in our uh, in our uh, slide there, that uh, this is just updated the other day. That since since that day, we've had over seventy thousand uh, people die on our roadways, and this this includes bicyclists, pedestrians, uh, uh, automobile crashes on and off system. Uh, the major Norlow just just spoke to it that that the, one of the biggest. Uh, things we need is for uh, people to uh, take ownership 
and do the right thing. And sometimes that's just being patient for that truck uh, when, when they're they're behind it. And uh, but uh, uh, use the seat belts and, and pay attention while they're driving. Get off their cell phones. Quit texting. Uh, and then drive to conditions. One of the uh, most uh, fundamental statistics that just baffles most everyone when we when we when we talk about this is that uh, when you when you look at all of the fatal, fatal crashes and we have we average ten a day uh, right now we're trending this year at nine point six per day uh, but but on average over the last several years we average ten fatalities a day and when you take out uh, the fatalities for uh, of, of people that uh, died, you know, didn't have an opportunity to use a seatbelt, like pedestrians and bicyclists and motorcyclists, those that just didn't have that opportunity. Uh, the remaining uh, uh, fatalities, uh, some 42% of them uh, were unrestrained. And, and that's really amazing when you look at the fact that uh, all of our surveys show, at least during the daytime, that's when we do the uh, surveys is that 92% of all Texans are, are wearing a seatbelt. And so they're, they're certainly a, a, a the, the, the failure to buckle up is, is a huge cost to, to the families of this state. Go to the next slide, please. Connecting you with Texas is our, is our mission statement. Uh, in, in doing that, we, we promote safety. We, uh, in, inside of TxDOT, we champion a, a culture of safety. And, and we're constantly looking at ways to reduce crashes and fatalities uh, by improving guidelines, uh, making targeted awareness campaigns and, and educational campaigns. Uh, Safety is a core component of our goals and objectives, uh, and it's part of every project that TxDOT does. Uh, to, mo to promote public safety uh, and to fa facilitate movement of traffic, uh, we, 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 you know, we, we work on uh, new modern modernizing our standards and we uh, you know do use uh, good engineering and safety studies to uh, as we lay out and design our, our roadways and, and plan for access and we plan for future highways and traffic next slide please to carry out our charges and goals we have programs in traffic management engineering and traffic safety and when I say programs literally we have software that helps us uh, analyze uh, all the different elements of a roadway. And then we also have engineering judgment that we use. Uh, we continually uh, use crash data to improve our, our roadways and, and, in, in, in the designs. And we work to uh, uh, imp implement engineering solutions everywhere we can. Uh, but it, it, at the end of the day, uh, those engineering solutions won't solve all of our issues. Next slide, please. TxDOT takes a multifaceted approach to transportation planning, and uh, we, 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 but we recognize the uniqueness of every project. And in that, we, we work with local uh, leaders and, and governments and uh, to develop our models. Uh, we work with uh, roadway designs and with commercial vehicles in mind. We, we do this uh, uh, when we when we plan a project. Uh, we we look at uh, our projections for traffic for 30 years in advance, and so we'll have current traffic and future traffic. And the future traffic, if the project is designed to last that long, uh, is tried. It, we, we attempt to accommodate that future traffic. Next slide. So factors we consider when uh, when TxDOT plans for future road projects, uh, we uh, you know we, again we we model for future growth. We we work with uh, uh, every one of a uh, lot of lot of different programming models uh, that that talk about uh, uh, that we we use to once we determine the truck counts and the turning movements and all uh, try to determine the length and, and need of uh, speed lane changes. Uh, acceleration or deceleration lanes, those type of things. We can do uh, uh, in, the, in the process uh, of design a roadway, uh, many times, we'll, of course, every, every project have an engineering study, but many times 
we'll have a traffic impact analysis on different elements of that project. And, uh, you know, the, there, there's a couple of QR codes that you can, uh, anybody can take a picture of and they'll take you right to our, uh, both our roadway design manual and our access management manuals. If you would go to the next slide. So, so our numbers are probably going to be a little bit different than what uh, Major Nordlo uh, just showed. Uh, uh, they're, they're, and, and sometimes, we'll, so just for everybody's clarification, we, Major Norlow and I would be pulling data from the exact same database. Uh, sometimes uh, it's the way you search the database, the numbers differ a little bit. But we talk about commercial vehicles and essentially the, the big number is commercial vehicles are involved in about 7% of our crashes statewide, uh, but they're also involved in about 16% of our fatal crashes. Now, uh, not, not fatalities, but fatal crashes. As, as you know, many, many crashes will have multiple fatalities. And then they're also involved in about 9% of serious injury crashes. What's important here is the fact that, that uh, uh, Colonel Ewan and Major Norlo were discussing, you know, the impacts of, of the size of the truck and the weight and that they are overrepresented uh, just by the number of crashes uh, for the number of fatalities. It's, it's not linear, it's, it's, a, it's a, there's a multiple flyer there and that, that comes from the weight and the size of the truck involved. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, so we'll talk about the impacts of motor vehicle travel on roadways. I mentioned earlier that uh, we designed for a 20 to 30 year pavement life and we try to look at that 30 year uh, traffic projections when we design the roadway. Uh, the roadway's pavement design is uh, uh, includes several factors. When we, when we build a project, we look at the total life cycle cost uh, and, and there are factors that, that are added in for the temperatures that it'll see, the, uh, how much rain, the type of soils, the underlying uh, bases and those things, subsoils, and then uh, traffic volume and type. Uh, biggest, biggest consideration for commercial trucks is the uh, uh, the loading, uh, they, they, uh, commercial vehicles loaded commercial vehicles account for almost all of our, our traffic induced pavement wear. And, uh, just, I um, mean, it's just a, a reality of, of the weights that are put on the, uh, most of our, our pavements are designed as flexible structures and the, the weights just, uh, uh, flex that more than, than an automobile does. Next slide, please. Oversized and overweight vehicles, uh, these are really referred to as vehicles that are exceed the legal uh, sizes and weights. To, and and what, we, what we say are legal or, you know, this 80,000 pound 18 uh, wheeler that most people are accustomed to. Anything, anything larger uh, than normal size or heavier requires a special permit. Uh, those permits are established in, uh, in, in the Texas uh, code. Uh, they're legislatively decided, and, and DMV is the is the administrator of those. So there's been some some talk. You know, some some people get the misconception that TxDOT has those permits. We don't. That's that's DMV, and they uh, they send the money out according to uh, the requirements of the of the law that established those uh, permits. Uh, and you can see the numbers there in 2019 uh, to the to the Highway fund from the special permits of all the special permits in Texas, there was 137 million dollars uh, put into the deposit into the state highway fund. Next slide, please. The safety of the traveling well, public is, uh, yeah, uh, you know, that's that's critical to Texas mission and uh, effective movement and oversized overweight vehicles. That's also part of that. Uh, mission and, and, and it's part of what drives the state economy. Uh, so TxDOT works to uh, uh, provide a safe and efficient routing data uh, to uh, DMV. We, that's our role in this permitting process. And, and we, we provide that information to DMV and they, they issue the permits. And then as, as we just heard uh, through, through Major Norlo, uh, DPS is the enforcing agency of these these permits. Next slide, please. 
This just gives you a rundown uh, on kind of what we talk about when we talk about that 80,000 pound load that, that, that travels without a permit. And then uh, the fact that there are 30 different oversized overweight permits allowed uh, by state law. Uh, there are other ex exceptions and legal variances. And, uh, one, of the, one of the things that comes up every time a oversized overweight permit comes into the legislature is is what's that going to do to our pavements? And so TxDOT has a way uh, to calculate the consumption of our bridges and weights uh, fr from the oversized overweight uh, above and beyond the 80,000 pounds, uh, how, it cons how that additional weight consumes our pavements and our bridges. And we provide that information to the legislature and then, then they make their determination on fees and all associated with that permit. Just, uh, Kind of an overview of funding for roads. Uh, it's you know generally a state, local, and private sector partnership. Uh, you can't probably see this chart, but essentially most most roadway projects uh, include a, uh, a federal match. Uh, it's typically 80, 20. Uh, there are some that are 90, 10, and, and there are some projects that are 100% federal. Uh, but that's just kind of an overview. Funding for uh, our projects, uh, you know, it's uh, we we can accept uh, money, and this this this, this slide's really kind of just talking about the acceleration deceleration lanes that have been discussed with uh, some of the permitting processes uh, for driveway access. But uh, we can ex accept a uh, donation for that, and many times during the permitting process, uh, we'll require as part of that that permit for it. Uh, and it's not just uh, aggregate production, it's it's any uh, commercial enterprise that's going to generate significant uh, traffic, whether it uh, uh, is a uh, truck traffic or if it's uh, just automobile traffic. Uh, if, if it's going to create, change the traffic patterns, then we'll work with them on uh, the acceleration, deceleration lanes and uh, work on getting that through a donation agreement from the entity. It also includes uh, traffic signals as well at times. Uh, one key thing is if the uh, if we issue a driveway for uh, one type of uh, uh, entity or business use, and that business use changes or or the assumptions that were made with that uh, driveway permit change, then uh, we can always go back and uh, renegotiate that permit with them and, and require. A, uh, engineering study or traffic impact analysis. That's really all I have, uh, Colonel. If uh, you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. Mr. Lee, thank you, sir. Uh, I do have a couple of questions, and I know we're significantly running out of time. Thank you for bearing with us today. Uh, when doing traffic impact analysis, uh, what what is taken into consideration as to the types and number of vehicles coming in and out? So, so just that, all types of, of vehicles, the number of trips, the uh, lengths of those. If, if you're doing a full traffic impact analysis, uh, it, it'll also include the surrounding, you know, uh, uh, businesses or just the, the other traffic in yeah. the area as well. No, that's very good. If a quarry were to have a big uptick in business as they have and double their unexpected, uh, say, uh, truck output, uh, what, if anything, could TxDOT do to change their driveway requirements? So if we, if we see a safety issue with a particular driveway and or uh, but due to additional trucks, then we can always go back to them and work on uh, uh, working with them on getting those uh, acceleration, deceleration lanes. And sometimes uh, the solution is a stoplight. You know, you, you'll see a lot of uh, uh, commercial Places like a Walmart or something will, will yes, sir. donate a stoplight. Sure. So is it just asking or do y'all enforce it? No, no, we, we, we can enforce it. it. It's difficult for us to go in and remove access. Uh, but right. No, because the Constitution uh, doesn't allow us to landlock them. And, but, but yeah, that, I, I, I know of very few situations where uh, a landowner wouldn't work with us when we came to them, and, mm -hmm. and uh, because one one thing 
they they don't want the liability associated with being sure. told that they have an unsafe driveway. Absolutely. Could you describe a scenario where TxDOT would consider it okay for an APO to not need, say, uh, acceleration, deceleration lanes on a state highway? So, so again, I, I will I, I will try to do it in broader terms than an APO because uh, our processes that we establish for driveway permitting are uh, they're the same processes we would use in uh, in the rural parts of the state that maybe logging or or timber is the big industry in that part of the state. And, and no, they have I, I, I do appreciate that, but it's our aggregate trucks or overweight mm-hmm. trucks in most cases. So it's really, I'm focusing in on overweight trucks in this particular sure. scenario. Sure. Well, our, 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 what, what we would, uh, uh, what we would uh, certainly consider there is uh, the number of trucks and uh, what, how many trips they're going to make. And uh, uh, if, if there's a situation where, uh, you know, if it's a small producer and it's on a very rural roadway with very little traffic, uh, then then you might not need that acceleration deceleration. It, it really is driven by uh, the other traffic and the number of trips in and out. Uh, I'm not hearing you. There we go. Yeah, I, so occasionally I forget to hit the mute button. Or unmute. Um, if TxDOT mission is to quote unquote in the streak, um, no. would it further that mission to tighten down on commercial trucks making dead stop ninety degree turns on two state highways? So certainly there there's that chance, right? Uh, there there's there's opportunities when when we have. Uh, trucks turning in and out that off of a two lane roadway that we have rear end situations. Uh, uh, but yeah, uh, so, you know, any, anything we can do to prevent that. And as major Norlo said that that's kind of already a traffic violation. It is nonetheless, but it's about the traffic count, right? Like the frustration of it the is. trucker sitting there for 30 minutes waiting to get out with, you know, 30 other trucks right behind him trying to get to a site onto a busy highway. You know, we only give y'all a finite amount of dollars, so obviously y'all can't do everything. But certainly if, you know, we probably should look at it from a state perspective on public safety, if we're actually trying to, um, you know, beat that streak of possibly providing additional guidance in that regard. So you guys are doing a great job. and, and if I can, yeah, if, please. If I can add that, you know, two years ago, uh, our commission set aside six hundred million dollars uh, uh, out of their uh, out of their unified transportation program to address safety, specifically for safety projects. We call it road to zero funds. They adopted a goal of hitting road to zero by the year twenty fifty, uh, and in that. Uh, you know, a huge percentage of those funds are going toward improving intersections, which is kind of what you're talking about. The, the, we, we, we would t- treat a major driveway that you described, that, that'd be kind of like an intersection. So those, those type of projects are ongoing across the state right now. And, uh, and we'll, we'll hopefully we'll see more of them. Well, very good. When tech stock collects overweight permit fees for a trip that includes, uh, say, a county road, about what percentage of the damage calls to the county road would be covered by those fees received by the county and just round it up what is it zero 25 so, 50 75 100 percent so so uh representative i i wish i could answer that but but it's so number one text dot doesn't collect the fees dmv does they're, they're the ones that issue the permits and so we don't really even have the we don't even have the data uh that's a great point sir thank you um we've certainly I collected that question and answer and understanding to go towards DMV because frankly, you know, our, our local governments are suffering in terms of the uh, maintenance costs and so forth. Well, sir, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, we really appreciate your input and, and we look forward to uh, working with you outside this town hall for our interim report. So good day, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Staying on the topic of uh, transportation, um, we're going to now hear from Texas A&M's 
Transportation Institute, also known as TTI. TTI is a transportation research organization that focuses on all facets of transportation, such as engineering, planning, economics, and safety. Their research is highly regarded and is being used at both the state and the national level. Joining us from Aggieland is Dr. David Newcomb. Uh, Dr. Newcomb is, leads the Material and, and Payment Division at TTI. Thank you, sir, for joining us. If you would, uh, could you please tell more about TTI's research on this topic? Thank you, Representative Wilson. TTI is um, a, I would call it a turnkey research organization when it comes to transportation. We have uh, people that are involved in the engineering side of things, uh, such as the division that I lead. Uh, we also have folks that uh, are involved in policy and finance um, and uh, planning. So um, it, the TTI has a very broad base of, of, uh, of operations and uh, we have um, offices in all of the uh, uh, metropolitan areas in the state as well. Um, so it's well versed to handle um, a, a number of topics. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about the impacts of, of large trucks on pavements. And um, that's going to be the focus of my talk if, uh, if other facets of transportation, uh, if, if questions arise about those, I can certainly refer them to the appropriate people within TTI. Uh, if I could have the next slide, please. So um, very briefly, pavement design uh, is uh, a fairly uh, pedestrian type of topic. And I know from my experience with my own family, uh, there's only so much that the average lay person can stand in one sitting. So I'll try to be brief. Um, the um, approach to pavement design involves looking at the traffic because that's essentially what you're designing the pavement for, both the volume, uh, the number of vehicles, as well as the types of vehicles, whether they're uh, primarily commercial trucks or primarily uh, passenger vehicles. Uh, looking at uh, the soil and uh, its strength, as well as its reaction to water, in Texas, we are particularly blessed to have uh, clays that are uh, very nasty actors when it comes to uh, what happens when uh, they get wet, they typically swell, and when they dry, they shrink, um, both uh, causing uh, uh, problems with the pavement surface if they're not treated properly. Uh, climate, uh, we just do things differently. And, yes, sir? Um, Representative Wilson, are you trying to? Okay. Um, no, I just think uh, that that was interesting. I did not even touch that mute button, so uh, not sure what's happening. But please go ahead, sir. Sorry for the distraction. No problem. Um, climate. Uh, we do things differently in Lubbock than we do in Houston, uh, as far as available materials goes. That plays into the life cycle costs that Mr. Lee was just talking about and uh, our choice of materials uh, with respect to the base, the intermediate layers and the surface. Uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that pavements can be designed to withstand anticipated conditions and um, they can be designed to last decades as Mr. Lee alluded to uh, 20, 30 years, sometimes uh, 40 and 50 years, depending upon uh, the type of, of roadway that we're talking about. It is difficult to plan for changes that uh, occur in land use and population. And that is normally where our, our problems occur with respect to early pavement failures. Next slide, please. So typical farm to market roads in the state, uh, they're intended for low traffic volume. Uh, as um, I think uh, Major Nordlow said earlier, um, many of them were designed back in the 50s. Uh, they were intended to handle a couple of cattle trucks per week and uh, the typical farm and ranch traffic. Uh, they are comprised of limestone or cement stabilized base materials that are covered by a thin um, either asphalt surface or seal coat. Uh, typical state highways um, see higher traffic and so 
uh, they are, they tend to be thicker. Probably uh, the thickness of the asphalt surface would be somewhere between four and eight inches thick uh, over some sort of uh, a base course. Typical interstate highways have a much higher traffic volume, and so they are designed uh, to withstand um, uh, the uh, the truckloads that we know uh, are going to be on that roadway. Um, and so they'll typically have a relatively thick asphalt base covered by uh, a, uh, a thick asphalt surface or, or a uh, thicker concrete surface. Next slide, please. Um, so when we look at, at uh, the impacts of, uh, of um, of traffic, uh, we can look at the experience that we've had with the energy sector and uh, maybe draw from that a little bit. Now, I don't want to confuse the energy sector with aggregate production. Uh, each of those dots that you see on these maps here represent one well. And that well uh, took hundreds, if not thousands of truck trips to fully develop and, and produce. Uh, at least initially, and um, uh, with the advent of pipelines, uh, some of that truck traffic has, has kind of eased off in production, but there's still a lot of truck traffic in uh, the energy producing areas, particularly in the Eagleford and uh, in the Permian Basin. Next slide, please. So this is uh, what the increase in truck traffic looked like for FM99 down in South Texas. You can see that uh, uh, the uh, increase in traffic between 2010 and 2012, um, at least 50% of that was uh, in uh, the form of, of uh, commercial vehicles or commercial trucks. Next slide, please. And here the same is, is true for State Highway 72 in, uh, near Kennedy. Um, it uh, again, there's a very high increase in truck traffic. Um, I was raised in uh, Uvalde, Texas, and I remember uh, driving these roads um, when I was a teenager and back in the 60s and 70s. And you could go for hours without seeing another vehicle. But now, uh, we, we uh, since the development down there, uh, these uh, traffic volumes have increased significantly. Next slide. And so let's talk about the damage that's done um, in passenger vehicles versus commercial um, vehicles. And if we just look at one wheel of a passenger vehicle, um, it tends to not have a lot of, of impact um, at a thousand pounds. But if we were to take one uh, fully loaded uh, a wheel of an 18 wheeler, um, then we're talking about something that's around 4,500 pounds and the damage that's caused by that one wheel of the 18 wheeler uh, goes up to about uh, 400 times that of the passenger vehicle. Now, uh, the problem with this comparison is we're talking one wheel to one wheel uh, 18 wheelers obviously have a lot more wheels than the passenger vehicle. And so going to the next slide, we can see that uh, one 18 wheeler uh, produces the same damage as about 9,600 passenger vehicles. Now this is a figure that comes out of the GAO. Um, and the point here is not the 9,600 passenger cars uh, precisely, but the fact that one 18 wheeler does the damage of thousands of passenger vehicles, whether that's 4,000 or 10,000. Uh, the, the idea is the same, that um, weight um, causes an exponential increase in damage. Next. And so uh, it's seen in these photos from uh, the, the Eagleford, uh, when uh, the uh, shale plays started being developed uh, in, uh, in full, uh, you can see that there was a huge increase in truck traffic uh, in these areas. Next, please. The resulting damage uh, is illustrated in, in these three photos here where you can see 
in the upper left-hand corner, the beginnings of a uh, rather large pothole. Um, in uh, the right-hand uh, upper photo, you see damage that um, basically uh, is, is kind of being patched together just to keep the, the pavement in surface in service as uh, the, the trucks were damaging it. And in the bottom, uh, you see what typically happens with edge failures on these low volume roads where uh, essentially the, uh, the, the material is softer off to the edge. Uh, that's where probably most of the moisture is in the, in, the, uh, in the soil. And you can see how the damage is progressing from the outside uh, into the center of the roadway. Next. So just to kind of summarize what I've been saying about pavements, they can be designed if you've got the proper traffic predictions and uh, you have uh, the, uh, and if you have the, the knowledge ahead of time in terms of where um, the, uh, particular event is going to be, or the, the resource is going to be developed. Uh, and so changes in land use and economy, while they typically occur, if they occur without, uh, you know, without uh, a, a sufficient amount of notice, uh, then you get a, a shortened uh, life in your infrastructure. And Events like mining development do result in increased truck traffic and trucks are more damaging to pavements than maybe the passenger cars that the pavement was ultimately designed for. Um, and so there should be some sort of a process for the evaluation, evaluation of roadway safety and pavement conditions ahead of the, the development if we're going to uh, preserve the, the uh, infrastructure. And with that, sir, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Newcomb. I, I uh, do have a couple of questions for you. Um, what is the cost difference between planning for a new road to handle commercial traffic compared to the cost of upgrading an existing road? On well, average. Uh, and so I, I don't have really an average value for you, but I can tell you that uh, the development of a new roadway or, or, you know, a new alignment is a very expensive process uh, simply because of all the preparation work that has to go into it. If you were to take an existing road and upgrade it, it um, the cost would be uh, considerably cheaper because the right of way is already there. Um, the... Um, uh, and if you know, again, ahead of time, what, uh, uh, what traffic to expect, you can then go in and use the existing roadway and the materials that are in it to uh, basically provide the base on, uh, for uh, the, the added structure that's needed on top of it. I certainly appreciated your chart showing energy. Uh... That was 2010. I could only imagine what it was uh, just a year ago or two years ago. Uh, I, I would love to see uh, the same chart uh, in terms of our surface mining collectively, not just aggregate. And, and would that would I, probably be pretty informative. Well, and so, yeah, that was one of my late thoughts. And so it didn't make it into the slide oh, deck, unfortunately. No, 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 but, no, not, not at all. wasn't expected, but it, it did give me an idea. But if, if, if you look at a, a map of aggregate sources within Texas or you know, that are used in Texas that uh, also include Oklahoma and Arizona or uh, Arkansas rather um, in New Mexico. But if you look at just aggregate sources within Texas, you know, it doesn't look like the energy development map. It, it, the, the, the dots are a lot more sparse, but they do tend to be occurring along the Balcones Fault, which, you know, is, is the subject of, of this discussion. And so, um, you know, I, I, think, um, it's, I think it's a pretty clear clue that, you know, uh, maybe uh, there should be some special studies for those. No, I absolutely. Matter of fact, I, 
I think uh, that's one of the things that we had looked at last session uh, to continue the, the work that uh, you and, and um, the University of Texas are doing in terms of, of the roads and so forth, but uh, tremendous work. Reference your slide um, on the different types of roadways and how they differ in construction. Um, what is the cost difference between those types per foot or per mile? Well, normally, if you're talking about uh, farm to market road, for instance, and um, uh, although uh, you know some of them have, were, were built without shoulders, and um, they, like I said, have relatively thin surfaces compared to uh, the other uh, types of roadways, um, you might be talking about a cost differential of. Um, of 50% or greater, um, again, just depending upon what kind of conditions that you're confronted with in, in terms of, of the design. Uh, if you have a rather competent uh, uh, soil, and this is true out in West Texas, oftentimes you can have interstate highways that are surfaced with chip seals uh, simply because the soil out there is rock. Uh, whereas if you're talking about the Eagleford, the, um, the soils down there tend to be uh, more clay and um, they're very susceptible to uh, losing strength in, in, uh, in wet weather. Very good. Is there a dollar amount that can be used to measure the amount of damage a heavy commercial vehicle does to a roadway per mile? I'm sure there is, but um, that's not typically a, a number that's, you know, calculated. Um, has the, um, has, has, is, uh, you know, is, it is a fact that uh, heavy commercial vehicles are more damaging than passenger cars. Um, you know, many times more damaging. If uh, you were to uh, try to, um, I, I don't know, it, 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 to me, it just seems that uh, uh, it would be a, a, a huge burden on chipping to, to, uh, to try to make a proportionate um, Sure, sure. I, I understand that. Just, just uh, you know, just say, for example, we, we know that the aggregate trucks are, are well overweight. But we know that the permits uh, for overweight is, I think it's, uh, team isn't it correct, uh, below 80,000 pounds? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 80,000 below is just typical. Okay. So let's just say an 80,000 pound truck. Uh, what, what sort of pavement consumption costs are we looking at per mile? Well, fortunately, there aren't that many 80,000 pound trucks. <laughs> Um, and, uh, I, I think, uh, if all you had were 80,000 pound trucks, then, um, if the, the pavement wasn't designed for them, um, you would find that, uh, damage would, would, uh, very quickly appear. Um, I, I would, I will tell you that in the Eagleford, uh, we do have some experience with this. If you go out or when we went out and monitored uh, traffic weights, we did find a significant portion of the trucks to be overweight, uh, somewhere on the order of about 10%. And um, so, you know, those, those vehicles would uh, do a lot more damage. All right, sir. Well, Dr. Nick, I really appreciate you hanging in there uh, today and supporting us. Um, and, and, you know, I, I do uh, enjoy reviewing y'all's studies. Uh, it's been very enlightening. And I really appreciate the work that TTI is doing out there for us. So, sir, thank you again for joining us. And, um, and, and with that, uh, um, we're going to wrap up our day with our state demographer. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Really appreciate you. Um, wrapping up today, I would like to introduce our state demographer, Dr. Lloyd Potter. Uh, Dr. Potter was appointed uh, as a state demographer in 
2010. Additionally, he also serves as the director for the Texas Demographic Center located at uh, University of Texas at San Antonio. Uh, the center functions as a focal point for the uh, production, interpretation, and distribution of demographic information for Texas. Uh, Dr. Potter is here today to talk about the growth that Texas is experiencing, uh, where it is being felt the most, and what impacts it can have on our state moving forward. Thank you for joining us, sir. If you, if you could please explain why my commute to Austin keeps getting longer and longer, I would greatly appreciate it. Well, I think by the time I'm done, we'll probably have some pretty good sense of that. Um, <laughs> So, Chairman Wilson, thank you for having me. And I, I've, um, you know, oftentimes when I get the opportunity to testify, I'm not the first one. And I think, oh, I'm going to just be sitting there all day. But I've just found it actually quite interesting. Plus, I've gotten pretty good at multitasking and have uh, graded all of my assignments for this week. So I'm teaching a class right now. So oh, that sounds um, fun. <laughs> well, it's been productive, and certainly I've uh, listened. I've enjoyed listening to. Well, it's a it's a other. big issue, and and yeah. you know I, I'll tell you for that for our viewers out there, you would not believe how much this gentleman has to come and testify <laughs> during session. Yeah. Uh, you uh, must go from one committee room to the next. Uh, yeah, but if if we didn't have people, we wouldn't have problems, I guess. So no, um, no. It's kind of I like to say I like to say opportunities because yeah, folks out there are awesome. Especially Especially true Texans. Well, but it does, I mean, what it does, and I'll talk about it, so maybe we'll move, and I'm going to try to move along quickly. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Most people have been here. So if we go to the uh, next um, slide. Um, so here's just showing you population change for the most recent estimates that we have, 2019, that we're at about 29 million. Uh, we're over that now because we're in 2020, and certainly the census is in the field uh, right now, uh, probably will be at least until... October 5th, and we'll see if it goes on beyond that. But you can see that Texas, if you look to the second to the last column there, added more people than any other state so far this decade. And we're going faster than all but maybe one or two states in terms of percent change. Next slide. Here's just showing you the breakout of how we're changing. Um, so we add a, a little bit more than 1,000 Texans every day a little less than half of those between 2018 and 19 were children. That's natural increase, more births than deaths. Uh, and then the other slightly more than half is from people moving here. Um, in this last year, a little more than a third of our population growth was from domestic migration. That's people moving from other uh, states into Texas. And then the other proportion, about 18%, is from international migration. Um, and that's increasingly migration from uh, Asian countries and less and less uh, immigration from uh, Mexico and South and Central American countries. Next slide. And this is just showing you the same information over the decade, except we're looking at column charts instead of a pie chart. And I don't have percentages here, but you can see that 2015 was our the, this decade, the year where we had the most growth. And again, the percentages vary in terms of domestic versus international migration. Um, you know, there were a few years, 2017 um, and uh, 2018, where we had more international migration than we had domestic migration. Uh, and let me just pause here for a second, and I'll be talking a little bit about population change around the state. But when we have population growth that occurs as a function of migration, that's what puts strain on our infrastructure. So when you have growth that's occurring from, uh, especially from domestic migration, uh, essentially that means that you have a new household here. So you have an, an, um, two or three people, maybe four or five that have moved in that family needs a new housing unit and they're gonna put probably two or three cars on the road. Um, they're also gonna be, when they need a new housing unit, they're also gonna also need uh, retail com and commercial places to work. And so that just puts, uh, I mean, we're here today talking about the aggregate, aggregate industry, tremendous uh, demand for aggregate because they're having, we're having to build buildings, we're having to build roads to accommodate all of this. 
And so, so I think, you know, one, I think it was one of the mayor from, um, uh, I can't remember, Double, Double Horn? Double, Double Horn, yes, sir. Yeah. I mean, she talked about, or, or some, but one of, maybe one of the commissioners or the judge talked about, well, we're essentially creating this demand. We're pro-business and, and there's no question that Texas is pro-business, um, but, and, and pro-growth, a uh, healthy economy, but that then creates this demand for aggregate. And you know, certainly the, the conversation that you've been having today is like, well, how do we, um, you know, fulfill our needs for growth, but also manage that in such a way that it doesn't impact our quality of life. Okay, next slide. Here's the population distribution in the state. If you click it once, I think I have a couple of little animations here. Um, this is what we refer to as the population triangle. Um, the Dallas-Fort Worth area, San Antonio, Austin, and you know, Houston area. Um, most of the population is is in this area. Or, you know, around 70% is kind of in the counties that are in this triangle. If you click the next slide, we have I-35. I mean, the next uh, next animation should be one more click. Yep, there we have I-35. And along I-35, if we look at all the counties that I-35 intersects and all of the counties east of I-35. That's 87% of our population. So we have a lot of concentrated population in these counties. And these counties are some of the biggest and most significant growing counties in the country. Next slide. Here's the population change so far this decade. And you can see that um, you know, we've had pretty dramatic change in the population triangle. Um, certainly the urban core counties are growing a lot, but now we're seeing suburban ring counties in the a case here where we're um, looking at Travis County, Williamson County is just really growing, Hayes and Comal and along I-35 corridor. If you look north and south of Houston, Fort Bend and Montgomery, Denton and Collin County, Rockwall County up in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, just tremendous growth. But we also have of our 254 counties, 104 of them that lost population. Essentially, what's happening in these counties is young people are aging up through high school and to go to uh, post-secondary or to find work, they're needing to move into one of the urbanized areas. And so many of the young people are leaving the rural, more rural parts of the state, moving into the urbanized areas. Many of them are moving into Texas County. Some of them are leaving and going out of state, but certainly if you just have, having grown up in Texas, I would say it's like, where, you know, if you were born here, you probably don't really wanna leave, but um, occasionally some people do. Um, but probably also, you know, moving to a, an urbanized area in Texas, so they're also not that far from home, so they can go home uh, when they need to. But then they're there in the urbanized areas, growing and eventually getting married, having children. Those children are being born in the urbanized areas, they're not being born in the rural areas. And we have an aging population in rural Texas that is then resulting in about a third of these counties having natural decrease, more deaths than births, because there aren't young people that are having babies and the older population is aging into the high mortality years. Next slide. Here's just looking at percent change. The previous slide was numeric change. Percent change is the speed of change. So you could have, you know, like Loving County, I think, you know, I think their population is a little over 100. So if they add 10 people, they just grew by 10%. If they add, um, they add 100 people, <laughs> they grew by 100%. Um, but but if you look at the other counties, if especially in the population triangle, if you notice the suburban ring counties are the ones that are really growing fast. Most of these counties, as I'll talk about in just a second, are growing from domestic migration, the ones that are growing fast. The other piece of this is if you look at the Permian Basin area, the um, Midland, uh, Odessa area, all of those counties growing very, very quickly. Again, they're, they're, well, Midland and Hector are, are a little more uh, populated, but Martin and Andrews and Gaines are pretty sparsely populated, but people are moving there and they're growing very quickly. Okay, next slide. So this is just showing you cities. I just I'm going to highlight here that we have five of the largest cities in the country, and I'll scoot on from this. Um, go on to the next slide. 
Um, and then here is population change for the county so far this decade. And if you click it once, it'll highlight a few counties. It's just showing you Harris and Dallas counties. Um, there you have an interesting phenomena in that one, they're the second and eighth most significant growing counties in the country, but most of their growth is from natural increase, more births than deaths. Um, the, and then the other part of their growth is international migration, and they both have net out domestic migration. If you click it again, uh, you'll see now we're highlighting the other urban core counties, and they, their growth patterns look very similar to the state, where about half of their population changes from natural increase, and about half of it from migration, and more of their migration being domestic migration. And again, that's the kind of migration that, that um, really puts demand on infrastructure. Okay, next, please. Then here is just showing you um, uh, for one year, the numeric growth, so 2018 to 19, and you can see um, net out domestic migration again for Harris. And in uh, this one, I put Hidalgo in there um, and Dallas County, next slide. This is showing, the next slide showing you percent change. And if you click that once, it highlights that all of these fast growing counties are growing from domestic migration. And so they're just, you know, tremendous um, development occurring in these counties in terms of new housing units being built, uh, retail and commercial property, uh, manufacturing, and then of course the need for increasing the transportation infrastructure there, um, which again puts, you know, a tremendous uh, demand on, um, on the aggregate industry in terms of um, foundations and roadways. Next slide. Oh, I should, I, I'll just mention that if you look at those fast growing counties, if you go back to that map where I showed you percent change, no, you don't have to do that. You can keep going, I'll just talk about this. Um, essentially, they're the suburban ring counties and then the Eagle Ford Shale counties are the ones that are really growing fast. So our, our growth, um, uh, if you go uh, back one, Sorry, just that, to highlight that most of our growth uh, in Texas is, is happening from, by race and ethnicity from the Hispanic population. We, you, uh, about 50, almost 54% of the population growth this decade between 2010 and 2018 was from growth of the Latino population. Then the other race ethnic groups, if you added them all together and not Hispanic white contributing about 13.6%. So we're seeing a shift in the racial and ethnic composition of the state. Next slide. And this is just showing you this by age, so I'll skip through this. And then this is the age structure of the non-Hispanic white population in the state. So this is a population pyramid with males on the left, females on the right and single years of age. You can see if you look at 60 years of age and over, that's the baby boom. You look at about 25, 30 years, that's referred to as the echo boom, the children of the baby boom. That age group also is being influenced by domestic migration because many of the people moving to Texas are coming here for employment opportunity and they happen to be in these younger working ages. And then the other part of this is the age structure of this is almost an inverted pyramid. And if this was the age structure of Texas, we would be in trouble because we would not have a growing um, set of, of younger people aging into the labor force to fill the growing the number of jobs that we have. So if you, if you look at countries that have age structures like this, oftentimes their economies are in decline or they're, they're figuring out, actually frequently what they'll do is they'll move their labor functions out of country. Like Japan would be an example of that. Many of their manufacturing activity, much of their manufacturing activity is outside of Japan because they, are, they have um, a, a declining uh, population in the younger ages. Next slide. And this is showing us the minority population um, and with, um, um, cascading um, race ethnic groups, the center being Hispanic, the next layer out uh, non um, African American, next layer out Asian, and next layer out everybody else. Males are on the right, female, oh, males are on the left, females are on the right. Um, and so you see this age pyramid has more of a pyramid to it. So you have younger people to age into the job 
uh, to the labor force. Next slide puts it all together. And so now we have non-Hispanic white in the center and we still have declining cohorts that there are smaller cohorts at the younger ages. And that's what's driving a lot of the migration into Texas is because we're not growing enough labor in Texas to fill the jobs that are being created here. And so people are moving to Texas uh, to fill those jobs. Next slide. Now I just put together a few things looking at, at um, cha some changes that are, have some economic relevance here. Uh, this is showing you um, 2014 and 2018. So if you added all of the blue columns up, it would add to 100% of the labor force. And all of the red columns, it would add to 100% of the labor force in 2018. And so if the numbers are changing, then, um, then essentially you're suggesting a shift in the labor force. And so when we look at this, all of those that have a little asterisk by them, the change, this is from survey data, the change is what we would refer to as statistically significant. And you can see here that the transportation and warehousing, the one in the center, had a pretty significant increase just over a four year period as a proportion of our labor force. Um, and, then, um, and then construction had a significant. So those are two, basically what we've been talking about all day, I think, is those two industries have been growing. Now, of course, this is pre-COVID, but still, I, I believe those industries are probably growing. And then we have some, some that have pretty much stayed the same and some that have declined a little. Next slide. Oh, I guess I was showing you the, I forgot I put those animations in there, just showing you as so those were going up and down. This is showing us the value of the housing stock in Texas from 2014 to 2018. Same thing here, if you add all the blue columns up, it would add to all the housing stock in Texas in 2014. In 2018, all of the red columns would add to 100. Um, and essentially what we're seeing is that there's more and more higher valued housing stock in Texas. And that's essentially the new housing stock. So the difference between um, the percentage in 2014 and 2018 is really the new housing stock that's been built, which tends to be toward the higher end of uh, value. And so those are also gonna be uh, larger housing units. Um, and they're also gonna be newer housing units that are in new developments that are also gonna be driving the demand for aggregate in the state. Next slide. And then this is uh, just showing us the, um, uh, looking at um, the value of um, owner occupied housing. I can't remember, yeah. And so it's basically showing you a similar pattern to what I just showed you that we're having more uh, increased uh, value and, uh, and less lower value. Next slide. So here's looking at Texas job um, growth uh, over a couple of decades here, a few decades. Uh, you can see Texas has pretty well outperformed the United States in most uh, quarters here. Um, you know, there was a recession where we actually did pretty well in 27, 28, 2008. Um, and, and came out of it certainly much stronger than the rest of the United States. We had a few uh, periods uh, in 2015, 2016, where we weren't performing as well as the rest of the country. And then we have the pandemic and we've seen a real decline in um, jobs, but we're also seeing as a percentage smaller decline than the rest of the country. So certainly this for me, even though I'm, I, it, it kind of cringe when I look at Texas losing many jobs, and I'm sure all of you do as well. Um, uh, essentially, we're doing better than the rest of the country. And so certainly coming out of the pandemic, I anticipate that we'll, we'll kind of be a leader in the country in terms of job growth coming out of it. Next slide. Now I'm just, I had a friend who was working with um, some, the current population survey data and looking at unemployment from January of this year up until uh, the beginning of July. <clears throat> and he just uh, broke it out by a number of different things. So essentially you can see that unemployment increased, you know, once uh, the economy kind of shut down in March, 
Uh, and the, certainly young people seem to be hit harder by that than older people. And that probably makes some sense because many of them are working in more marginal industries. And it's probably easier for employers to let them go than it is for more established employees. Next slide. Um, this is showing you level of educational attainment. So those people with higher levels of educational attainment had less job loss and less unemployment. Uh, those with lower levels of educational attainment, the lower end of the socioeconomic uh, spectrum had more volatility with it. And that also, when you break it out by race and ethnicity, you can see the African-American population seems to have uh, lost employment faster and more significantly than uh, either the Hispanic or the non-Hispanic white. Next slide. And then this is showing you by um, um, metro status of so central city, um, Non-metro is um, uh, outside, so that's more rural. And then outside central city is more suburban. Um, and so th the patterns look somewhat similar, even though um, in rural parts of the state, it seems like there was faster recovery um, than what we're seeing in the um, cent central city as well as the suburban ring. Next slide. And then this just showing you a time series by county of, um, of uh, unemployment claims. And you can just kind of see the pattern there. So the, the, the cells on the left are one. So you kind of have to go, go over four and then go down one, go over four and then go down one. And then you go up to the top and then you go over four and down one. Um, so essentially you can see that the, the unemployment claims certainly have declined uh, over the period. And then there are certain areas of, this, of the state that have certainly been hit harder than others um, by unemployment. Uh, next slide. Now, in terms of our projected population growth, we're not anticipating that we're gonna see any significant um, slowdowns. Of course, you know, that's just our assumption is that we'll continue to grow at the pace we have been. This gold line is our most current um, projection where we're projected to be by 2050 at 47, more than 47 million Texans. That's not quite doubling from where we are now, but it's getting up close to that. So, um, well, uh, actually when I say doubling from um, 2010. So, so certainly that's um, going to continue to put um, infrastructure demands and stress on the state and um, on transportation, housing, uh, retail, and commercial property. Next slide. And then this just showing you that projected by race and ethnicity. You can see here we're projecting that the uh, Latino population will exceed the non-Hispanic white population probably around 20, 2021, 2022, or be in parity with it. Uh, the Asian population even though the slope is, looks kind of slow, the Asian population has been growing very, very quickly in the state. Next slide. And then this is showing our, our projected um, percent change by race, ethnicity, similar to the previous slide I showed you earlier. Next slide. And then this is showing you by age group. So you can see the 65 to 84, the kind of turquoise line is growing quickly because that's all the baby boomers moving into that age category. But we also have the labor force age population, the top line, uh, the green one growing very quickly as well. And that is, again, that's you know, an indication of what is likely to happen in the state that you have people that are either moving here or living here and employed hopefully doing well economically and, and probably putting demand <laughs> on our infrastructure and demand for aggregate as well. Next slide. Okay, so I zipped through a lot of stuff. I think I'm gonna, I'll stop there. This will be on our website and I, I assume that you all will probably also make uh, the presentation, will also make it available. Thank you, Dr. Potter. So the answer to my question regarding the commute to Austin is, uh, well, we are growing and Texas is not showing any signs of slowing down. <laughs> yeah, one of my, um, one, of the, the, one of the few benefits of the pandemic is, because I used to drive 
from San Antonio to Austin once or twice a week at least, and I, and you probably more than that. But that's one of the benefits is that I'm not that we're yeah. doing everything on Zoom these days. So. No, no, we've certainly been but a lot learning curve, and it certainly has pushed the situation for which we need to make sure that we get broadband to our rural areas. Yeah, um, big challenge yeah, there for sure. Yes, sir. And uh, you know, I was very proud to uh, join. Uh, I think it was approximately ninety-four of us that uh, have signed a letter saying this needs to be a focus area for our upcoming uh, session and so forth to, to get that done. You know, I, I have uh, I, I serve the people, good people of Milam County, uh, which is is rural, even though it's in close proximity. Uh, to Austin, but uh, you know, if if we could really get the bandwidth to them, uh, you know, it would probably uh, take some of the pressures of the growth within our major metropolitan areas, such as Austin. Uh, just it gives people alternatives. Plus, you look at the fact of education, and now you know because we closed our community hospitals there, uh, you know, telemedicine. Um, is is really trying to be relied upon for our rural areas and i, I tell you that county judge out there is doing incredible credible things out there on getting that done on on telemedicine so you got to come out there uh, with me sometime i'll i'll uh, take you some good eating places out there i, w- I would love that um Ab- but that that is one of our biggest challenges if uh, the census is in the field right now and as you're probably aware the census is this is the first year we've been doing it by right. internet and there's just a lot of it's, the rural parts of our state are the ones that they're mopping up right now because they don't have broadband access. And so for them to participate, somebody has to go to their house or they have to mail it back. And a lot of them don't have um, mailable ad- addresses that the census will mail it to. They have to yeah. mail it to a housing unit. They can't mail it to a post office box oh. or. Um, yeah. So so it's. So it's been a real challenge, and I think certainly getting broadband out there will help with, as you said, with schools right now, with um, you know people being able to maybe telecommute two or three times a, a week. Um, you know, it could really have very, it will have very significant impacts. I know you're going to make it happen. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, you know, we're 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 working hard. Uh, uh, you know, when you look at the number of legislators that represent the rule, I think it's down to. About, team may correct me here but i think there's only 17 of us now because of the sheer population and with that brings a great question um i have uh it you know the majority of the growth being in proximity to the large metropolitan areas in the state coupled with that is a a slight decrease as you pointed out in the rural population is that trend the same in other states and when was the last time it went the other direction it's been a while since we, uh, uh, and actually I used to have on our website, I maybe I could just put that back up. We had um, historic um, population, uh, like a whole time series of maps showing the counties. I think it was probably like in the 50s that we, you know, it, things started slowing down in the 50s in a lot of rural parts of Texas and then moving into the 60s and 70s. Then, you know, it slowed down, but it's really just been, I'd say like since the 80s that we've started seeing, you know, one by one counties moving into this um, negative population growth. And now, like we just saw, it's like up over 100, um, at least so f- for the decade. And it varies from year to year because there'll be like one year that a county isn't losing population, but it's not growing um, or not growing fast. Um, but it's been a while. And that, you know, and certainly with our population change, you know, the growth that we're seeing, you know, people have to live somewhere. Um, and with, you know, pushing broadband out and so on, um, you know, we're likely to see, uh, and certainly we've seen um, in the Hill Country, if you look at like Fredericksburg, Kerrville, uh, Lano, I mean, a lot of people are, are retiring there, but then we're also seeing behind that people that have the option to work remotely uh, moving there as well. So we're starting to see, you know, some, I don't know if I'm going to call it suburbanization of rural Texas, but, um, you know, people beginning to um, move out further. Um, There was, I I have been participating in something called the Rural Sociological Society, and there was a a real movement for a while of people moving out of urban areas and, and moving into rural parts of 
states, not just Texas, Texas being one of them, but that kind of stopped, um, I think, probably sometime in the 80s. And now it's, um, you know, been, been pretty stable or declining. And that and the same pattern is happening in other states as well. Um, the, if you look, though, at some states, I mean, they're losing population even in the urbanized areas. So um, if you look at like Michigan and um, um, New York State, and so on there there are some of the um urbanized areas are not growing they have net out domestic migration um and an aging population so so essentially you know texas at least our urban areas are growing uh and suburban areas are growing very quickly from migration and from natural increase it's just the world and that's i find it to be <laughs> fascinating thing that we're yeah. the fastest growing most significant growing state and yet we have a very significant part of our state that's actually losing population. It's um, kind of an interesting quandary. It, it, it certainly is. And so, you know, I'll tell you, we'll continue to look at the infrastructure needs. You know, it's, you know, obviously um, broadband gives opportunity uh, for folks not to necessarily be in those major Paulton areas, and I didn't mean to take the conversation in that direction, but it's certainly, you know, you got to go to where the jobs are, and uh, that provides opportunity for uh, industry, other industries and so forth to locate in other direction. I will, um, I will just say uh, farewell, Dr. Potter. I really appreciate your insight and so forth. Thank you very much. We'll make sure that uh, uh, those slides are available uh, to our viewers and so forth. Well, okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Well, folks, that kind of gives us the so what of why we are here. As we observed uh, yesterday, aggregate provides a needed resource to support the growth that Texas is undergoing, as Dr. Potter well placed it. Today, we looked at what happens when that growth encounters the rapidly growing population. We heard from state agencies, uh, we heard from local officials, universities, and citizen organizations on potential concerns tied to aggregate and what the state is currently doing to address it, and in some cases, what we're not doing and need to be doing. This ends our portion of the town hall with those agencies. However, these same agencies and others, as well as the local coalitions, will be working with the committee members and me to help draft the committee findings. This is the first time, the first time, the House has taken a hard look at the aggregate industry in over 15 years. You gotta realize, we really came to understand the issue in the late summer of 2017, and then addressed it in, for the session, uh, for the first time last session. And because of our hard work, um, because of our hard work, that's why the speaker uh, and others had determined within the leadership circle that we needed to have this interim study for which we are chairing. This town hall, uh, as by house rules, uh, does not uh, provide for that committee, uh, but it certainly provides a menu for us all learn together I hope everyone out there listening joins us again tomorrow for day three of this three-part series, which we are calling tomorrow the APO Impacts on Texans. We'll be opening it up to hear from Texans about their personal concerns or experiences with the aggregate industry. It will not be interactive, but it will be a chance for you to tell your story. If you'd like to share your story and input, please register for tomorrow's session by sending an email to the address on your screen now. And with that, folks, thank you for joining us for day two, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow for day three. Out here. <laughs>